broadcast of the adjourned meeting of the Minneapolis City Council will now begin. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. I'm going to call to order this adjourned meeting of the City Council for Wednesday, December 2nd. Before we proceed, I'll note that this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff and members of our public as authorized under the provisions of Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Section 13D.021, due to the declared state of local public health emergency. There may be some sounds in the background as callers are being added to the remote meeting. Um, I will um, now ask the clerk to call the roll as we begin this meeting. Council Member Ellison. Present. Council Member Goodman. Present. Council Member Johnson. Present. Council Member Palmasano. Present. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Cano. Here. Council Member Reich. Here. Council Member Fletcher. Here. Council Member Schrader. Here. Council Member Osman. Here. Council Member Cunningham. Present. Vice President Jenkins. Here. President Bender. Here. There are 13 members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. The agenda is before us. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Thank you. Clerk will call the roll. Council. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted. Uh, so that brings us to uh, some uh, background information that we'll provide. We'll have a presentation from staff and then we will be as brief as possible as we are looking forward to hearing from all of the folks who've registered to speak. So on August 14th, Mayor Fry presented his recommended 2021 budget pr providing a pr proposed fiscal plan for the city's operations next year, which total $1.5 billion with an increase to the city property tax levy of about 5.75%. A copy of the mayor's recommended budget is posted on the city's website. Since that time, the City Council, through its Budget Committee, chaired by Councilmember Palmasano, has conducted a series of meetings to look through the details of each department's proposal. The Budget Committee also conducted the first of three public hearings on the proposed agenda, three, the proposed budget, two weeks ago on Monday, November 16th. All those meetings were broadcast on public access television, and they're available on the City's website and YouTube channel. Tonight's hearing is the second of the three hearings for this year's budget. This hearing satisfies the statutory requirement for a truth and taxation hearing. A little over two weeks ago, Hennepin County mailed out proposed property tax notices, which identify the potential property tax impact based on the proposed 2021 budget for each property owner. Required by state law, tonight's hearing provides the community an opportunity to comment on that proposed budget in part based on the information that was included in those property tax notices from Hennepin County, as well as information that has been made available by the city. Tonight, I'll be taking orders in the um, order that they registered. We will be prioritizing folks who didn't get a chance to speak at the November 16th hearing. We have 430 people registered for tonight's hearing. We're working really hard to balance hearing from each of you and also making sure that everyone has a chance to speak. To that end, I will be giving folks a uh, warning at 60 seconds, and then the tech team will be muting people's lines after 90 seconds. Uh, so again, we want to give folks time to express um, your positions. Um, there's also many ways 
um, to submit written commentary to your council member or through the clerk's office. Um, and we really appreciate um, your support in making sure that your neighbors are able to get heard tonight as well. We have arranged for interpretation for folks who need assistance. If you require assistance, please let us know at the beginning of your testimony. We have ASL interpreters available as well as Hmong, Somali, and Spanish. Tonight's hearing is being broadcast live from the city's website and YouTube channel and Comtask channels 14 or 799 and Century League channels uh, 8001 or 8501. And now, before we open the floor to public comment, I'll invite our budget director, Micah Intermill, who will provide a brief, brief summary of the proposed budget. Good evening, Council President, Mayor Fry, and Council members. I am Micah Intermill, City Budget Director. Thank you for the opportunity to present a brief overview of Mayor Fry's recommended budget for 2021. Next slide, please. The mayor's recommended budget for 2021 includes expenditures of $1.47 billion. It is structurally balanced in 2021 and all planning years. This budget, recommend, uh, this budget recommendation is $93 million or roughly 6% less than the 2020 adopted budget. These reductions are necessary in light of the pandemic induced recession and the ensuing reductions to revenues the city will see in 2021. Next slide, please. The recommended budget includes cuts in all departments across the city. These cuts come in the form of continuation of holding rostered positions vacant to accrue salary savings through the year, through limited layoffs across several departments, and some reductions to programming and operating dollars within, within departments as well. That said, this budget is not entirely focused on cuts. Uh, the mayor's recommended targeted increases in public safety, including the expansion of the Office of Violence Prevention and the ongoing funding of the Minneapolis Violence Interrupters Program. There are increases to investments in affordable housing, including through additional ongoing dollars into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And there are increases in building our economy through inclusion, including an investment of $5.5 million into the city's commercial property development fund. Next slide, please. All told, in order to make up for lost revenues while also supporting these investments, the mayor has recommended and the BET has adopted a maximum levy that is 5.75% greater than the total levied for 2020. Notably, our pension levies have stabilized following important work done with the state to create better predictability for Minneapolis taxpayers. And this year, we will resume levying for the operations of the Board of Estimate and Taxation. Next slide, please. In total, the mix of each property tax dollar doesn't change greatly from year to year in Minneapolis. The police department and the park board make up the largest individual components at 42% in total. The capital and debt program, fire department, and public works department make up another 32%, and all other city services and pension obligations make up the remaining quarter of property tax supported expense. Next slide, please. With respect to taxes, the medium valued home saw an increase in value of 6.4% this year, or about $17,000. That said, its property taxes only increased by 1.2% or about $19. This is somewhat paradoxical given that the levy is proposed to increase by 5.75%. And of course, the devil is in the details and city property taxpayers benefit greatly this year from the expiration of our Consolidated Tax Increment Financing or TIF district, which added some $33 million of property value to our tax rolls. As a result, the impact of the increase to the total levy is not felt by a majority of property taxpayers. Next slide, please. That said, property taxes are burdensome to many and we are ever mindful of that at the city. So this is the annual reminder to everyone watching and those who may be reporting on tonight's proceedings that it's important to remember the state's property tax refund program. Regular property tax refund programs exist for homeowners and renters alike. These programs are accessed through the income tax filing season and are built to provide greater relief to those with lower incomes. There's also a special homestead credit available. Sometimes this is referred to as the circuit breaker uh, for those properties that see an extraordinary increase of greater than 12% and at least $100 from the prior year. 
Information on all of these programs is available on the state's website, and we do encourage folks to submit, even if they're not sure they qualify, as refunds can be in the hundreds of dollars. Next slide, please. That concludes my prepared remarks, and if there are no questions, I'm happy to cede the floor to my fellow Minneapolitans. Thank you, Director Intermo. I'm hearing that the sound may not be working on our YouTube um, channel, so I'm letting staff know that. Um, and Mr. Carl. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, we are aware of that, and staff is working to correct that. At the same time, Mr. Patrick Todd, the city assessor, uh, had contacted me among the many changes we're adapting to in this online virtual environment. In prior years, council members will recall that Mr. Todd would personally be present in the chamber at these meetings so that those uh, property owners who had questions about their property assessments had a chance to meet with him personally. This format does not allow that, and on Mr. Todd's behalf, I wanted to make sure we stated for the record that anyone who does have questions about their property tax assessments or evaluations can certainly reach out and contact the city assessor's office or if they need help connecting to the city assessor's office, they can certainly call my office, the city clerk's office at 612-673-2216. That's 673-2216 during business hours and we'll be happy to assist. Thank you. Thank you both. With that, we'll um, proceed to the public hearing. Uh, Council Member Schrader has a request related to the public um, record for this hearing, so I'll recognize Council Member Schrader for that, uh, but she also emailed to council members prior to tonight's meeting. Council Member Schrader. Thank you, Madam President. I'm, uh, I'll be very brief. I'm just bringing forward a motion. Um, and as the council president uh, mentioned, I've emailed to all my colleagues. Uh, basically, this motion is to direct the city clerk to incorporate public comments received in connection uh, with and was included as part of the neighborhood's 2020 plan. Uh, just to kind of give some background, this is for our neighborhood associations. There was a framework that was adopted uh, that was separate than the budget, but many, I would say majority of the comments we received were on the budget. So I'm just making a motion to have that included here. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Schrader. Uh, instead of taking the time for the long roll call vote, I will simply um, propose to th that I will direct the clerk to incorporate those comments that are relevant to the budget as part of this public hearing, uh, unless there is objection from my colleagues. Are there any objections to that direction? I don't see any, so thank you, Council Member Schrader, and uh, clerk is directed to do to take that action. Um, as we begin our hearing, we, have, we do have 430 speakers registered. Um, I will be giving folks a warning, uh, just a gentle, friendly reminder after one minute, and then the um, tech team will just be muting folks' lines after 90 seconds. Um, even with that method, we are looking at many, many hours of public testimony. I want folks to know that I'm, I'm here to listen um, for the, to the folks who've, who've signed up to speak, and that will help us, and as are my colleagues. Um, but in order to make sure that folks are not waiting till two in the morning, to speak to us, uh, we're working to limit that time to give everyone a chance to speak. I will be giving folks a heads up in groups of five for the speakers who are next, so please get ready to speak when you hear that called. Um, please use the same phone number and email address that you used while you registered. When your name is called, please push star six to unmute your phone. It will take a little uh, time. You'll hear a pre-recorded message, and then you'll be able to state your name for the record and begin your comments. With that, we're ready to open the public hearing and we will begin. And I just need one moment to get the list of names, uh, which I do not have in front of me. So uh, apologies for that. I will be um, ready with that list in one moment.
Mr. Carl, I think I need you to resend me the speaker list. Mad Madam President, that's my fault. Um, and I will send that to you, but the tech team has the list right in front of them now. Why don't we have the tech team name the first five speakers? Great. Thank and you. that'll get us going. Thank you. Okay, for tonight, the first five speakers are number one, Merv Moorhead, number two, Maureen Foley, number three, Tori Passens, number four, Lynn Langett, and number five, Therese Martin. You can uh, press star six to unmute in that order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moorhead, please begin. My name is Merv Moorhead, and I reside in Ward 3, which is represented by Steve Fletcher. I'm advocating for two positions today. The first is to urge the City Council to pass the Mayor's budget without changes, even though it cuts the MPD budget by 7.4% during a period of time when Minneapolis is bleeding, with almost 80 murders and 500 shooting victims, along with rampant carjackings, assaults, and strong arm, strong arm robberies. Our city is currently living in fear and we cannot permit it to get even worse by adopting the proposal coming from Commissioners Fletcher, Cunningham, and Bender. This budget proposal, as it currently stands, clearly states that there will be a negative impact to public safety because of the cuts to MPD, and they, and they are in areas where we can least afford. They include outreach efforts in the community engagement team, reduced strength, leading to increases in response times, limited response to livability issues, flexible assignments and property crimes, elimination of neighborhood beats, and reduction in pro proactive investigatory work. There are investments that the budget makes in the following areas, which are very much welcome, such as rehiring the 28 CSO officers, the expansion of the co-responder program, the equity impact and results system, and the early intervention system. I'm also advocating for sensible solutions to public safety, which, which is why I am encouraging the voters in Ward 3 to take the next step in the November election and, uh, and vote out Steve Fletcher. He has proven to be tone deaf to both the needs of his constituents and the needs of the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Foley. Welcome. You may need to unmute your line in order to speak by pushing star six. Not hearing speaker two, so we'll move to the next speaker. Um, Tori Passions, welcome and we can always come back to folks who you've missed. Hi, Tori Passens, thank you for your time. I feel many of you on the city council have created a vacuum in our city, allowing criminals to run wild. I'm not gonna throw a bunch of data at you. We all live here, we know it's happening. It's become quite dangerous. You can't blame the left, you can't blame the right, you can't blame Trump. You can't blame the previous administration for this. This lands on you, you who showed up in the park to defund the police, you who continue down this path. Watching your actions is like watching a bunch of kids playing with a loaded gun. Honestly, this is not a game. People are getting hurt, our city is crumbling, and this is on your watch. I know this mob yelling defund the police. I know they're loud but we need you to stand up. They do not represent this city. We need you to push back on that and be leaders, be the leaders that you are. We can have it both ways. We can have a fully funded police force and we can have reform that makes sense, but you can't create reform unless you create safety. Please do your jobs. The mob will not protect you from these criminals. Thank you, They're please start to wrap up. You when you're up for re-election. Protect yourself, protect your job, be safe, vote for change. 
Thank you. The next speaker is Lynn Langett. Welcome. My name is Lynn Langett and I live in Ward 3. In 2019, I moved myself and my business to Minneapolis after 20 years in California. In addition to now worrying uh, for the safety of our citizens, I'm quite concerned for the economic viability of our city. The unprecedented crime that your irresponsible actions have enabled endangers all of us. When I lived previously in crime-ridden countries such as South Africa, I learned how to avoid being a crime victim. I never in a million years thought I'd use this knowledge just to live in Minneapolis. A small example, I now drive 30 minutes to the suburbs so I can buy groceries because I'm afraid of being carjacked if I shop locally. You must fully fund the mayor's budget and rebuild the police force, not only to protect us, but to allow businesses to thrive in an environment of peace and security. Thank you. The next speaker is Therese Martin. Welcome. The next speakers in queue will be Brent Johnson, Heather Shore, Amanda Galbert, and Tom Bogan. Ms. Martin, are you? Here, you will need to push star six to unmute. Let's move on to Mr. Johnson. Welcome. We can always come back if folks are able to join later. Hello, I'm Brent. Hello, I'm Brent Johnson. I live in District 10, um, the Whittier neighborhood. Um, I have just never felt so unsafe recently. Um, I think the, um, um, the, this is in Minneapolis, I know. When I moved here in 2014, crime is out of control. Um, and I know my neighbors and my friends feel the exact same. Our city is in chaos. And I think um, many of the reasons for this is here. Um, um, plan for defunding um, and it gives the criminals just more power. Um, and that's kind of all that I have to say. It leaves our city defenseless and a small vocal group has distorted where our community stands. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Shore, welcome. The next speaker is Heather Shore. We will move on to speaker eight, Amanda Geldert. Ms. Geldert. Speaker nine is Tom Bogan. Welcome. Hello. Hi, welcome. Hello, this is called a teacher's wisdom. As a licensed science teacher who has been in classrooms for more than 30 consecutive years, I've learned a thing or two, not just about children, but about people in general. After all, in the final analysis, children and adults share far more similarities than differences. Both expect life to be fair. They like to learn new things and sometimes not. And they look forward to the bell ringing at the end of the day. One fundamental, fundamental secret that all teachers know about their classroom is this. Despite what they tell you publicly, children not only want to know, but they need to know the classroom procedures, rules, and policies that govern their classroom. Furthermore, they need to know that those rules will be enforced on a consistent basis. 
This certainty is what allows a classroom to thrive socially, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. All teachers know this. They know that if they don't have Thank well, you. Please start to order wrap up. Their, their classrooms, then all children in that room will suffer. You see, if the rules aren't enforced, then fear takes over. And when fear takes over, learning can't take place. Civil discourse can't take place. Productive work, creativity, and intellectual drive can't take place. Classroom discussions on justice, equity, and fairness can't take place. If fear takes over, the classroom citizens cannot think normally, feel normally, or even engage normally with their neighbors. You must keep the police in place. It's Thank not you. Your time is up. Thanks for joining us. Next is Ms. Powers, Lucy Powers. The speakers to get ready are Brandy Bennett, Nicholas um, Coach, Christopher Najir, Najar, Eric Wan, and Avis Thomas. Ms. Powers. The next speaker is Speaker 11, Brandy Bennett. Thank you. My name is Brandy Bennett. I'm a resident of downtown and I also work in Minneapolis. We are a city in crisis that is being grossly mismanaged by a posse of snake oil salesmen that are trying to sell an unproven plan using deception and manipulation. Stop with these ill-conceived ideas that support your anti-police agenda. You are ignoring local mental health experts that are against your proposal. You're ignoring the pleas for more police by Northside community leaders. You are ignoring Chief Arredondo, who has been on this job for 30 years. Mr. Fletcher specifically and several others are ignoring your constituents. Worst of all, you are ignoring the many, many victims of crimes and their families, which is disproportionately affecting the very communities you claim you want to protect. You are more concerned with coddling criminals than with protecting your residents. It is disingenuous to claim that you are preserving staffing at 770, as you know full well that MPD is down close to 700 officers, not including those on personal leave. The three recruit classes have not even started the hiring process and it will be well into 2022 before we have additional feed on the street. How can you cut overtime? It is an unpredictable expense. Once Please the start department meets up. the proposed threshold, do we just tell victims calling 911, sorry, we're out of overtime, hang tight until the next shift comes on. What happened to the year of community input? What happened to study on police staffing? How about you slow down and wait for the results and then fine tune your plan? Find funding elsewhere, Get the programs up and running with quantifiable results. Thank you. Speaker 12, Nicholas Koch. Good evening, Madam President and Council Members. My name is Nick Koch and I am a resident of Minneapolis 11th Ward. Council Member Schrader, I'm your constituent. I'm also chair of the New Loop Partners and it's more than 350 business and neighborhood resident members. Council members Ellison and Fletcher, we are your constituents. For New Loop Partners, which represents the areas around Target Field, Target Center, the farmer's market and portions of the North Loop, public safety has been an issue for a long time, significantly increasing since this summer. Please pay serious attention to our major league twins, Timberwolves, Lynx, and the Hennepin Avenue theaters and their patrons who say that they are afraid to come downtown. I'm uncomfortable and I'm a city person. For Tangletown and its adjacent 11th Ward neighborhoods, public safety is the first topic of conversation and the rash of violence, robberies, and carjackings. Please we touch wrap up. Both, almost done. We need a both and a solution that simultaneously fully funds the police department has proposed and reforms its practices. I urge you to support Mayor Fry's budget proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker 12, Christopher Najar. After that will be Eric Wan, Avis Thomas, Brendan LaRoche, and Linda Berglin. Yes, Welcome. hi, uh, this is Christopher Najar. 
I'm in uh, Ward 11 under Councilman Schroeder. Uh, just a couple of brief comments, I guess. I I did review the safety for all budget plan proposed by the council, and in all honesty, I can see how some of these changes can really provide a positive and productive way forward for the city. Uh, I guess ultimately my concern is just the timing in which some of the programs that are being proposed, uh, you know, what what the timing looks like in light of the current call for additional safety, and then additionally the anticipated source of the funding for these initiatives. You know, I think it's uh, quite in line with the council's initial stance about uh, specifically given the current climate and budgetary constraints and slow budget cuts we've had to make given the year we've experienced. So what are creative solutions we can come up with given the current resource constraints? There's instances where you specify non-monetary resources being transitioned to different departments. I think those are great options to explore. I think that's a way that we can try and build on this longer term community led safety community led safety initiative but ultimately the five million dollars being cut from mtpd needs to be able to address the recent calls for increased safety i mean right now there's an insinuation that an 80 percent capacity police force uh can effectively stem a 17 percent increase in crime so if we're removing overtime budget how are you going to be able to pay for those additional patrols that are having mm -hmm. to stem this increased violence given we're not increased Thank you. Mr. Wan. Thank you, 14. President Bender. Uh, thank you, President Bender. My name is Eric Wan and I live in Ward 4. I would like to note that the comments I prepared earlier this week had to be changed because of two actions that completely upended what I had hoped to say. First was a recent announcement that there would be an additional amendment to reduce the MPD budget by $8 million, more than earlier announced. Second is the release of a list of references by Council Member Cunningham a few hours ago, a list that we have requested for several months. So the timing of this release without time for us to review the relevance and validity of the sources is a problem. I live in the only home that is on the National Register of Historic Places on the north side. We recently received our first gunshots into one of the nation's best documented examples of prairie architecture, which predated the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. Noting that, I have two thoughts to share with you. My first thought is that the budgetary shell game is a very dangerous game to play. There are too many lives at stake in this decision as witnessed by the impacts that your earlier decisions have had on the carnage we see in our community today. My recommendation would be to go back to the 2019 budget levels, what we call current services in the federal government, until such time as the public can be brought along with confidence that you are proposing, that what you're proposing is good. Our community is in deep need of healing. What you're proposing will tear it Please at start fabric to wrap up. And people need to be prepared. Second, I challenge you to understand overtime as a management analyst. Overtime signals two things. First, the organization is understaffed. And second, is a portended unevenness in the workload. Given our expected rise and leaving that will occur in the spring, I would say that both of these reasons apply. Cut, cutting overtime will be deadly for our community. And I hope that bothers you all enough uh, that problems that lead to overtime. Thank you. Davis Thomas. We'll go to speaker 16, which is Brendan LaRoque. And if anyone who is speaking um, wants to submit a longer written testimony, the email address is councilcomment at minneapolismn.gov. We'll go to speaker 17, Lin Linda Berglin. Then Kirk Weber and Tom Noltimer are next. Linda Berglin. We'll move to Kirk Weber. It will then be Tom Noltemir, Sydney Pearson, Rick Wilbanks, and Bill Fairbanks. 
Not hearing Mr. Weber, so let's move to Tom Noltemir. The next speaker is Cindy Pearson. Folks will need to press star six to unmute before they speak. Rick Wilbanks. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. I'm Rick Wilbanks and I live in Ward 10. Our history of unequal opportunity has created a cycle where disadvantaged people have suffered violence and unfair treatment at the hands of our police. We must address this and it will require increasing our investment in education, support, and violence interruption. Critically, we must make it easier to fire problem officers and end the influence of the police union on disciplinary actions. These changes will take prolonged investment and we will not see their benefits overnight. The recent spike in crime is dramatic and people from all walks of life have been victims of violence. The threat this poses to the health of our city is real and immediate, and those who suffer most are the same ones who have already been failed by our system. Any plan that relies on reducing police funding to pay for programs that address systemic inequality is bound to fail. If we reduce policing before we see a reduction in crime, a backlash will follow in the form of public support for aggressive policing. Breaking this cycle requires holding officers accountable, investing in systemic change, and maintaining a robust police department at the same time. Please do not ratify the reductions in the police budget that have been proposed by several members of this council. Public safety in both the short and long term should be the top priority for our city. That justifies Please increasing funding for reform efforts while maintaining funding for our police department at 2019 levels. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bill Fairbanks is next. Then Julie Solfest, Ellen Schmitz, Jack Lofgren, and Suzanne O'Brien. Mr. Fairbanks. The next speaker would be Julie Solfest. And folks will need to push star six to unmute. Ellen Schmitz. Hi, my name is Ellen Schmitz and I've been a Minneapolis resident for 40 years and a Ward 12 resident for 26 years. I can't take my dog out for a walk anymore in the evening and I've never felt less safe due to crime being out of control and my part of the city isn't even the worst. But what I wanna to speak to you tonight is the overwhelming evidence on the effect police have on lowering violent crime. A June 2020 Vox article called The End of Policing Left Me Convinced We Still Need Policing by Matthew Iglesias states, there's a substantial literature in economics and sociology arguing that more police on the beats equal less violent crime. One effort quantifying the pre uh, this precisely is a 2018 review of economics and statistics article that estimates based on a big set of police and crime data from large and mid-sized cities between 1960 and 2010, for every $1 spent on extra police generates about $1.63 in social benefits, primarily by reducing murders. He goes on to say policing is important. There's overwhelming evidence, statistical evidence, peer-reviewed studies that police have an effect on reducing crime, but we Please have yet to, to see up. any evidence um, from our city council that less police reduces violent crime. In the last week, two weeks since our last meeting, we have had five homicides, nine rapes, 70 robberies, 117 aggravated assaults. And just while we were all waiting to gather, there was one more carjacking within a mile of where I live. We have now over Thank you. The next speaker is Jack Lofgren. Jack Lofgren. Then it will be Suzanne O'Brien, Michael Byers, Michelle Enstred, and Steve Kramer. Let's go to Suzanne O'Brien.
folks will need to push star six to unmute. Michael Byers. Michelle Engstrand. Hi, this is Michelle Engstrand with Ward 13. And basically all my concerns have been addressed by every single, single caller we have heard thus far with regard to the crime rate increases that are occurring in Minneapolis right now. And I have children, I have young children, and the city is not safe anymore. I've been a resident for 20 years, and I really hope that some action gets taken with Mayor Fry's budget being passed because the reduction in the police force obviously is not a good decision to make. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, let's see, Michael Byers. Next would be Michelle Engstrand. This is Michelle. Welcome. Can, yep. Hi. Sorry, I just thought I was speaking before. I, my name is Michelle Angstrand and I'm from Ward 13 and I've been a resident of Minneapolis for 20 years. I have three children, aged young and into the teens. And I am concerned like every other caller that I've heard that has preceded me with the crime rate in Minneapolis. And I guess I just really want something to be done about it because it's insane. I feel like we live in the wild west and um, I appreciate everyone doing their part and changing the city around to make it a place where people want to live. Thank you. Madam President, you're uh, muted. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm switching back and forth between the speaker window and the list of speakers. The next speaker is number 29, Mr. Steve Kramer. Thanks, Madam President, and to all of you for your work on the public safety topic. The city is depending on a good outcome. I lead the Downtown Council and DID and live in Northrop Ward 11. Our organization supports the mayor's bolt and budget. Very encouraged to see alignment between that budget and the alternative amendment on support for recruit classes and restoring CSOs. MPD has been depleted, needs to be restored, and restored in a way that supports the chief's vision for future culture change. Your agreement on that aspect of the safety budget creates that opportunity. I have shared with the mayor and council members Goodman and Fletcher that DID is partnering with Hennepin County to implement an embedded social worker program as part of our street outreach livability team starting next year. As a downtown business community, we believe in and put dollars behind complementary strategies to law enforcement. But alternative response systems like that one and like those called for in the amendment can't be turned on like a light switch. It will take time to plan, execute, integrate with law enforcement and evaluate their true impact on community safety and demand for policing. At this critical time, that work can't be done at the expense of building back a better, more trusted and just MPD. Please that should be your up. number one priority. And you can look, and in, in pursuing that priority, you can also look to private and philanthropic partners to help create a continuum of safety responses to keep our entire city safe. You'll hear more about that tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to speaker 30, Kevin Lewis. Next after that will be Pamela Middleton, Joanne Kaufman, Thomas OS. Speaker 30, Kevin Lewis. Madam President, Council Members, uh, this is Kevin Lewis. I'm President and CEO of BOMA, which is the Building Owners and Managers Association. Uh, our member buildings uh, provide workspace for thousands and thousands 
of Minneapolitans, and these are enormous investments in the community in our city. We are at a crossroads. As employers try to plan for the gradual re-entry of the workforce due to COVID, they want to make sure that downtown is safe as well. They want to revitalize our city, and there is grave concern that the public safety and the safety of their employees is at risk. The damaging messaging about defunding the police or drastically cutting budgets will take years for businesses and citizens to feel safe once again. We are extraordinarily fortunate to have a local and respected leader of the MPD in Chief Arredondo. Why are certain elected officials looking to undercut the chief's efforts? He is beyond a dedicated person to Minneapolis in many regards. We wholeheartedly support the mayor's budget and full funding of the MPD. Please don't compromise, city council members. Have the courage to do the right thing and protect all citizens of Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 31, Pamela Middleton. Speaker 32, Joanne Kaufman. Good evening, my name is Joanne. I'm the executive director of the Warehouse District Business Association, a role I've served in for almost 24 years, as well as a longtime resident of Minneapolis. Council Member Palmazano, as you know, I am your constituent. As a representative of the WDBA, I want you to know that there is universal support amongst our members for the public safety of a budget as proposed by Mayor Fry. We know that reimagining public safety services and retooling the delivery system is needed. The, the, the system has not worked for our members, thousands of employees, and literally hundreds of thousands of visitors who come to the Warehouse District and North Loop for sports, shopping, music, great food, and to do business. When I first started at the WDBA, my role was to market the neighborhood and the businesses located here. We provide a unique and wonderful regional destination. For the last 10 years, crime and safety have been my number one focus. My members want to be part of the process you are promising and share our experiences, points of view, and shared vision of justice. We are partners with you on so many levels. We employ thousands of workers, not just in hospitality, but industries ranging from advertising to retail. Recent news that the city has suffered from a lack of sales and entertainment tax revenues underscores our relationship. Our members collect a significant amount of those revenues. As they have suffered, so has our entire city and region. Please those revenues will not come back mad. Those revenues will not come back magically and in dire jeopardy if our worst fears are realized and fans, customers, clients, and guests do not return because of public safety concerns. And that's what we're hearing from our guests. Please vote for the Thank you. Speaker 33, Thomas Oas. Speaker 34, Suzanne Block. As a 25 year Ward 4 Northside resident, I've never felt so unsafe and am completely distraught from all the gun violence. Crime is out of control. Every day there continue to be shootings and audible gunfire. The effective police presence feels gone. This only energizes and emboldens criminals. Too many lives have already been lost, too many wounded. Until very recently, I felt some council members have falsely represented their constituents by promoting the views of the minority, not the majority. Most of my neighbors do not want police defunding. Per the Star Tribune, previous Councilman Don Samuels and national polls, this appears to ring true within the black community as well. While police reform and violence prevention in the form of interrupters, social workers, et cetera, have merit, more police presence and action is needed now, not weeks or months from now. Studies submitted for the official record show more cops on the street deter crime. In closing, I support the mayor's budget and urge you to fully fund the police, including the five million in overtime. We must have a strong, fully supported police force and presence to return our city streets to safety. Thank you. Thank you. 
speaker 35 is Pam McCray. Good evening, city council members, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. I, my name is Pam McCray, and I'm the chair of the Downtown Minneapolis Neighborhood Association, which represents some 20,000 residents and 1,000 of other employees. Two years ago, DMNA did a survey, and safety was literally the last resident thing on the resident's mind. Now it is the number one priority, and with reason. Whether it's the Land Use Committee, the Civic Engagement Committee, the Safety Committee, or the chairs of the HOA Condominium Associations Committee, safety is our number one priority. Our position is to support the mayor's budget in its entirety. We need more police officers feet on the ground, and we, until we get there, we need to have the overtime dollars intact. City Council members, you led by getting national publicity on defunding the police. Now you need to bring that leadership home to us. Pull it, put it together and start attempting to have a unified group to lead us. The city council, start working with the mayor. And when you're together and have strong leadership, pull in the MPD and lead us into the future. Quit tearing the community apart. Build that broad consensus to practice a path to a safer city for everyone. You've done the research. Now find the additional money for the program. Thank you. The next speaker is 36, Dan Collison. Good evening, Madam President and Council Members. <clears throat> I am resident of the City of Minneapolis living in Ward 13 and work in downtown Minneapolis in service of several organizations, including private, public, nonprofit, and religious institutions. I'm speaking tonight in support of the budget that Mayor Fry has proposed and without changes. I'm in agreement with all City Council Members and Mayor Fry who believe that it's imperative for every elected leader in the City of Minneapolis employee base including all sworn police officers to work together with all the citizens of Minneapolis to bring serious and real reform to the culture and practices of the Minneapolis Police Department. And most poignantly, the police union, in order to bring a reparative approach to policing and public safety that heals the historic injustices and traumas that particularly our citizens of color have sustained over the sweep of our city's history. And it's also imperative that the city council keep the mayor's investments in the police department intact, especially recommended recruit classes and the community service officers so that the systemic changes that need to be done can be done with incoming officers and new integrated programs as our collective approach to public safety can be both resourced and bring change. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 37 is Charles Tate. We'll then have Daniel Mendez, Jim Graves, Byron Richard, and Nikki Earley. Mr. Tate. We'll move to speaker 38, Daniel Mendez. I'm a neuroscience PhD student at the University of Minnesota. To be direct, like many other minorities feel unheard regarding the violent crimes in our city since the announcement to defund the police. One of my friends who was a Mexican like myself had to leave his home due to the number of drive-bys every day that occurred on his street. Heaven neighbors off his block all feel that you're not even listening to the concerns at our previous council meeting. Neighbors across from me experienced an attempted carjacking when leaving the park with their kids. At my own place of residence in the Southeast Kilman neighborhood, there have been two robberies in the last two months in the parking lot outside of my apartment building. I volunteered to serve the poor residents of Lake Street where many were Hispanic descent whose homes and businesses were negatively affected by the riots. To simply say to defund the police, you just reportedly affect the minorities you purport to want to protect. 500 people have been shot in Minneapolis this year, murders have more than doubled. I even fear for my own children being targeted for looking white. They are half white, half Mexican, which makes this whole racial issue a joke. If you say to have police responses from a place of privilege, say that to the face of a colored person like myself from the Los Angeles area. 
As a Mexican American, I am not about defunding the police, but I am in favor for reforming and improving police relations with the community and holding police officers accountable when they're doing wrong. Regarding the proposal, what I want to know is how you plan to ensure safety of a mental health official or social worker dealing with a nonviolent crime when it's common for it to erupt into a violent incident. Can we instead have up. mental health experts added on that are fully equipped and trained as a police officer? Is there wasteful spending that we can cut out to ensure better candidates for the force, accountability, and oversight? And according to the this year's Gallup poll, only 22% of African Americans actually favor abolishing police. And it's, it's Thank you. Speaker 39, Jim Graves. Hello, this is Jim Graves. Uh, Madam Chairman and Council Welcome, members, yes. this, is, this is Jim Graves. Can you hear me? I, oh, uh, I want to thank you for listening to us um, and all the concerns. We didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get out of here overnight. It's a challenging time. There's a lot of trials and tribulations out there, but I really think right now we need to support the mayor's budget. We need to support the chief. We need time to come together with a good plan, a great city, a great council. Let's do this. We can do it together. I want to thank you. Thank you. Speaker 40, Byron Richard. Speaker 41 is Nikki Early. And folks will need to, to hit star six to unmute. Speaker 42 is Jenna Hillman. So I'll just check back through for Nikki Early, Jenna Hillman. That brings us to speaker 43, Bree Dalliger. We'll then move to Aileen Johnson, Curtis Feckmeyer, Kristen O'Toole, and Hallie Weiss. Ms. Dalliger. Hi, uh, first I'm a homeowner in Ward 12, and my property taxes are proposed to decrease 8.1% which I think is unconscionable in a pandemic. Well, of course, homeowners may also be struggling in these times. They have more resources available by virtue of homeownership and thus have an obligation to support the community in the form of property taxes. That's what taxes are for. So please raise my taxes. Second, though I want to be clear that I do not speak on behalf of the Hennepin County Sheriff as a volunteer sworn special deputy in the patrol support division, I know firsthand how many calls law enforcement officers are sent to that would be better handled by other professionals. It's a waste of law enforcement time and provides worse outcomes for constituents. The reallocation of the $8 million to a mental health crisis team and violence, violence prevention team is the right move. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 44, Aileen Johnson. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Uh, okay, hi, my name is Eileen Johnson. I've been a homeowner in North Loop for the past 20 years. I read through the safety for all budget plan that was introduced by council members Fletcher, Bender, and Cunningham last Friday. At this time of rising crime in every neighborhood in our city, and with the acknowledgement by the chief that more officers are needed, I believe that it is irresponsible for council members to put put forward a plan to further reduce the MPD budget and its number of officers. I believe that any additional funding for alternative models of public safety should come from cuts to non-essential budget items and not from cuts to the MPD. I do not support the safety for all budget plan. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 45, Curtis Beckmeyer. Hi, this is Curtis. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. This, yep, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much, Council President Bender, uh, for having this uh, forum on uh, the budget and public safety. Um, I think the first, you know, obligation of a, of a 
uh, public servant is to make sure to look at the science, look at the data, uh, and, and take some of the emotion and, and the politics out of it. Uh, and, you know, in this case, looking at the budget, uh, you know, I think it's important to recognize we've been in this, uh, in this house on Ward 7 uh, for uh, over six years now. In that time, uh, the police budget, according to the new proposed budget, even the higher budget by the mayor, uh, you're talking about about an 8% increase. In that same time, property tax revenue has gone up 25%. So, you know, you're looking at a, at a situation where the Minneapolis Police Department now is significantly uh, underfunded when you compare it to comparable cities like Nashville, et cetera. Most of these uh, locations, and I know there's some budget to, you know, decisions that get uh, divided up a certain different way, but we're still, you know, good 20 to 30% under a lot of comparable mid-sized cities. And so I think that gets lost in the mix. And I appreciate that people, you know, have concerns about um, uh, public safety overall, uh, but you're just not going to answer those unless you make a significant increase in the police budget and, and put it in the context of the real threat that we now face and, and don't imagine anything. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have Kristen O'Toole, then Hallie Weiss, Sharon sales Belton, and Hannah Wyvedin. Wyvedin. Speaker 46, Kristen O'Toole. Hi, my name is Kristen O'Toole, and I live in Ward 2. I was in Powderhorn Park on June 7 during the Path Forward meeting. Nine of you made our city proud by saying we would create a new transformative model for cultivating safety in Minneapolis. I ask you today to stand by this commitment. Police do not and have not prevented crime, including the recent carjackings and violent crime. We need funding to address the root causes of violence, marginalization, and inequity, especially during the pandemic and recession. Our neighbors are unhoused and hungry. We are facing a public health crisis and are ignoring the climate crisis. I urge you to move funding from MPD to real solutions. The People's Budget is co-signed by over 40 organizations. These are not fringe groups or small numbers, and I support their demands. These are community leaders who know the power of our abundant resources. We need much more funding for housing, climate justice, public transit, biking and walking infrastructure, healthcare and small business support, just to name a few. We needed these things on June 7th, and we need them today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker. 47 is Hallie Weiss. Hallie Weiss. We'll move to speaker 48, Sharon sells Welcome. Shall President. Thank you so much, President Bender. Uh, as you know, I live in uh, Ward 2, and I want to speak uh, this evening in support of May Mayor Fry's budget for public safety. One of the primary responsibilities of the city council and the mayor is to provide for the public safety of citizens and the properties within the city. When it comes to public safety, we cannot be a city divided. The mayor and the city council must govern together. The problems that we face require coordination, cooperation, and the input of all the stakeholders. Flashy quick fixes are not backed by data, analysis, or review will not build the public's trust. It will, on the contrary, further undermine it and put the citizens of the city of Minneapolis at great and further risk. 25 years ago, the public expressed impatience with my strategy to reduce uh, violent crime in the city. Rather than rush to judgment, we methodically developed a shared solution and worked together as a city, the whole city, and the county and implemented a coordinated and unified plan that not only reduced crime, stabilized the city, and even fueled growth across the city. The plan, the safety for all plan is not such a plan. It does have elements that warrant additional review, review by public, public subject matter experts in mental health and more details to affirm the plan's efficacy. This is not the time for the city council to second guess or experiment with people's lives. We must support Chief Aaron Dondo. We must provide Aaron Dondo with the resources he needs to fulfill his duties and obligations to our citizens. We have a chief. Thank you. 
Speaker 49 is Hannah Wydevin. Then we will have Michael Curran, Susan Halsinger, and Luke Willett. So that's Speaker 49, Hannah Wydevin. Speaker 50 is Michael Curran. Fifty one, Susan Halsinger. Oh, I I have lived in South Minneapolis for twenty five years. How can we affect the change we are hoping to see? How can we move towards social justice if we can't even go to the grocery store or safely drive or walk around our city? Safety first, then reform. We have gang members moving here from all over the country. They have been for months wearing top-down colors, not even hiding it. We need a gang task force. Our children are being targeted and initiated. We need to expand existing boots on the ground initiatives fully fund our police department until these boots on the ground initiatives can create and impact real change. We need safety, security, and order to be restored at any cost. We need transparency, accountability, and oversight for our MPD. We also need police presence to deter further violent crime. Our hearts are broken. We love our city. I love my city, right or wrong. When it's wrong, I write it. You members of the council are getting this wrong. We are asking you to write it. Please support the mayor's budget. Please support our chief. We can do both. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is caller 50. Michael Welcome. Curran. Welcome, Mr. Curran. Go ahead. Hi, I'm sorry about that. Uh, my name is Mike and I live in Ward 2. Uh, I want to thank council members Bender, Cunningham, and Fletcher for releasing the safety for all budget. I'm in full support of mobile mental health teams and processes that move property damage reporting away from the police. I appreciate that the budget would eliminate $5 million in police overtime. Last month, I witnessed MPD officers mass arrest protesters on I-94. In addition to the officers making arrests on the highway, police with heavy weaponry and no masks threatened those on the nearby street level who came to witness the arrests. I assume that these officers were paid overtime for terrorizing the public that evening, and this kind of violence and financial waste must end. I also appreciate the proposed safety for all budget would maintain a force of 750 officers in this next budget year. Uh, so these vacancies should not be filled once the city's revenue is restored. Lastly, I want to point out that this safety for all budget would not have prevented the murder of George Floyd, whose name has not been named yet tonight. That's why we need another charter amendment proposal in 2021 that would allow us to transition and imagine a Department of Community Safety and Violence Prevention. In the meantime, I'm in full support of the Safety for All budget and thanks to the council members who've already uh, authored it and come out in support of it. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 52 is Luke Willett. Then we'll have Hassan Asadiq, Kelly McCough, Jenna Mastalone. So Speaker 42. 42 is Luke Willett. Hi, um, I'm Luke Willett. I live in Uptown um, and I too am calling in because of my concern about the proposed um, budget cut to the police force. Um, so as a resident of Minneapolis, when I heard about the proposed budget, I was uh, pretty livid. I have a sibling who also lives in Uptown and has been assaulted. I have friends that live downtown who witnessed people being shot firsthand. Um, I mean, you can tell from the overwhelming majority of speakers tonight that the people of Minneapolis feel the significant crime increase every day. Um, so I just, uh, I guess I just ask that the council listens to what Minneapolis is saying tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 53 is Hassan Asadiq. And folks will need to push star six to unmute. We'll move on to speaker 54, Kelly McCaw. Hi, can you? Yes, welcome. Hi, this is 
My name is Kelly McHugh, and I'm a resident of Ward 3, and I've been a resident in Minneapolis since 2013. I'm asking the City Council to support the people's budget because our city's safety does not lie within the existing structure. Before moving to Ward 3 this last summer, I lived a block and a half from Lagoon and Hennepin in Uptown, where 11 people were shot one night in June. There were three police squads present, and not only was that not a deterrent for the shooting, but the shooters got away. This anecdote is not an anomaly either. MPD is ineffective at both deterring crime as well as solving it. MPD's budget has increased year after year, yet crime wave is completely independent of it. We saw increasing crime levels in the spring well before the move to defund the police, and that was when the department was quote unquote fully staffed. MPD's highest crime clearance rate is for murder, and it's still only at 55%. MPD on average only solved around 25% of reported sexual assault cases, while rates for solving carjackings and other petty thefts or even lower, around 10%. At the very least, MPD has been ineffective at keeping us safe. And at the most, they've murdered members of our own community and have rarely been held accountable. We cannot afford to keep throwing tens of millions of dollars a year towards a single approach system that doesn't work, reallocating funds to other forms of response for 911 calls, restorative justice, and community needs is not radical. It's been implemented in many other cities across the country and has worked you, to please. prevent crime from a both and approach is historically ineffective. We have tried reform for decades, and where did that leave George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds on May 25th? Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 55 is Jenna Mastalone. Fifty six will be Annika Court. 57 will be Mia Freiberg, 58 Peter Ireland, 59 Wendy Darst. Is speaker 55 Jenna Mastalone on the line? 56 Annika Court. Hi, my name is Annika Court and I live in the Lynn Lake neighborhood. Um, I support the People's Budget, which is endorsed by 40 plus local organizations and businesses. Uh, parts one and two of the safety for all plan is the bare minimum. Um, it is irresponsible to look at any uptick in crime without acknowledging the changing circumstances of people in our city, the economic crisis and pandemic that is propelling us to this point. Now, instead of funding, for example, mounted police officers, because horses will not save us, save any of us from violent crime, we can fund tried and true methods for violence preve prevention, like community-based outreach teams. I beg Minneapolis to remember recent and historic uses of police in intimidating our citizens without preventing crime. Minneapolis spent its police dollars arresting 646 peaceful protesters at the post-election protest on I-94. This is what police dollars go to now. These are our communities, so uh, we should care for them and not pay to intimidate them. Finally, it is critical to listen to the voices of black and brown people and organizations because it becomes clearer all the time that police affect different populations in our city differently. Thank you. you start to wrap up. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, speaker 57 is Mia Freiberg. Fifty eight, Peter Ireland. Hi, um, my name is Peter. I live in the Longfellow neighborhood. I'm calling to express my support for the people's budget. Um, as city council members, you're hearing from a number of people who frankly have benefited from the status quo who are telling you they want it to keep on going. You're hearing statements from the mayor and police chief calling a proposal to shift a mere 4% of money away from MPD is irresponsible and untenable. However, we live in a city with some of the largest racial disparities in the U.S. in terms of income, unemployment, poverty, home ownership, police use of force, and incarceration. For many in the city, the status quo is itself irresponsible and untenable. It is irresponsible and untenable to continue to use our tax money to fund an institution that, in your own words, has, quote, led to community destabilization, a decrease in public safety, and the exacerbation of racial inequities in Minneapolis. And I know some of you want to hide behind this anemic 4% reduction in MPD for funding and safety for all plan as some practical middle ground that you can actually get past. But we are in a pandemic. We are in the midst of the largest social movement in U.S. history. But this plan provides no extra money for housing or health care or food. And it continues to primarily view public safety as about keeping the poor from hurting the rich. Is this really the best we can do? And this time demands a new vision for public safety, 
Well, that actually works to fund the community instead of just to control it. Um, you have that vision in the people's budget, and I'm demanding that you have the courage to adopt it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is speaker 59, Wendy Darst. Then we'll be at Evan Oldenrod, Jenny Jones, Lucia Webb, and Vinitha Adams. 59 is Wendy Darst. Hello, uh, my name is Wendy Darst. I have been a resident of Ward 10 for going on 30 years, and I speak in support of the people's budget. I do not believe that reducing policing duties is defunding them. I speak in favor of the decrease in the law enforcement budget to allow for the allocation of resources toward public safety in the form of ending the practice of police-only responses to mental health calls as well as a lot of other responses that seem um, wrong. <laughs> but I speak of what I saw on I-94 on November 4th when they were out in force. And I believe that those resources could be allocated better to our communities. Thank you for your time. And I really appreciate hearing everyone's um, opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 60, Evan Goldenrod. Hello. Welcome. Uh, hello. Uh, the fact that we have a police chief that is complaining about a 7.4% cut while community planning and economic development is set to receive a 28% cut in the middle of an economic crisis and a global pandemic is ridiculous. We need to be pouring more money than we ever have into economic development for our communities, or this crisis will be our legacy. If the MPD are really here for our safety, then I'm sure they will understand transferring money allocated for horses and public image protection into health services and community development. The yawning gap between spending for law enforcement versus spending for violent prevention shows that the city is not really trying to make our communities safer but is instead prioritizing white land owner property protection over human lives. As Sasha Cotton puts it, these systems aren't designed to see our children succeed. The police are demanding more money and more officers because we criminalize being poor and do not invest in our people to help them thrive. The more money we put into our communities, the less we need police. <clears throat> Council, I urge you to be leaders. I urge you to make the necessary change that our city has demanded and not chase after the votes of white moderates. People are fed up and they are not going to go away unless significant change is made at your level. Invest it's in housing, incredible. health services, education, youth programs, environmental justice, and justice demands of your citizens. Support the justice demands coming out of George Floyd Square and support justice for George Floyd. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. That brings us to speaker 61, Jenny Jones. Hi, my name is Jenny Jones. I live in South Minneapolis, four blocks from where George Floyd was murdered by the Minneapolis police. Exhaustive research shows that there is no correlation between spending on police and increased crime, none. While I agree that no one in our community should have to be afraid of violence, please bear in mind that more money to MPD does not equal safety, especially for some of us. In fact, Minneapolis police misconduct reports have increased sevenfold over the past decade, and the MPD is currently under investigation by the Department of Human Rights for racial discrimination. Getting to the root of the causes of crime brings safety. Justice brings safety. This budget is an opportunity to invest in the tools we know work to prevent and stop crime. In this budget, while I see the words, I don't see a financial commitment to justice in South Minneapolis. The residents here have suffered significant disruption to their wellness and livelihoods after city employees killed George Floyd. Our youth have endured a substantial trauma at a stage in their development where they need extra support to process it. Community stakeholders have come together with the list of demands for justice, Resolution 001, which is not being addressed. It includes investment to create new jobs for young people, which will help deter violence undoing racism training for the black community and integrative health services to help residents to heal from the racial trauma that was inflicted by this event. Please start this wrap up. is the epicenter of a global racial reckoning. The world is watching us. Thank you. Thank you. 
Speaker 62, Lucia Webb. Speaker 63 is Vinitha Hi. Adams. My name is. Oh, oh welcome. Hello. This is. Welcome. Ms. Webb. Hi. Yep. Thanks. My name is Lucia Webb and I live in Ward 10. I strongly support the people's budget and I think that parts one and two of the safety for all proposal are um, just the bare minimum that we can expect from the council. Today and in the last budget meeting, I've heard a lot of fear about crime rates, but people seem to be operating under the, the assumption that police prevent crime. They do not, and there is in fact no correlation between the number of officers on the street and crime rates. Additionally, folks seem to think that crime occurs in a vacuum. Crime occurs because people's needs are not getting met. Proposals like the people's budget provide for people's needs by funding things like secure housing, mental health care, and harm reduction. Additionally, I've heard a lot of white people afraid of things like walking their dog or going to their favorite breweries. These callers do not seem to remember that the unrest of the summer was caused by the Minneapolis Police Department's murder of George Floyd. The MPD has long been a hotbed of racist violence, and this summer they showed again that they, that they do not protect our communities of color or our neighbors experiencing houselessness. I feel frustrated that so many callers do not seem to care about their black and brown neighbors, but I also feel hopeful when I remember that in asking you to take money away from the police, we are also asking you to put money into creative, real solutions that can help us to imagine a better world. Please, Please do not pass the mayor's budget. Thank you. Speaker 63 is Vinita Adams. 64 will be Phi Kalar. 67, Hannah Martz. 66, Catherine Sheldon. Ms. Adams. I am not in support of the mayor's budget. I am in support of the people's budget. The police terrifies me. My fear of being murdered and gunned down the street is real, way more real than somebody walking their dog. Um, it's unfair that y'all think that increasing the police budget is going to bring safety when my life is on the line and I'm traumatized every time I see the police. They are slave peddlers. They are harassed. They have been harassing black folks for generations and more generations to come unless y'all pass the people's budget and invest in our communities. It is unfair that the only concern that y'all have right now is walking y'all dogs while I have to worry about my brother or my father or my cousins being gunned down in the streets when they're simply on their way from a basketball game or going to a, a grocery store. What about all the Jamar Clarks and Philando Castells and Sandra Blair? Are we not are we forgetting about them? The Travis, Jordan, all the people that we have marked the riots, they don't remember while we're here. That it does not make any sense that we are even discussing the police at a moment like this and not healing our city. Y'all talking about safety. Well, I don't feel safe. So who is more important? Clearly, white people walking their dogs is more important than black people feeling safe and colored people feeling safe and indigenous people feeling honored for a country that was stolen from them. It does not make any sense. And it is disheartening and it is frustrating and it's infuriating and it is scary. Please, it's very up. scary to have to even keep on explaining. Thank you. Speaker 40, sorry, Speaker 64 is Phi Kalar. Then Hannah Matz, Catherine Sheldon. Hi, my name is Fee, uh, residing in Ward 9, speaking in support of the People's Budget. And actually, I want to use my time to appeal to our braver, more empathetic angels. Fear, cynicism, and skepticism are forces of inaction that work against change. It is easy to fall back into that negative comfort when we feel disconnected or when a task seems too daunting. <clears throat> Monitoring police scanners next door and citizen reinforces that fear because it is self-selected information. I've heard people mention how long they've lived in the area and that it's this anomalous season that is shaking their loyalty in their neighborhood, suggesting that the system had been working for them all these decades. Where were the conversations with your neighbors who it wasn't working for? As we just saw in St. Paul with Joseph Washington, after the fact reprimands are not good enough to keep our people safe. We are envisioning a new kind of community that doesn't rely on police to solve our issues. 
This is a time of transition and a great opportunity to forge those neighborly connections, build a network of trust and mutual aid, and provide people the care they need. It is, a, it is much needed work to dismantle the various cycles of oppression in our city, whether it be by the state or our own hands. Be patient with people and ruthless with systems. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 65, Hannah Martz. Madam. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Go ahead. Hi, um, this is actually, um, my name is Jenna Mastalone. I was number 55. I missed my slot. I was wondering if I could testify. Yes, please go ahead. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I live in Ward 6. Um, I haven't been afraid for my safety once this year. Uh, sorry to you all in Ward 11. Um, but I'm here to advocate for the people's budget. Um, I want to say that just to everyone who feels unsafe that I don't really understand what you think has happened because there's been no money moved from the police budget yet. And the reason you feel so unsafe is probably because we are living in a pandemic where people have no resources um, and more police will not fix that because we have all this police right now um, and we need to give people what they need to thrive. I believe that the people's budget can do that. Um, I appreciate the safety for all um, budget that was proposed. Um, I think what, um, points one and two um, are doing something, but not doing enough. Um, and I'm concerned about point three with continued um, investment in new recruit classes um, and relying on police for our safety. Um, I believe that we really do need to give people what they need and um, to really um, divest ourselves from policing in Minneapolis. Um, I agree with what the speaker a couple, one or two before me just said about people being too afraid to walk their dogs, which is really the least of any of my concerns right now. Um, so I'm advocating for the people's budget. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, this is Hannah Mertz. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Go ahead. I apologize for my uh, error. Um, so yeah, I'm Hannah, I'm a resident of Ward 2 and I support the people's budget. As a facilities manager for several grocery stores in Minneapolis for many years, I have worked to minimize safety and security risk at our sites. I just want to say our city is experiencing higher levels of crime. It's true. And so are many other large cities in our country. Based on my documentation of incidents at my work, this began soon after March lockdown. Those who blame it on the boldness due to calls for defunding or reforming the police are wrong. Our community members are acting out in crisis due to a global pandemic, and we need to be proactive in our solutions, not reactive. Police are usually always reactive. Affordable housing, violence prevention programs, mental health resources, youth programs that are actually available, those are the real solutions. We need safety for all Minneapolis residents, and it is insane that the many who are so concerned about the individual safety of their selves did not care to mention the murder of George Floyd or Jamar Clark and the many others at the hands of police officers when talking about safety in our city. Shame. I have looked for resources for folks experiencing mental health crises and have resorted to calling the police in the past. In my experience, police officers were not quick to respond, nor were they very helpful. Our police chief has said he wants officers to continue to respond to these calls to build community trust, but in my experience, I've seen the following. Officers can issue citations, arrest them, or they don't do anything for the community member. How does that build community trust? Let's do, something different in, let's do something different in Minneapolis. Please support the people's budget. Please change. Thank you. That was speaker 65. So now we're on speaker 66, Catherine Sheldon. Then we'll have Zosha, Winnegar Schultz, Julia Johnson, and Carrie Jo Felder. Speaker 66, Catherine Sheldon. Hi, my name is Kate Sheldon. I live in Ward 9 in Midtown Phillips. Uh, I want to echo that police officers do not prevent crime. They show up after it happens. Police only offer a semblance of security for white property owners and serve to maintain our current racist status quo. No amount of funding or reform will fix the inherent racism and culture that is embedded in the Minneapolis Police Department. The entire world learned George Floyd's name this past summer because Minneapolis police officers murdered him in broad daylight. We as a city cannot keep pretending that we don't see the violence that this police department creates. No one commits a crime just because they feel like it. Crime is born out of desperation and lack of resources. 
We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Poverty is skyrocketing. This city needs to fund groups that support health and preventative services in our communities. Mental health services, restorative justice, harm reduction services, and environmental justice initiatives. This budget is an opportunity to put trust and resources in the hands of the smart, caring, and compassionate citizens of Minneapolis to work towards health and stability for all, not police officers who live in the suburbs coming into our city heavily armed, scared, and angry. The council can and should start shifting funding now from MPD in order to build real change. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 68, no, 67 is Zosha Weingar Schultz. I'm calling from Ward 10 and I support the people's budget. I feel safer than I um, ever have in this city. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. If we've missed someone, we will come back. I feel safer than I ever have in this city. I can rely on my neighbors and my community now more than ever. The only time I haven't felt safe in recent memory was when I was kettled on the freeway by law enforcement for six hours without water or restroom. This was before I was arrested and forced onto a bus with no social distancing measures in a global pandemic. Protesters were never given a dispersal order, and not a single law enforcement officer there that night was wearing a mask. For all of the whiny ass who off calling in to complain that they have to drive to the suburbs in their car to buy groceries, thank God you own a car and can afford groceries, or your National Historic Register house received one gunshot, let alone the black men that have been killed by police, you should ask yourself why you don't feel safe. Perhaps it's because you are being forced to reckon with the fact that your sense of safety is dependent on historically racist institutions and white supremacy. Even in a cynical view of the police, that their only goal is to maintain public order so businesses can operate efficiently, how does their blocking a protest for hours and hours on the interstate for longer than the protest was scheduled to take place serve that goal? How does assaulting peaceful onlookers standing on the property of their own apartment complex serve that goal, let alone the community you supposedly serve? It is obvious that MPD is not operating in a rational manner, yet you not only continue to defend them, but fund them. It is you who are not operating in a rational manner. Lastly, the council members, Kano and Jenkins, you are cowards and you should be ashamed of yourselves. Fuck you and fuck the police. Okay, thank you. We'll ask Indeed. our speakers to please be respectful um, and use respectful language. And you can address me as the chair um, directly. Uh, our next speaker, so that was speaker 67. I wanna make sure we didn't miss anyone. I heard some folks chiming in. I was number 32. 32? I was number 32, but it said row 32. What does that mean? <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. Why, why don't you go ahead? We'll sort it out. This is Thomas Oz. State your name. Hi, this is Hannah Whitevin. I was speaker number 49. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. My name is Hannah Whitevin, and I'm a business owner in Ward 6, and I'm calling in support of the people's budget because I've seen as a business owner who owns a business that's open from 5.30 a.m. until frequently 9.30, 10.30 p.m., I've seen that the, the area that we live in is not being addressed by the police in an appropriate way. I've often had people outside of my business who are suffering from mental health crises or are experiencing drug overdose. And when I call the police because I have no other choice, they're often delayed to show up. When they do show up, they enact violence on those people and we don't feel like we have another choice. Myself and other business owners in my same building often rely on one another to help address circumstances because we fear calling the police as we've witnessed them execute violence on a number of people in our community. We are small business owners and we don't feel unsafe because the people in our community are there outside of our spaces. We feel unsafe calling the police to help us deal with issues because we often see them enact violence on our community that we're trying to stay connected to. It harms my business and me as a business owner for me to interact with the police because it damages my relationship with my community when I use the police as a force against them. 
I would like to see something else like a mental health crisis line that I can call and have someone come that is not a police officer to help my community members when they are in need and I cannot help as one person. So Thank I'm in you. support of the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll return to our list, which brings us to uh, Mr. Clerk. I, I'm on speaker 68. Is that correct? You are correct, Madam President. So speaker 68 is Julia Johnson. Then we'll have Carrie Jo Felder, Paul Jackson, and Dave Bicking. Ms. Johnson. Julia Johnson, Southside, Ward 11. Of the countless times I've talked to someone who was in a housing, food, mental health, or other type of crisis, my immediate reaction isn't to find a government agency to help. People in desperate situations are too often put on a waiting list for years, are told they don't qualify, or never get someone to return their call. As the City of Minneapolis proposes to spend $179 million to fund a police department that does not prevent crime, targets marginalized people with violence and murders with impunity, I think about all the other departments that need funded instead. Right now, we need clear and courageous decision making from our elected official, officials, which is why I support the People's Budget, a proposal from now over 53 organizations to build up the systems that can actually keep us safe. People of color and poor folks have been telling elected officials our experiences for years. When the MPD responds to 911 calls, they escalate situations, turn violent against the people who called for help, or racially profile and harass an innocent person who supposedly fits the description. The best case scenario when police are called is for them to show up just to say there's nothing they can do to help. Imagine if that $179 million was instead injected into our communities to prevent, stop, and repair suffering and harm. If that were the case, I imagine George Floyd would still be here today. Thank you. Speaker 69 is Carrie Jo Felder. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. Carrie Jo Felder, Ward 4. Why are we where we are? It is because communities of color have been struggling for decades. Because the have nots are desperate, Minneapolis throughout the years has created the space we are in. People and children have lost hope and we are seeing their normal. And that's showing us that we haven't done enough so far. As an outgoing school board member from North Minneapolis, I've been looking at the inadequate funding and programming that has been given to North Minneapolis, whether it has been educational opportunities, low income, affordable housing, or jobs, basically all that which is support people's campaign, we haven't done enough. Because of the lack of low income housing available, many support networks have been broken because of busing Northside kids around to fill other homes in the city Northside schools have lots of programs or funding for. Because of unbalanced job hiring, communities of colors have been struggling for decades. And so I applaud you for trying to turn the helm of that ship, structural racism. I implore you to build more housing and social spaces on the north side. I also ask if you have an eight-year-old minus the parks, where do you take them for their birthday party on the north side? I'm also hoping that you keep and increase the budget for our neighborhood organizations, which do great things over north and all over the city, and also more money for mental health and youth programs. Maybe create a city center where kids can have jobs and hang out, mass building of families uh, for their families' families, even if that makes the Please upper harbor terminal us. all low income, I support. Ms. Felder. So we lost our caller. Um, and so uh, we I'll just restate that if folks um, get cut off or have more to say, you can always email us and we appreciate so much folks coming to testify. Speaker 70 is Paul Jackson, then Dave Bicking, Jesse Barnes, Abigail Johnson. Welcome, Mr. Jackson. Revealed it was. Mr. Jackson. The murder of George, the murder of George Floyd revealed what was already there. Acceptable disparity between whites and people of color, historical and systemic racism in the police force, and an affordable housing crisis. The impact of riots and COVID has left our city a mere shell of what it once was. However, as horrific as George Floyd's murder was, we were also given an opportunity to unite as one community, one family, and create the kind of change that would last for generations to come. Unfortunately, we are seeing the exact opposite. I've never seen our community more polar neighbors against neighbors, culture wars brewing, and a general loss of safety and security on our streets. The city council has not led us effectively into a new future. 
the irresponsible and undefined language from the majority of the city council regarding defunding and abolishing the police department left a void that has been filled with conjecture, assumptions, and general confusion. But here we are, six months later, still trying to figure this out. We entrusted our city leaders to guide and direct us to a bold new future as one. Inside, instead, Lisa Bender and her followers are committed to their dangerous go-to-loan agenda. Make no mistake that vision is already becoming a reality. The impact of a defunded and shrinking police force is now clear. 69 minutes wait for police to show up. Nearly 80 murders so far. 500 shootings, 3,000 shots. It's imperative that you do not cut an additional 8 million police budget. The chief has made it clear that to do so would signal. Thank you. 71 is Dave Bicking. Welcome. Dave Bicking, Ward 8. Uh, defund the police sure sounded like a radical slogan, but your actions so far show the hypocrisy of your rhetoric. COVID has required across the board budget cuts, but the police department has been largely protected from those cuts. Its budget has so far been cut less by percentage than nearly any other department in the city. There is a lot you can do now to downsize the police department. You should fully fund the proposal for alternative mental health responses that has been researched and put forward by CUAPB with the support of a large coalition. It is much superior to a watered down approach coming from the city working group. There are other functions that the MPD should not be responding to at all. Low level drug possession, overdoses, other medical issues, breaking up homeless encampments and more. And just from a budgetary standpoint, the Minneapolis police should not be used for unnecessary, brutal and escalating responses to peaceful protest. An immediate reduction of the budget can be had by firing or disciplining the cops who are abusing sick leave, earning full pay and benefits while sitting at home. We have been saying for years that there is virtually no discipline or accountability in the police department for misconduct. And it is apparent that there isn't even enough discipline for the MPD to get its officers to come to work. No other employer, public or private, would tolerate one eighth of its workers calling in sick for months. Thank you. Speaker 72, Jesse Barnes. My name is in South Minneapolis and uh, I support the people's budget and I believe we're being played uh, by the MPD. We're being told that a decrease in the police budget would delay professional standards training, limit response to livability issues, eliminate neighborhood beats. Why are these the areas that the citizens of Minneapolis risk having impacted when the proposed budget has $8.6 million in public relations, 7 million in SWAT raids and riot response, 3 million for canines that aren't affected in detecting drugs, 900,000 for mounted cops, 230,000 for intervention systems that are essentially police policing themselves. This will not make us safe. I wanted to bring up the following quotes. The department is irredeemably beyond reform, Councilmember Fletcher. This one from Councilmember Cunningham. Even officers tell me they aren't equipped for a myriad of issues like mental health crisis, drug overdoses, and even domestic violence. But there seems to be political ways to increase their funding. This one from Councilmember Cano. The MP Minneapolis Police Department is not reformable. And Councilmember Ch Bender, this is you saying, it is clear to me that our attempts at incremental reform of policing have failed. We need deep structural change. And finally, this quote by Benjamin Dwayne Amis saying, it is to be regretted that we have leaders who are bound to these political machines. You do a great service, disservice to the fight for black liberation. The world is watching. Thank you. Speaker 73, Abigail Johnson. Folks will have to push star six to unmute. It takes just a second to get started. And then we'll have Jamie Hopkins, Jam Leomi, Cassie Rollins, and Lynn Hu next. Abigail Johnson is speaker 73. We'll go to speaker 74, Jamie Hopkins. Hi, I'm speaker 57, is it all right? Oh, sorry. 
Sorry, go ahead. Mr. Hopkins, go ahead and then we'll come right back to the next to the other speaker. Thank you. My name is Jamie and I live in Laramie Hill. I could talk about my own personal experiences with the gang that we call police or about the science or the history or any of these things that everyone should know by now. So I'm going to say something new. This movement to abolish the police is going to win in our lifetimes. It's unstoppable and history bends towards justice. Now from the council, you can be a part of moving towards justice by adopting the people's budget. Or you can get in the way, move a million bucks here, move a million bucks there, play it off as so-called safety for all as if cops aren't going to keep killing the people we love. You all know, everyone knows what happened in May. We all know that there's thousands and thousands of us who would love to see more police stations go up in flames as part of the radical transformational change that we need to happen and that will happen. But if you want to go about it with a little less chaos than that, the council can begin by adopting the people's budget. Dismantle white supremacy, free the people, and abolish prisons and police. Thank you. Speaker 75. Oh, sorry. Uh, we'll return back to the other speaker who we had missed earlier. Hi, my name is Mia Freiberg. I was speaker since 57. Is it all right if I go? Yes, welcome. Thanks. Do I have 90 seconds? Yes, and I'll give you a warning at 60. Thanks. Um, so yeah, my name is Mia Freiberg and I live in Ward 11. Um, <laughs> I don't live in Ward 11. I live in Ward 10 and part of why I'm calling is to um, call in, hopefully, the folks who called at the last hearing um, from Ward 11. It was one of the most heinous and ridiculous things I've ever heard. People saying that they're unsafe leaving their homes in South Minneapolis, walking outside. I live by the Kmart on First Avenue. I walk around all the time. These people are conflating the presence of houseless folks and people of color and black individuals who live in the city. Um, it's incredibly disheartening to hear, and I am just so much more heartened to hear everyone on this call in support of the people's budget. Parts one and two, the safety for all proposal is the bare minimum that we can expect from the council. So I really hope that you're hearing us. Um, I hope you understand how nonsensical um, those claims that it's not safe to be outside in Minneapolis. It's it's really baffling. Um, and yeah, I really hope that you, you start stick to wrap with, up. Okay, what you had previously promised to do and defund the police and fund actual public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll now go to speaker 75, Jam Leone. Hello, I'm Jam Leomi, a constituent of Ward 8, as well as a non-binary Black queer. I wanted to speak about the opportunity to have an impact on citizen healing within our budget. Unfortunately, as much as I want to critique the budget regarding our police force, even mentioning why after years of brutality is too traumatizing, which is why I'm focusing instead on doing better for our community. After such a hard year of disease, destruction, and trauma in the city, I believe in the people's budget proposal to make change for the better. It is more centered around the community and healing, including 24-7 mental mobile health units and providing more budget for housing. I want to see my tax dollars, including homeowner property fees, fund the people's budget initiatives, not the MPD, because community center support is how we provide real public safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker 76 is Cassie Rollins. Cassie Rollins. Um, 
Hi, my name is Cassie Rollins. I am a white woman living near 38th and Cedar in Ward 12, and I'm calling in support of the people's budget. Our status quo of public safety isn't working. So why do we continue to pour money into a failing system? In the past six years, MPD's budget has increased by 33%, or by $40.8 million. During the same period, the general operating fund increased by only 7%. And I mean, this is a really small thing, but like, do we really need to spend almost a million dollars to maintain a fleet of mounted police on horses? It's 2020, y'all. And if you've seen the treasured Christmas movie Elf, you know that the Central Park Rangers are all on the naughty list. I believe that another world is possible, where public safety is not about punishment, but is instead about public health, harm reduction, affordable housing, fully funded education, and transformative, transformative justice. That vision can only begin by moving money away from harmful policies and into life-affirming and anti-racist policies. We don't need more money for police. We do need more affordable housing. We do need direct economic relief for people and families that have been hit with hardship after hardship in a difficult year. So council members, if you're serious about reimagining a Minneapolis that is safe for everyone, not just white people, start now. Support the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 77 is Lynn Hu. Then we'll have Sam Gisselman, Emily Collins, Susie Passens, and Allison Griffin. Speaker 77 is Lynn Hu. Hello, I live in the Powderhorn neighborhood and I am calling in support of the People's Budget. I am an advocate for victims of domestic violence. And if I had a nickel for every time I heard a survivor's testimony telling me they called the police and police did not do anything to help them in a crisis, I would have more money than MPD. Every day I listen to victims of these violent crimes that people are hypothetically so afraid of. The people who I speak to give me firsthand accounts telling me the cops said, we can't arrest him for threatening your life. We can't make him leave his own home. We can't do anything. These officers admit this to the community they're sworn to serve. Police intervention fails to keep us safe and creates more harm by traumatizing victims. We are asking for MPD to hold themselves accountable and they failed to deliver. We ask our leaders to invest in alternate solutions like housing that actually address the root of crime and you fail to deliver. We are asking you now to invest in the community <clears throat> you swore to protect by passing the people's budget to fund solutions that will actually keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 78, Sam Gisselman. Good evening, my name is Sam Gisselman. Uh, I thank the full council for the work that you do. I appreciate your service. I uh, just want to provide a reminder that our city was internationally shamed and embarrassed by what happened to George Floyd on Memorial Day of this year. That was under this police model with these resources. Now here we have a group of people tonight saying almost universally that they feel less secure, less safe, and lesser served by this police force in this police model with these resources. No change in resources. Why would we, any of us think, why would any of us believe that maintaining current resource levels, much less increasing resources to these police under this model will bring us back to the level of safety and comfort that apparently we enjoyed a year ago, much less dramatically increase the level of safety across our entire city which is in fact what we all need and want. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 79, Emily Collins. Hello. Hi, welcome. Hi, I would like to thank the City Council. I would like to thank you for shining a light on your complete ineptness. I would like, you to, like to thank you for being such a complete embarrassment to the city that more residents than ever are aware of how important your roles are in the power you have and how you have failed. Tonight, I could spew statistic after statistic on why it is apparent that cutting the police budget is ridiculous and dangerous, but six of you will not listen. You have not and will not support your constituents. You will only continue to listen to your own small base of fans. It is clear that the leadership of the city has not and will not work together. I urge the residents who are angry, scared, and disappointed 
to organize, identify actual qualified and experienced candidates to replace at least nine of you who have proved themselves less than effective. To quote one of your colleagues, this is absolutely complete BS. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 80, Susie Passens. Then Allison Griffin, Colleen Kepler, Stephen Tannen, and Bonnie Frieden. Ms. Passens. Susie Passens, Ward 13. I've been a resident of Minneapolis for nine years. I am the recent victim of a carjacking and assault. On a beautiful, sunny October afternoon, I stepped out of my parked car on Shawan Avenue when out of nowhere, four masked young teenagers pushed me to the ground, kicked me in the side of the head, stole my purse and my phone, continued to beat me while I screamed uncontrollably. It was then when neighbors uh, started coming out because of uh, the screaming that they heard. Our car was used in additional carjackings and assaults throughout the city and was only recently recovered more than a month later. My attackers have yet to be caught. I support Mayor Fry's budget proposal. I support Chief Arredondo, and I support a fully staffed, fully funded police force. My story is one of literally hundreds of victims in Minneapolis. If you have not yet been a victim and you think you are safe, you are ignorant. We are not safe. We need a fully funded, fully staffed police force. We need a city council that to listens up. to its constituents. As leaders, you are put in place to serve and to listen and to act accordingly. You are only serving yourself and a small minority. Thank you. The next speaker is 81, Allison Griffin. Allison Griffin. Speaker 82 is Colleen Kepler. Hey, this is Colleen Kepler. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, hi, this is uh, Colleen. I'm from Ward 13, and I condemn the murder of George Floyd. With 18 prior complaints filed against Chauvin, fixing the system that provides immunity without accountability should be top priority. The 2021 budget is not the tool to do this. We often hear the council call the budget a moral document, one that reflects our values. A majority of residents feel the police force should not be reduced, with black voters notably seven points higher in demanding this than the general population. Is it moral that the same council that claims to be centered on race equity ignores the needs of these black residents. In Chicago, there is research from 2019 related to police misconduct. Less than 5% of Chicago cops account for most of the city's misconduct cases. While data for Minneapolis is not confirmed, if the worst 5% of officers were held accountable and the other 95% were properly supported, public trust would be gained. The 95% police trying to do their job do not, need this body, do not need this body undermining their critical roles in keeping our city safe. People sent like change makers without doing the work of keeping our safe is immoral. Thank you. 83, Stephen Tannen. Then we'll have Bonnie Frieden, Larissa Shar, James Ronnie, and Aaron West. 83 is Stephen Tannen. Eighty-four is Bonnie Frieden. Hi, my name is Bonnie Frieden. I live in Whittier. I want to testify in support of the first two points of the safety for all plan 
and in support of generally moving funds from the police into programs that help to address the root causes of harm and violence. I am privileged enough to generally feel safe from harm walking down the street, but I also often feel helpless and ashamed. I've been in many situations in the city where I don't have the resources to help someone and I am left to choose between bad options. A mental health hotline where no one could respond for two hours or calling 911 and risking someone being criminalized or killed for addiction or homelessness. I don't want to live in a community that criminalizes people who need help and police has shown us time and time again that they are not the right organization to provide people with help. They do violence. That is what they do. People are blaming increased crime on defund the police messaging when no money has yet been taken from police. It's just that criminalization doesn't solve crime when people are hurting and desperate, which is what they are when we criminalize addiction and poverty and homelessness and provide no relief during a global pandemic. As a teacher, I know that punishment and fear don't work. Creating an environment in which students are safe and able to succeed is what works, and the same is true of a society. Please do whatever you can to redirect resources away from the police into the things that actually make life better for people. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 85 is Larissa Shar. Speaker 85, Larissa Shar. Speaker 86, James Ronnie. Hello, uh, my name is James Ronnie. I was born and raised in Minneapolis and currently live in Ward 13. I'm calling in opposition to any funding cuts directed against the safe staffing capabilities and future success of our Minneapolis Police Department. Defund the police lacks broad support as surveys in our recent election have demonstrated. Studies show that police do deter crime and make us safer. Increased police patrols have been shown to reduce crime. There is broad support for reform of our existing police department. Reform takes dedication, engagement, support, and most of all, funding. You have a golden opportunity right now to push reforms in the open MPD contract, which will lead to better public safety for all. Furthermore, there is a clear need to begin recruiting and training our future force now. Chief Arredondo has said our force should be staffed at 1,000 officers. This is your chance to determine who you want to recruit for our public safety front line. This is your opportunity to change the culture of our MPD. We need a lot more police. We need well-funded, well-staffed, well-trained, and well-rested police for all of our safety. Please fully fund and staff our Minneapolis Police Department now. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 87, Aaron West. Steve Tan. My name is Erin West, and I live in the Seward neighborhood, Ward 6. I am deeply disappointed in the mayor's budget and in full, in full support of the people's budget instead because I want to see funds moved away from the police and into programs that support social wellness, including economic relief, health, and education. I've never felt more safe in Minneapolis than I do now. During the pandemic and the uprising following the murder of George Floyd, my neighbors and I got to know each other and built channels of communication so we could take care of each other. Now we share everything from rent relief to recipes. The only time I felt unsafe in my neighborhood is when I tried to pull my roommates over a fence to escape the kettle on I-94 and was rushed up by a line of cops on horses. Now more than ever, while we experience the highest surge of COVID cases yet, the people of Minneapolis do not need police, we need care. I urge the council members to remember when they stood in Powderhorn Park this June and pledged to end the MPD. I was there that afternoon and felt proud of my elected officials, but tonight I feel ashamed. Items one and two of the safety for all proposal is only the bare minimum of what we expect from you. The people are watching, rest in power, George Floyd. Thank you. We have speaker 83, Stephen Tannen on the line. Please go ahead. Thank you, city council. I wanna thank Lene Palmasano and Mayor Fry and Chief Arredondo for everything they're doing right now to keep our city safe. Uh, I've been a resident of Minneapolis since 1998. I'm a Hispanic Special Operations Combat Veteran, and I'm a dad of three girls. I am neither naive nor 
altru overly altruistic. The first thing we need to do is fund MPD to 1,000 officers as Chief Arradondo requests. The second thing we need to do is, yes, there needs to be incremental funding for mental health and social workers embedded into each precinct, but not, not at the expense of MPD. The third thing that needs to happen, city council members need to quarterly ride with MPD so they can understand what the police officers go through on a day in and day out basis. It is not an easy job. Fourth, I think we need to come up with residency incentives for MPD to live in the city and in the precinct where they, where they work. Fifth, no more private security funded from taxpayer funds. You know who you are, city council members. If you don't feel safe, you can go out and get your conceal and carry weapon uh, license and get your gun permit just like every other citizen has to, okay? No more taxpayer money. Lastly, I want to say if you are one of the young, liberal, idealistic folks that really hasn't lived, that has never only been in Minneapolis your whole life, I think you need more world. Thank you. Speaker 88, David Thurkinson, Thurkelson. Then we'll have Patty O'Keefe, Marsha Mays, Ariana Nason, and Peter Zeftel. Speaker 88 is David Thurkelson. Speaker 89, Patty O'Keefe. Speaker 90 is Marsha Mays. Folks will just need to push star six to unmute. Speaker 91 is Ariana Nason. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, I am Ariana Nathan, a member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and proud longtime resident of the 38th in Chicago Autonomous Zone, otherwise known as George Floyd Square. For the last six months, it's been me and my neighbors keeping each other sustainably safe, providing wraparound health care services, coordinating public works, and effectively rejecting systems of white supremacy and creating a better future. I have never felt more safe. Our village is strong, all are welcome, and it's far past time to start investing in the people of the city and not the systems that are murdering us at record numbers. After reviewing parts one and two of the safety for all proposal, I'm personally feeling insulted because this is the bare minimum of we, what we expect and what we have been promised by this council. After all this council has allowed us to go through, all of the trauma that we've experienced at the hands of an uncontrollable and unreformable force, because remember, this is the reformed force, and after we have been left to pull funding out of nowhere for our livelihoods, I require way more from this council. Part three is simply a veiled repeat attempt to paint a pretty picture of a violent system that structurally functions as an arm of white supremacy. And it is insulting that the idea of simply changing the relationship building practices between police and community is an adequate way to address centuries of violence and ongoing genocide that our community faces by their hands. The data is there and has been there and MPD 150 conveniently put it all together in their free report. To everyone else, your idea of safety cannot come at the expense of my life. No justice, no streets support the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just pause and see if we have um, David Thurkelson, Patty O'Keefe, or Marsha Mays. That brings us to Speaker 92, Peter Zaftel. Then we'll have Danny Gorman, Matt Mushelman, Mushelman, Missy Galindo, and Gwendolyn Clark. Speaker 92, Peter Zaftel. Thank you. I'm Peter Zeftel. Um, I live a block away from where the Minneapolis Police Department killed George Floyd over an alleged $20 theft or counterfeit, passing a counterfeit bill. You know, I hear from my neighbors and callers that they're scared, that they're worried about being carjacked, Ugh, don't feel safe to walk their dog. You know, I don't feel any of those things living a block away from where George Floyd was killed. I do know that more cops does not mean more safety. More cops coming from the suburbs or Wisconsin don't solve anything. They don't solve homelessness. They don't solve 
lack of medical care. They don't solve lack of jobs. I'd like, I, I support your safety for all budget. I think that's great, a great start. I'd also like to see that the city invest in jobs for young people, 12 year olds, 15 year olds that are carjacking. They're doing that because they have no, no hope for the future. You know, if, if people that young were tracked into being a carpenter, a doctor, a nurse, EMT, any job that had a future, you know, that's where you reach at least some of them. Please start that's to wrap up. Them. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's really enough. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 93, Danny Gorman. Uh, this is Dave Therkelson. I've been called. I'm sorry, say your name again. Uh, David Therkelson. Oh, yes. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, can go I ahead. Uh, yes, go ahead. Therkelson. I'm David Thurkelson. I live in the Tulsa Ward. I've been a homeowner in Minneapolis for 45 years. Just today in the strip, we read about a six-fold increase in carjackings over just one year ago. And just today, my wife and I ordered a personal security alarm keychain so we can move around the city a little less carefully. I'm sorry if this baffles uh, the people's budget friends a little bit, but it's the reality. The first job of government at any level is public safety. This principle must be honored in the 2021 budget. It's a tough budget year, but public safety must be the last place, not the first place, to look for needed spending reductions. Since Memorial Day weekend, violent crime and level of police staffing have moved in opposite directions and unfortunately in the wrong directions. Police reform is of critical importance to the city of Minneapolis and its residents. Some of us would like to see a little more maturity and less sloganeering in how reform is addressed, but it's absolutely necessary to get to a point where all cops treat all citizens with professionalism and respect. But meanwhile, as we tackle the need of reforms, the city needs to be safe. There is no conflict whatsoever between seeking necessary reform of policing and maintaining enough police presence to confront violent crime. Start Please start to wrap up. Thinking and adopt a budget that reforms police and curbs violent crime. Do both. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 93 is Danny Gorman. Then we'll have Matt Mushalim, Missy Galindo, Gwendolyn Clark, and Jessica Rosenberg. Speaker 93 is Danny Gorman. We'll go to Speaker 94, Matt Mushalim. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Mushalim, and I'm a homeowner in Ward 2 in Longfellow neighborhood. I'm speaking in opposition to the mayor's proposed budget and in support of the people's budget. Mayor Fry and Chief Arredondo like paying lip service to police reform while asking for more money for cops at every chance they get. And they tell us to trust that MPD knows what's best for public safety. But they betrayed that trust when a long serving officer kneeled on George Floyd's neck until he died as three other MPD officers watched. They betrayed that trust when police fired tear gas at peaceful protesters and arrested them by the hundreds for exercising their right to free speech. They betrayed that trust when neighbors had to band together to protect their blocks from arson and white supremacist violence during the uprising while police were nowhere to be found. And they betrayed that trust countless times over MPD's history while reform after reform has failed to alter the fundamental truth that the police don't keep us safe. The people of Minneapolis have seen with our own eyes all the ways where the current system has failed and we have no choice but to put in the work to build alternatives. The safety for all plan proposed by council members Cunningham, Fletcher and Bender is the least that we can do to start to reconcile MPD's failures and the city's budget crisis as Minneapolis residents face their own crises of violence, economic precarity and public health. The people of Minneapolis can't afford to entrust public safety to the police. I support the people's budget because it lays out a plan to fund services that are actually effective at addressing the needs of our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 95, Missy Galindo. Uh, I want to start off and say that I support the people's budgets and part one and two of the safety for all proposal is the very bare minimum that we expect from the council. I've been, it's been proven time and time again that, the, that more police does not prevent crime. 
People of color and marginalized people continue to be oppressed and harassed by MPD. And all of you who are crying about crime in your rich wards worry me because I feel that the only thing that you're scared of is people of color. Your worries about not being able to walk your dog are a joke compared to people of color who fear for their lives because of the police. There should be less money being funneled into the MPD because there are tons of other things that need funding, such as affordable housing, education, more resources for low-income communities, and so on. There should be more funding for mental health teams to be dispatched instead of police during mental health crises. MPD continues to waste our money by mass arresting people as they did on I-94. And we do not need more officers to terrorize our communities and create more victims like George Floyd, Jamar Clark, and so on. It is very concerning for all of you to turn a blind eye to the homelessness issue in Minneapolis, but cry about MPD being defunded when there are people in the cold without food or homes. Funding resources to help unhoused folks as well as people in need is what prevents crime. Choose what is right, not what makes pe white people of this city comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 96, Gwendolyn Clark. Speaker 97 will be Jessica Rosenberg. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Gwendolyn Clark. I live in uh, Southeast Minneapolis. I'm calling to voice my support for the people's budget parts one and two as the bare minimum of, um, of policy and law enforcement, uh, law enforcement evolution that uh, should be enacted as part of this budget. Um, you know, police brutality, police, um, whatever you want to call it, is not a uh, is not an abstract. It is not a thing on the news. It is real and tangible. Uh, it is my friends who have been profiled and arrested and detained for exercising their lawful right to assemble without receiving a prior lawful order to disperse. It is my roommate who suffered lung damage after being tear gassed while peacefully protesting the extrajudicial murder of George Floyd. Uh, it is them and so many other people who I have talked to, lived with, and um, heard from and felt largely powerless to do anything about it. This is not the reality law enforcement or community safety that we were promised and it is not the one that we deserve. When you have a force that is and has been historically leveraged not to the benefit of the people, but to the benefit of property, and that's, that's not an extrapolation on my part, there's concrete legal precedent for that. Uh, Supreme Court ruling, uh, DeShaney versus Winnebago County, the police are obligated to uphold the law, not to protect human beings. You can look that up. Uh, and they have been trained, funded, and actively encouraged by policy and by uh, policy makers to uphold that law to protect. Thank you. Speaker 97 is Jessica Rosenberg. Then we'll have Aaron Lika, Brianna Patnode, Stephanie Groover, and Jim Galvin. 97 is Jessica Rosenberg. My name is Rabbi Jessica Rosenberg. I live in Bancroft in Ward 8 and I support the people's budget. Parts one and two of the safety for all proposal is the bare minimum that we need from the council. As a Jew and as a rabbi, I know that my safety and my community's safety will only come from community-based violence preventions, healthcare, housing, and creating a city where all people can thrive. My people's history and my lived experience has taught me that police are inherently violent. Police come after harm has happened and do nothing to change the conditions that lead to harm and violence. I believe that Minneapolis can this year, right now, move, move towards solutions that, to harm that keep us all safe. For the sake of the lives and safety and survival and dignity of my black and brown family and neighbors and friends, for the sake of all of our wellness and thriving, and to honor the memory of George Floyd, Zikrona Libraha, I ask that the City Council support the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 98, Aaron Lika. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm, I'm Aaron Elka, yeah. uh, homeowner speakers. and parent of young kids in Kingfield. I've been listening to what people have said in previous calls and earlier on this call. Um, what I'm hearing from my fellow citizens is a desperate plea to reinvest in the deeply racist status quo, as well as a refusal to engage with good faith efforts to reimagine community safety after the momentous events of this summer. I want to remind everyone what the status quo looks like. 
78% of police searches and more than half of all traffic stops citywide are of black and East African motorists, despite those groups making up less than 20% of our population. Dozens of murders happen every single year, even under a fully funded MPD. In the last 20 years, Minneapolis police have killed an average of almost two people a year. The vast majority of their victims are people of color. Officers like Chauvin are routinely kept on patrol despite a history of excessive force and a majority of the city's sworn officers have elected and re-elected a Trump-supporting white supremacist leader with a record of ex excessive force. As the MPD 150 report puts it, the status quo is George Floyd calling out for his mother as a police officer kneels on his neck. I believe that some form of organized community safety will always be necessary, but I also think we need to deepen our investment in community through violence prevention, homelessness programs, youth outreach, and mental health responders. If policing is our only solution to com community safety, we are consigning ourselves to more of the same status quo that works fine for some people, but actively harms others. Let's look at alternatives like the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. And then I heard a speaker who we must have missed. Who was that? Please state your name. I'm Lisa. Hi, thanks. Go ahead. Hi, this is Amelita. Hello, my name is Anamika Kapoor, and the Twin Cities has been my home for the better part of 12 years. I support point 22 of the Safety for All plan, which is the minimum that the City Council can offer for its constituents, and fully support the people's budget. I'm calling in tonight because I have been struck super deeply by the disconnect the mayor's budget shows for the priorities of the city and a deep lack of leadership going to ask simple questions and hold down so they get their answers. This year, in the middle of competing pandemics of COVID and police brutality, Minneapolis's homeless population rose to over 10,000 people, the highest since 1991. In the middle of the vast staffing shortage, the mayor and chief Arredondo keep speaking about the city having in terms of police. We were paying Minneapolis Police Department officers up to $65 an hour to evict these encampments. Where should these vast and house go? No idea. That's not our problem. These encampments are supported almost wholly by the actions of volunteers, organizers, and regular Minneapolis citizens. Where is the angst about funding here? Where is the concern about how to house these vast numbers of unhoused in Minnesota in the winter? It's not in any of the budgets promoted by the city council or by the mayor. It is in the people's budget, which is what we should actually be talking about tonight. To bring Thank it back you. home, Please don't Minneapolis is a direct action of four MPD officers committing murder in broad daylight. Thank you. That was Speaker 56 for the clerk. Hi, I was also missed. That was number 73. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, this is Abigail Johnson. Um, I want to say that I support the people's budget and I support the people that spoke before me. Um, and all the things that they say. I know a lot of white homeowners still think that police equal safety, but I think council members that you know and I know and many on this call know that safety comes from stable housing, health services, and access to education and jobs, things that have so long been denied to so many in our city. Uh, so now is the time to fund justice by putting money towards these things so that all residents can feel safe in Minneapolis. Safety is not a zero-sum game. Studies have shown that the more cops, more cops does not equal less crime, and you know this. So to the nine of you that promised to defund the police this summer, now is your opportunity. Um, and at the end of the day, you lost votes from the law and order crowd, and if you promise to defund the police and you don't do it, you'll lose the rest of the votes. But you do have to look at yourselves in the mirror every day, so I just ask that you do the right thing. Thank you. This will bring us back to speaker 99, Brianna Patnode. Then we'll have Stephanie Groover, Jim Galvin, and Judy Hannigan. Speaker 99 is Brianna Patnode. Thanks, City Council. My name is Brianna Patnode. I'm a white person living in North Minneapolis, Ward 5. Happy to be hearing lots of potential mayor mayoral voices out here tonight. Shout out Ariana Nason. I support the People's Budget Part 1 and 2 as a bare minimum from the council. An increase to the police budget in 2021 is a slap in the face of the people of Minneapolis. I'm an unemployed working class artist who has always lived paycheck to paycheck, and I'm spending my time in this pandemic feeding communities out of my car. 
I am protecting and serving my community and being paid nothing, but MPD deserves $80 an hour to traumatize citizens day in and day out. I think city council members should take a monthly ride with me. Crime is high because people are dying out here. I am not afraid to walk my dog in my community. I regularly walk my dog and talk to my neighbors. I am afraid of the way the police will continue to hurt, traumatize, and kill, kill innocent people who I love, people who we need, my neighbors, my friends, my family. I'm having conversations with our family at the encampments. People are looking at me in the eyes and sobbing to me that they are dying and nobody in the world cares for them. I'll ask some of my fellow Minneapolisans to get off of next door and citizen apps and get to know your community so you don't have to fear them. I am surrounded by people who want to do good in the world and we have no options. There is no reason police should be responding to mental health calls. I and many people around me suffer with mental health issues. We are not criminals. Guns are not necessary in any response to a mental health crisis. It is completely unjustified that any of them end in loss. On October 5th at 2 a.m. Thank you. And folks can always email their testimony. Speaker 100 is Stephanie Groover. Speaker 101 will be Jim Galvin. Hi, Council. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Jim Galvan. I look white, but I'm Mexican, and I live in Ward 10, and my house was shot up in July. And, uh, you know, I'm against, you know, I'm against defunding the police. Um, you know, honestly, I think it's more of a conversation of abolishing the police. Um, my question is this, why can't we have both? Why are we forced to choose to defund the police and push resources into uh, more of a community action. Why can't we have community action and fund the police? Um, I, I, you know, I hear a lot of people on here asking for help, but it seems like we're talking past each other. And you know, if anybody, you know, sat in a meeting or video conference with uh, Chief Arando, I mean, he, he, the guy's, you know, he's got the experience. We just need the council to untie his hands and give him the resources. Uh, for him to do and make the changes that need to happen in our community. I mean, you know, it's a lot of people making statements here who really haven't stepped out and really see what's going on on the street. I mean, if you, you know, we're talking past each other. We really need to start holding our council, you know, accountable and not splitting us up. We should have both. We should have police funded and we should have the community funded as well. You know, I'm totally for mental health. I'm totally for please, homelessness. Please start to wrap you know, up. Help on that side. So, anyways, council, I, you know, I. Thank you. Speaker 102, Judy, Hannig Judy Hannigan. Then we'll have Doris Overby, Travis Joseph, Sarah Ann Dirks, and Maria Johnson. Speaker 102 is Judy Hannigan. Can 93 go if she's not here? Yes, Danny Gorman. Yes, Danny Gorman. Um, instead of increasing the police budget, we should increase the people's budget by doing things like with COVID-19, we need Mayor Fry to join mayors for a guaranteed income. It's currently a coalition of 11 mayors around the country advocating and implementing programs providing guaranteed cash payments directly to citizens to support themselves and their families through the pandemic. And we also need emergency food supplies, compensation for parents assisting with school-aged children with virtual learning. Um, we need housing shelter vouchers to assure we have no member of our community left on the streets after eviction due to lost wages. <laughs> we need jobs within the community uh, to assist the health department with aggressive contact tracing, prioritizing the hire of those who are unemployed due to COVID-19. Um, with education, we should fight to get our children back into school safely by supplying all the necessary PPE and daily testing for both staff and students. We need affordable health care for all. We need affordable housing for all. Um, we should fight to defeat homelessness in our city and assist residents who are looking to rent as well as implement programs to equip them to buy, creating more generational wealth within the community. As far as police reform, um, we should fight to abolish lethal force, not say abolish a police force altogether. We didn't need the police, but we should abolish lethal force. That's what people are scared of, as well as other force used by peace officers being excessive. If we implement new policies with mandatory body cameras for every peace officer representing the city of Minneapolis, while also creating additional jobs in the community to monitor those cameras. 
We need gang reduction crime prevention, and we should work in conjunction with Crime Stoppers to raise the monetary reward for homicide cases. Thank you. Speaker 102 is Judy Hannigan. Speaker 103 is Doris Overby. Yes, uh, this is Doris Overby. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. I'm Doris Overby. I'm sad and so sorry for all that has happened in the city that I love so much. I have lived in the Standish neighborhood for many years. We know each other by first name, including the names of the kids, dogs, and cats. I have not heard from one person in my community that supports decreasing the number of police officers. By approving the mayor's budget, you can make amends to the citizens and businesses of Minneapolis. Our quality of life is diminishing daily. We need more police officers to respond to violent crimes so that perpetrators are apprehended as soon as possible. Response times are being delayed, and that means that apprehending suspects drops exponentially. Please recognize the ne negative financial impact on our city. If people move away, if businesses move to the suburbs, if conventions are not coming, and if suburbanites avoid Minneapolis. I want to thank those council members, including my council member, Andrew Johnson, who have handled themselves in a respectful manner throughout this process and have treated Police Chief Rondo in a dignified and respectful way. And by doing so, have shown adults and children how our police chief and others should be treated. Thank you also to the majority of council members who recently approved Chief Rondo's financial request to aid in curbing the violence for the remainder of 2020. Start to wrap up. Be, be well and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 104, Travis Joseph. Speaker 105, Sarah Ann Dirks. Then we'll have Maria Johnson, Suzanne Herrick, Alina Anderson, and Wednesday Berman. Speaker 104, Travis Joseph. Speaker 105, Sarah Ann Dirks. One hundred six, Maria Johnson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. My name is Maria Johnson. I live in Ward 11 with my husband and a teenage daughter. We've lived in this home since 1996. The increase in crime statistics are real, but they don't need to be repeated. But I want to share how our lives have changed. We now live in fear of leaving our home as we've had neighbors assaulted, robbed, including armed robbery, in a carjacking chase on my street in the middle of the day. For those that feel safe, I am glad that you have not been harmed by crime. We have had to discuss a safety plan with our 14-year-old daughter in the event if we'd be carjacked or assaulted. Children should not be engaged in that type of discussion. Councilman Schrader, I support reform, but not at the expense of the safety of your constituents. We need to pass the mayor's budget not the proposal from the other council matter, me members. It is the better option at getting crime under control. I always hold criminals responsible for their activity. I hold the city council responsible for ensuring they are, there are adequate resources to protect my family. I urge you to pass the mayor's budget. Please listen to your vo voters. Be safe and be well, and thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker 107 is Suzanne Herrick. Good evening. Uh, thank you to all the people of Minneapolis for speaking up this evening. We all care very much for this city. Right now, we are experiencing what happens when city leadership fails and law enforcement staff is reduced. Violent crime has skyrocketed. This is a plea to the Minneapolis City Council for a fully funded Minneapolis Police Department and approval of the mayor's 2021 budget. Our police department is currently understaffed and it's currently downsized 
This is a snapshot of the future. We need police and we need more social services and support. I just want to provide one small example of what the city council did in March. Uh, they voted against applying for 1.3 million in federal grants to hire 10 new officers for traffic enforcement, such things as running traffic lights and no license plates. Violent crime is rampant and getting more brazen. It's not false, it, it's not a perception, it's real. Carjacking is a gunpoint, a mom pinned by a car in a parking lot, punched and robbed. In business, we have a practice of setting people up for success. How can we expect Chief Arredondo to do his job if we deny the department the necessary funds? How do we expect the city to thrive if violent crime is keeping its citizens in fear? Let's not make this city a national laughing stock. Please, let's not make this city a social experiment. Please let's set the city up. up for success. Let's set the city up for success and fully fund the Minneapolis Police Department approving the mayor's budget. Safety is a... Thank you. Speaker 108, Elena Anderson. One hundred eight is Elena Anderson. Then we'll have Wednesday Berman, Janae Carvalho, Nadia Hacker O'Brien, and Paul Wischer. So one hundred eight is Elena Anderson. One hundred nine Wednesday Berman. One hundred ten Janae Carvalho. One hundred eleven, Nadia Hecker O'Brien. One hundred eleven, Nadia Hecker O'Brien. Hello. Hello, welcome. Hi, my name is Nadia. I am a, I live in Ward 3. I work as a housing specialist serving the South Metro. I'm here as a renter, as someone who works in homelessness prevention, and as a Minneapolis resident who watches the majority of this council committed to defunding the police and transforming how safety looks in this city. I'm asking the council to support the people's budget. We have had a crisis of houselessness even before the pandemic. We need to invest in deeply affordable housing for all humans in our city. We need to invest in harm reduction and mental health services. I know it's hard to imagine, for many to imagine a world without police, which is perhaps why an earlier commenter referred to us young people as too inexperienced to share our vision. But the reality is we will not experience widespread safety for everyone until we have Health and safety are never achieved through police, as we have seen in the MPD's over 150 year history, but through meeting people's basic needs, we can achieve safety. Our city is unsafe because we aren't giving folks the tool of survival, and instead we are propping up already rich developers, gentrifying low-income neighborhoods, and supporting a violent and racist police force that have murdered, injured, and harassed so many residents of this city. The fact that a single person, let alone thousands, live outside in Minneapolis is a total failure. Our budget needs to center the people. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 112 is Paul Wisher. Hi, my name is Paul Wixer, and I live a few blocks from the 2nd Precinct in Northeast Minneapolis. I'm a teacher and parent, and I'm speaking tonight in support of the People's Budget and points one and two in the Safety for All plan. The People's Budget acknowledges it begins to address the environmental and systemic factors operating in the testimonies you've heard regarding an uptick in crime, like our housing crisis, global pandemic, unsafe working conditions. But providing more money to the MPD, a department that cannot and will not address these underlying factors, will not provide the safety that many other white folks are requesting in these meetings. The proposed plan from the mayor is a shallow restructuring of ineffective reforms requiring an increase in overtime for the MPD. As a teacher, I see the toll over work and stress take on my colleagues, and I can easily say that it should not be a goal when we have other choices like the people's budget. We need to stop demanding unreasonable work from the police that they simply shouldn't do. This is our shortest path to supporting the officer's health, wellness, and respect that they've been asking for. We invested in a very expensive hammer, so we want everything to be a nail. But it's unreasonable to expect a hammer to deal well with screws or staples or glue, and we need glue to bond our community together. So let's stop investing in hammers. Thank you. 
Thank you. Speaker 113 is Heather Sildsby. Then we'll have Abby Kestrel, Nicholas Richman, Susan Herridge, and Skyla Theo. 113 is Heather Sildsby. Hi, my name is Heather Sildsby, and I'm a resident of Ward 13. I'm here to express my disappointment in Mayor Fry's proposed budget and to support the alternate people's budget proposal. Points one and two of the safety for all proposal are a small step in the right direction, but would not have prevented the death of George Floyd. A few weeks ago, the council approved giving the MPD $500,000 on top of their $183 million budget to bring even more offices, officers into our neighborhoods. When Chief Arredondo was asked by the council how this extra money would have reduced violence in our city, he didn't have a plan. It is completely irresponsible to keep spending taxpayer money on an effort that the police chief himself admits has not keep, kept our city safe. My family is affected by mental illness and my loved ones have experienced homelessness, unemployment, and compounded trauma due to a lack of accessible social services. I also worked for several years at a nonprofit addiction treatment organization where I saw the incredible financial, social, and legal barriers that often lead our addicted residents to jail instead of quality treatment services. As we saw recently with the story of Daniel Prude in New York, police tend to make these situations much worse, not better. I want my taxpayer money to be spent on mental health mobile, mobile crisis teams, addiction harm reduction, and free housing services, which all have been proven to make communities safer and healthier. Please fund all of the services outlined in the people's budget and not policing. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 114 is Abby Kestrel. One fifteen is Nicholas Rickman. Hi, this is oh. Abby Castro. Hi, Abby. Go ahead. Hi, I live in Ward Nine, and I'm calling in strong support of the people's budget and ask that the council adopt it as a first step in the right direction. It's really offensive that we have to repeatedly ask you, as our elected representatives, for basic accountability when that should really be your main focus as public servants. A veto-proof majority of you pledged to defund and dismantle the violent, unaccountable Minneapolis Police Department, and instead of following through, you weaponized a charter amendment you knew would never make it past the Charter Commission as a distraction from your real opportunity and responsibility to cut MPD's funding this summer. I want to remind every person calling for this bloated police budget to continue draining resources from actual public safety measure, measures or who claim that we can have both, that police do not prevent crime. Police respond to crime after the fact. Unless, of course, you're in areas of the city where they've deliberately chosen to slow down response times or stop responding altogether without cuts having been made. MPD is a protection racket and it's foolish to give them our money. Supporting a bloated police budget because it gives you the illusion of safety directly compromises the safety of every person in Minneapolis who isn't white, able bodied, cis, and housed. And you need to figure out a way to build public safety with those of us who please do not keep safe. So, City Council, stop siding with racists already. Thank you. Speaker 115, Nicholas Rickman. One sixteen is Susan Herridge. I'm here, Susan Herridge. Can you hear me, Madam Speaker? Yes, go or, ahead, Madam Chair. Uh, I have been sitting here listening. This has been a really interesting evening, listening to very, very divergent points of view, and I honestly do not envy the job of the council members that have to somehow thread this needle. I live in Ward 8 in the Lindale neighborhood. I recently moved there. I've been a resident of Minneapolis for more than 50 years. And I am speaking firmly in support of the Safety for All budget plan amendment. It seems to me, listening to these completely divergent points of view, that it's a sensible, um, almost, I don't mean to insult it, but incremental plan that it addresses many of the issues that have been brought up. And it seems to me it's a win-win because if you have trained mental health providers taking mental health emergency calls, then that frees up the police to handle more violent crime. And if you, have, if you invest in alternative responses for theft and property damage reports, then it frees up the police to handle more violent crime. And I'm not sure, I, and I guess I do agree with the folks that have been saying it's the bare minimum. It seems to me that it's a... a blindingly obvious direction to go into since especially uh, the mental health arena experts have been calling for this for years. 
It takes less than five percent, five percent of the budget. And rather than, I'm calling on the chief and the mayor to knock off the dueling press conferences and the prime lister, you know. Thank you. I'm going to turn the chair over to Council Vice President Jenkins for just a few minutes. The next speaker is Skylat Thiel 117. Hello, Skyla. Can you press um, star six to unmute? Hi, I'm calling because I support the people's budget. The first two parts of the safety for all proposal are the least that you could do, honestly, and it's completely irresponsible to continue the funding for a police department who prey on BIPOC communities only to fulfill their sadistic status quo. If the council had bothered to consistently show up and listen to the families of these victims, you would hear the same disgusting stories that show that MPD is nothing more than state-sponsored violence. On I-94, they kettled protesters, maced bystanders, tried blinding the media from filming, attempted trampling people with their horses, broke a bystander's nose with their bike, threatened to kill a woman while laughing about it, and openly admitted to slowing response times in North Minneapolis in spite of the criticism they, that they're currently receiving. This is what funding to the police goes to, not to community safety. To even consider giving them more money after the level of abuse and suppression is disgraceful. Now is the time to set a precedent that we will not tolerate police violence or institutional racism. And council member, stop tone policing people in this meeting. Criticism is hard, but you all deserve it. People will respect you when you respect them. Listen to BIPOC voices. Thank you. The next speaker is Anders. Nielsen. Hi, my name is Anders Nielsen and I live in the ninth ward. I strongly support the people's budget and I ask the council adopt it and follow through with their promise to fully dismantle the police. I'm a white queer person who works in healthcare as a nurse. Time and time again, I have witnessed that when police respond, they escalate conflict to, viol conflict to violence, traumatize and criminalize those involved and can very quickly and effectively destroy people's lives. I consistently witness police be more violent towards black, brown, and indigenous patients. On a personal note, when I was nine years old, I called 911 because I thought that the police would come and save me, my sister, and my mom from my physically abusive father. My sister was being beaten when the police showed up, and she had visible marks on her arms and body where she'd been grabbed and hit. My dad told the officer that my sister, who was 12, had started it. The officer told my mom that if she pressed charges that my sister might be prosecuted for assault. This was the first and last time my mom ever tried to get help. I wish that a social worker or a mental health worker had responded to our call. I don't want the police to keep me safe. I want you to keep me, my community, and my patients safe from police. I am sick of witnessing police do their jobs. I believe that law enforcement has no place in the future of our community. The people's budget shows us concretely how to divest from police and how to invest in healthcare, housing, violent prevent, violence prevention, and restorative justice. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to Council Vice President. I believe we're on, which, which speaker are we on? 118? I'm sorry, 119. That was, we just heard from speaker number 118. Perfect. 119 is Joseph Banks. Speaker 120 is James Barry. Then we'll have Hannah Lagoon, Maria Wardugo, and Paudine Austinson. 120 is James Barry. I'm calling in support of the mayor's budget and of Chief Arredondo. I'm in favor of giving him the time and the resources he needs to clean up the department. And we're also fairly lucky that uh, uh, the coronavirus hasn't struck the police department yet, or at least not in significant numbers. We need more cops. As far as, and we also need to do this both ways. As far as uh, the social programs go, if you need 8 million bucks, there are plenty of feel good programs you can, you can borrow from. Uh, my personal favorite would be the bike lane project. Remember this, if the streets aren't safe for everyone, they are safe for no one. 
Thank you. Speaker 121, Hannah Lagoon. One hundred twenty two, Maria Wardoko. Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Maria Wardoku, and I live in the Longfellow area. I urge you to significantly reduce funding for the police and fully fund non police 911 mental health response as well as the other strategies that are included in the safety for all budget plan and the people's budget. Let me tell you a quick story. A year ago, I was walking with a friend to her home at night and a man followed us. He stood outside staring through the window and wouldn't leave when asked. He appeared to be having a hard night. It was late and I wanted to bike home, but I was scared to go outside. We needed help, but we didn't trust the police to appropriately handle the situation. I worried the police would escalate things and didn't want the man to be arrested, shot, deported, or any of the other things that sometimes result from calling the police. I just wanted him to get the help that he needed, whether that was mental health support, housing, or substance abuse treatment. And I wanted to be able to go home without being followed. I tried calling the Hennepin County Mental Health Hotline, but they told us they couldn't help and to call the police. There was no one else to call and I felt helpless and frustrated. We desperately need to fund safety strategies that don't involve the police. Please support the Safety for All budget plan, the people's budget, and go even further to robustly fund mental health crisis response. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 123, Pauline Austinson. One twenty four, Emily Clash. One twenty five is Joe Sell. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, is this, this Emily? Is Emily Clash. Go ahead. Hello. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Emily Clash. I live in Ward Two. I'm a renter and a union member with AFSCME thirty nine thirty seven, and I support the People's Budget and Parts One and Two of the safety for all budget as a bare minimum. Uh, I can't call 911 in good faith right now unless there's a medical emergency because MPD is so violent. Uh, and that's not public safety. I'm not, I'm not sure how many of you were outside third precinct when cops were standing on top of it, aiming weapons into the crowd and smiling, but that's the essence of MPD. They protect each other, the powerful and property. They don't protect us. More than 120 officers have left MPD this year of their own accord. This is a rats getting off the sinking ship situation. I don't think the responsible move here is to put more money on that ship. It's desperately needed elsewhere. The people's budget is full of thoughtful ideas about where public funds need to go to create real public safety. It has a clear vision of why crime happens and a collection of evidence-based strategies like funding harm reduction groups and culturally specific mental health programs. In contrast, where is the explanation from Chief Arredondo for why a thousand officers will result in a safe Minneapolis? How will more recruits, probably hired from the suburbs, result in Minneapolis residents getting what they need? One common thread tonight is that people are upset about assault. However, only some of these assaults are paid for by us, Minneapolis residents. These are Please the assaults on community members committed by Minneapolis Police Department. Council members, you have the purse strings. I would be really excited to see you use them. Thanks so much. Thank you. Speaker 125, Joe Sell. Hello. Hello, welcome. Yes, hi, I, my name is Joe. I am a resident of Central Neighborhood since 1999. Um, I'm of the opinion that uh, consensus is very hard to come by um, and that it's, we, we, we do need to uh, fund the police in order to handle the violent crime that is um, increasingly um, on the rise. Um, but we, at the same time, we also need to have some funding for mental health crisis uh, crisis calls. Um, so there, there needs to be some kind of middle ground, but at the 
this point, I would ask that you um, support the mayor's uh, budget for 2021. And then finally, um, if we are concerned about uh, funding and, and, and uh, locating funds and um, monies for the pro programs that we need, um, I would suggest that we look no further than the uh, exorbitant salaries of the current city council. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 126, Daisy Martinez. Then we'll have Rita Lewinsky, Nellie Rivers, Namisha Najalia, and Jen Strawberry. 126 is Daisy Martinez. Hello, my name, my name is Daisy Martinez. And I am a Mexican American pastor on the north side. Last night, my husband and I witnessed a young man shot up our neighbor's house with an assault weapon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I thought was muted. Yeah, my name is Daisy Martinez, and I'm a Mexican American pastor on the north side. Last night, my husband witnessed a young man shoot up our neighbor's house with an AR assault style weapon. Uh, she was a disabled elder grandma that is trying to raise three grandchildren. Now we're trying to find emergency houses for her and her family. My husband has been a block captain in North Minneapolis for eight years when we moved here. We have many problems residents which we have tried to work with, but shooting, drug selling, and street fights were normal things. We banded together as a block and call out those homes that were a danger to all of us. We used the police to curb and deter their behavior. After eight years, we are now a healthy relationship with all our residents. We have a family member that is a police officer. The majority of, the are, of them are good people and we need to fully resource the police department to continue working with block clubs. We have just told that we are losing our community crime specialists due to toxic environment to the city council, which has put in there. Thank you. Speaker 127 is Rita Lewinsky. And I do want Welcome. I want to speak in support of the Minneapolis Police Department. I've lived here all of my life and I have witnessed a lot of police brutality, but I don't believe that right now is the time to defund the police and dismantle them. We do need to hold them accountable, very accountable and changes need to be made. And I also believe that we need to support our social services and our mental health communities. And we need to take money away from the ridiculous programs that we have that aren't doing anything for, but just for a few people like the bike lanes. That's just ridiculous how much money has been spent on that. So let's not dismantle our police. Let's support the mayor's budget and support the citizens in our community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 128, Nellie Rivers, then Namisha Najalia, Jen Strawberry, Susan Field, and Carrie Hen Heinrich. 128 is Nellie Rivers. One twenty nine is Namisha Najalia. One thirty is Jen Strawberry. One thirty one is Susan Field. Hello. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Susan Field. I live in Ward 3. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Councilman Bender, your megaphone pledge to defund our police department degraded the quality of life for a whole community. Those words emboldened criminals and terrorized residents. The defund pledge was loud and clear. Criminals are welcome here. 
If you build it, they will come, Lisa, and come they have. We now have a double-digit rise in violent crime across the city. How's it working for you? Let me put it very simply to those of you who can't seem to connect the dots. What better place to hang out as a criminal than in a city that doesn't respect police? Fletcher, Cunningham, and Ellison, you continue the rhetoric that perpetrates a culture of disrespect. With over 100 officers fleeing the force, you invited this lawlessness to our streets. So much work that others have done before you to make Minneapolis a vibrant, walkable city is gone on your watch because of your inability to check your egos. Your plan is flawed. Minneapolis will always need police, now more than ever before. With no experience in law enforcement, please get your hands off the already reduced police budget. Don't hold our safety hostage to achieve community program goals. We don't want social workers or mental health counselors responding to carjackings or break-ins. Look elsewhere in the city budget for your funding. The chief and mayor are already working together on actual reform that's needed. Retraining ability is needed. They're working together. Approve the mayor's budget in full. Thank you. Thank you. We do have one speaker, 128 on the line, Nella Rivers. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hi, it's Nella Rivers. Can I speak? Yes, welcome. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I support the people's budget to invest in our communities. City Council has not done anything in regards to defunding the police, so this is not a reflection of what a defunded police looks like. This is a fully functioning police force. Having more police has not resulted in prevention of crime. As a result of the pandemic, we have residents that are unhoused, unemployed, without access to the care they need. If we do not address these issues, the amount of police won't matter. To that, I will say at the very least, I support parts one and two of the safety for all by Lisa Bender, Philip Cunningham, and Steve Fletcher. It's a great first step, but the people's budget is a long-term solution. This is predominantly affecting BIPOC folks, and so our voices should be centered in this conversation. Um, the previous caller that had... We can still hear you. Are you there? Yes, um, I just support the people's budget, that's all. Thank you. I know there was some noise in the background. Thanks for your testimony. This will bring us to speaker 132, Carrie Heinrich. After Carrie, we have Amity Dimmick, Daniel Corby, Melissa, Andre Hare, and Amanda Leathers. Speaker 132 is Carrie Heinrich. Thank you. My son was one of 50 kids at Jordan Park that had to lay face down in an open field to take cover from gunfire. He was 12 years old on that day, June 22nd. Kids ages 5 to 14 were just trying to have football practice with their team, the Minnesota Jays. The video I recorded on Facebook for two, for two hours after had close to 2 million views. People from across the world, from England to Australia, reached out, but you, the council, and the mayor were silent. At the time of our shooting, there were two other shootings occurring with eight people shot. There were no resources to respond to us. Myself and the coaches had to evacuate the kids. I believe to this day, had there been a police presence, it would have deterred this and my child would not have suffered this trauma. Where were you, city council, mayor, and governor? Where was your outrage? I emailed you. It was on every news outlet. You didn't even acknowledge this occurred. I'm now going to read a message to you my son wanted you to hear. When the gunfire started, coaches were ducking, telling kids to get down and blocking them. I'm still amazed that all 50 of us got out without getting hit. Coaches and parents had to get vans to get us out. Fifteen of us piled into one van with all our gear on. In the van, little kids were crying and were confused. We were all huddled together and praying everyone got out okay. I've had nightmares since off and on. I don't want to talk about them. I want the city council and the mayor to recognize the coaches who protected us that day. I think they need to know what's going on and fix it now. The city council and mayor should listen to other kids on my team and their stories. I have an idea that there should be more police around where kids are playing and just trying to have fun. Safety and security is a basic human right. In closing, Please try to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 133 is Amity Dimmick. One thirty four is Danielle Corby. One thirty five is Melissa Andre Hare. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes, please go ahead. We do have a phone that's not muted, which is making quite a lot of computer noises. Um, I'm going to ask the tech team if they're able to mute that phone, but would ask speakers who aren't speaking to mute. Um, so we had a speaker ready to go ahead. Please say your name and, and you can start your testimony. My name is Daniel Corby, and I want to urge you to prioritize Black, Brown, and Indigenous voices and approve the people's budget. I stand with these communities because they deserve justice. MPD has terrorized communities of color since its inception and has taken many innocent lives, including George Floyd and Jamar Clark. What I've heard from so many members of these communities is that police do not create safety for them. They create fear and danger. I have heard white residents tonight focusing on danger in their neighborhoods this year, while BIPOC residents have feared for their lives and their children's lives for as long as MPD has been around. We have seen that reforms do not work. What we need is to develop a community policing model and increase funding to affordable housing, youth programs, mental health services, addiction services, and violence prevention, which are incredibly underfunded. These are human rights, and studies show that they <clears throat> that these are proven ways to create healthier, safer communities for everyone, not just white residents. The majority of you promised to defund the police in Powderhorn Park, yet practically a third of the budget is still proposed to go to MPD, and this is unacceptable. We need you to follow through on your promise. Start to wrap up. <clears throat> um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker 135, Melissa Andrew Hare. Then we'll have Amanda Leathers, Shannon McCormick, Jesse Mortensen, and Hi. DA Bullock. Welcome. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Melissa Andrew Hare. I am a homeowner and parent in the Longfellow neighborhood in Ward 2. In June, most of you stood in Powderhorn Park and committed to deep and lasting change, to real safety. And I am here to say now is the time to demonstrate that commitment. Envision what community safety can look like when it is centered on people instead of police. It's been researched and proven that anti-poverty policies and programs reduce crime. Safety comes through stability of housing, healthcare, education, environmental justice, worker protection, and equitable access. We have one of the worst racial equity gaps in our country, and these are the long-term crime prevention strategies we need. This budget is in your hands. Now is the time to redirect report-only calls to 311. Now is the time to fully implement 24-7 independent mental health teams, like over 75 small businesses are demanding. Now is the time to take police out of homelessness, substance use, and mental health concerns. Now is the time to put real money into tried and true programs that prevent violence, like street outreach and harm reduction, and respond to violence with restorative justice. And these initiatives need permanent, sustainable funding. Please start to rebuild up. our city and make it safe for everyone. Now is the time. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 136, Amanda Leathers. One thirty seven will be Shannon McCormick. One thirty eight is Jesse Mortensen. Folks will need to push star six to unmute. One thirty nine is DA Bullock. Welcome, go ahead. I support the um, safety for all amendment, and particularly where it intersects with the people's budget. And I want to talk a little bit like, frankly, I don't understand how the whole council wouldn't be for something that supports mental health uh, response that alleviates stress on the 911 system and then reduces over time and, and maintain 770 sworn offices in this first year. Like, um, so I, I think we're giving into a lot of underlying assumptions that fuel a lot of this panic. And I want to speak to that because the underlying assumptions are that um, a full staff of MPD represents uh, public safety for all, which is 
which is a lie, frankly. If you look at 2019, um, where we had a full staffing of, of officers and a full complement of, of 180 something odd million dollars, we still had 48 homicides in this city. And because they were relegated to North Minneapolis and relegated to uh, young black bodies, then nobody, there wasn't 400 people in line in the queue to talk about incompetent public safety. And we're only having this crisis and emergency conversation because people who assume that they should never feel that, that fear and that incompetence in public safety, um, they assume that they shouldn't. Thank you. Speaker 140 is Paul Kirk Davidoff. Then we'll have Grady Johnson, Liz Niemer, and Angela Tona. Speaker 140 is Paul. Paul. Oh, yes, yeah, so and maybe we missed Sorry, someone. Go ahead. Uh, this, this is Shannon McCormick, Speaker 137. Is it okay yeah. if I go now? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Shannon McCormick. I've worked in affordable housing for many years, and I've never had this many tenants give their notice to move out because they don't feel safe in their homes. These are, units are very exclusive. They're difficult to get. The wait lists are very long. So what does it say when these people are willing to give up these apartments and their affordability to live elsewhere just to feel safe? Police do prevent crime. The data proves it. How many robberies or carjackings have happened in the presence of an officer? None, because if a cop's standing on the corner, they're not gonna commit that crime. The other thing I wanted to bring up is, I don't know if you understand how hurtful it is for a crime victim to hear you talk about rewarding criminals with social services and outreach. Where's the outreach for the real victims? Where's the consequences for the criminals and why are we coddling them? This is not about race. This is about holding criminals accountable, not pandering to them. How can we criticize police when our own behavior is be deplorable? If we hold our own people accountable for their behaviors, we wouldn't need as many cops on the streets. These are not crimes of necessity. These are crimes of, these are crimes of opportunity. These are not once law-abiding citizens that lost their jobs and are now out carjacking and robbing people. These are, criminals, these are criminals that are taking advantage of the current situation. They know that we're short police and it's a free-for-all right now. I am asking. Thank you. Speaker 140, Paul or David. Hey, 138. Oh, welcome. Jesse Mortensen, welcome. Yes, I have it okay if I go. Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm Jesse Mortensen. I live in Ward 9. Uh, we're pretty close to the ground zero of the uprising this summer. And I'm calling to support the uh, people's budget and the safety for all plan. Um, I, I want to just remind folks, um, it was hard to hear an hour of people talk uh, without mentioning George Floyd. The two reasons why we're at this place. One reason is the pandemic, obviously, which has put us in an unprecedented economic and social position. And also the fact that Derek Chauvin and three other officers murdered George, George Floyd in the street. And so if, if the uprising has taught us anything, I think it should show us that safety and justice are interdependent. They're not, we're not uh, justice is not something we can put number two. Uh, the victims of violence matter and we gotta take that seriously. George Floyd was a victim of violence. And so that's why something's got to change. Uh, and I think the safety for all budget is, is like others have said, the bare minimum we need to do to do serious change. And I think uh, I want to point out that other cities are doing this. There's a handful of cities that are already are working on this, have programs on the ground or planned for the short term. This is not an experiment. This is experiments have been done. And so these kind of changes are backed up by the data. It's actually a very safe and very mainstream proposal. Um, so the idea that folks are floating you know, the safety for all budget is some kind of radical affront is, is just not supported by Please the context around the country. Please Thank don't you Thank you. I'll go back and check to see if we have Speaker 129, Namisha Najalia, 130, Jen Strawberry, 133, Amity Dimmick, or 136, Amanda Leathers. OK. 
okay. I don't want folks waiting around so we can always pick people back up if we've missed anyone. 140 is Paul Kirk Davidoff. One forty one Grady Johnson. One forty two Liz Niemer. Then we'll have Angela Tona, Ryan Bra Brady, Brand Ryan Brandy, and one forty five William Theriac. One forty one is Hi, this is caller. Sorry, this is caller one forty two Liz Niemer. Hi, go ahead. Hi, I live in Longfellow, um, three blocks away from the former third precinct. Um, it's late. I'm sure you're tired. I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm tired as well. I'm tired of fighting for a semblance of justice. We are waiting for reform that will not happen in the Minneapolis Police Department. American policing is founded on racist principles and it is succeeding at its mission. People are ready to stand up for our rights and I support them. We need to decrease funding for a failed law enforcement and fund housing, health care, and safety for all. I support the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. 143 is Angela Tona. 144, Ryan Bandy. 145, William Theriac. Hello. Hi, welcome. My name is William Theriac and I live in Ward 7. I support the people's budget and parts one and two of Safety for All. I work as a project manager and my job focuses on cutting costs and removing anything that fails to perform adequately. The MPD has failed, is failing, and will fail. Don't waste money on a tried and broken strategy. Instead, let's reinvest our money in community based solutions that do not kill or maim our people. I yield my remaining time. Thank you. Speaker 146, Timothy Bonham. This is Tim Bonham. Welcome, I'm, go ahead. Uh, pardon? We can this hear you, go Tim, ahead. This is Tim Bonham. I live in the Erickson neighborhood in Ward 12. I bought my house about 42 years ago here, um, and 22 of those past years, I served as treasurer of the Minneapolis DFL party. So I've door knocked and lit dropped with most of you and with your predecessors all over the city. And uh, I was never worried about any of the neighborhoods of the city at that time, but now, I'm feeling not safe. I'm not even safe in my own neighborhood. There's been a carjacking the day before yesterday, uh, about four blocks from me. And it's just not safe here. Their people are locked in their house, not just because of the pandemic, but because of the, they're not feeling safe to go outside. So I support the mayor's budget and I hope you will too. The, that already cuts 14 million from our police funding and cutting 8 million more is just ridiculous. The, uh, we need Please more safe, safety and not, not less. We need the public safety that we're paying taxes for. You, the council can find uh, cuts elsewhere in the other 88% of the budget. It doesn't go to police. So I encourage you to fund the money for the mayor's budget for police. Thank you. Speaker 147, Max Friedman. 147. Speaker, well, <clears throat> excuse hello, me. Um, oh, go um, ahead. Hello, oh, sorry. Oh, um, this is Angela Tona. I think I was a little before. I was wondering if I could go now if the speaker wasn't here. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. Excuse me. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Angela Tona. Um, I live in Ward 9. Um, I received my master's in public policy and also my master's degree in social work from the University of Minnesota. Um, currently, I work for Outfront Minnesota. 
an LGBTQ advocacy organization um, here in Minneapolis. Um, and I just wanted to echo what everybody said tonight um, in support of the people's budget. Um, and I just wanted to also echo the traumatic experiences that LGBTQ people experience from the police um, in particular, and um, in particular seeking um, or um, get, getting zero justice um, from the police department um, regularly and also um, uh, finding um, no justice um, when uh, when sexual violence crimes um, come about and things in that nature. So I just wanted to very quickly um, echo uh, what everybody said tonight and just add that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have speaker 141 Grady Johnson or 144 Ryan Bandy? 147, Max Freeman, Friedman. We'll then move to 148, Amity Foster, followed by Samantha Sensor Mura, William McMahon, and Cynthia Gomez. So 148 is Amity Foster. One forty nine is Samantha Sensor Mura. This is 148. This is Amity. Welcome. Go ahead. OK. My name is Amity Foster. I live in Ward 3, and I'm a member of Isaiah. I am in support of Parts 1 and 2 of the Safety for All plan. We need a model of safety that recognizes the humanity in everyone and seeks to prevent the root causes of crime, not one that simply removes people from society. I am frustrated that the conversation about public safety in our city is turning in, into an individual one. What are you doing to keep me safe instead of one focused on the safety of everyone in Minneapolis, including people who have long been left out? My safety is absolutely tied to the safety of my neighbors, but as Ariana said earlier, mine can't come at the expense of her life, and right now that's the system we have. When people who are in a mental health crisis are responded to by trained professionals instead of armed officers, we will all be safer. When the response is right-sized, we are safer, and currently we're in a one-size-fits-all model, and it's clearly not working. The Safety for All budget is a very small step to the right system. I urge the mayor to support these proposed changes and look forward to the council passing this change. We have a long way to go to transforming public safety in our city so that everybody can be safe, but this Please is a good first up. step. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, so I'll just run through again. Speaker 144, Ryan Bandy, 147, Max Friedman, 149 is Samantha Sensor Mora. One fifty is William McMahon. Uh, if I could jump in, I, I missed my turn earlier. Sure, go ahead. Number one seventeen. Perfect. Number one seventeen, Susie Lovestrand from Ward Eight, and I'll just I'll be brief. I just want to su support the reduced funding for police in order to fund other priorities, especially housing right now. Um, Crime is increasing in my neighborhood too, and it's scary and I'm sad, but I don't understand how throwing more police at it is really gonna work. It's just like bringing extra buckets on your boat trip instead of plugging the hole in the bottom of your boat. Because as long as people don't have the dignity and safety of a home, crime is only going to increase. So please prioritize housing, approve a budget that values all of us and protects us all from police violence. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. 149, Samantha Sensor Mora. 150, William Mc... Hi, this is Samantha Sensor Mora. Hi, Samantha. Welcome. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Samantha Sensor Mora, and I was born and raised in Minneapolis, and I have lived here most of my life. I'm currently a resident in Ward 9, Alondra Connell's Ward. I'm also the executive director of a youth organization, Ward 6, Jamal Osmond's Ward. I'm calling because I support the people's budget and I believe points one and two of the safety for all budget is a bare minimum for a city that is facing the dual pandemic of COVID-19 and systemic racism. I believe that we are all safe when all residents in our city have our needs met. We have never experienced that. 
Instead, Minneapolis is a deeply unequal city that prides itself on a quality of life that is built on racist housing policies enacted on stolen land. The police have played their role in the system of white supremacy by keeping some people safe at the expense of others' lives. The true ugliness of the system was exposed on May 25th when Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. I do not believe that we should continue funding the police force at the level we have been. As a mixed race Asian and white woman, I do not feel the direct threat to my life from police that many black, indigenous, and people of color experience on a daily basis. Nevertheless, I have never had experiences where police are helpful or kept me or my community safe. In my experience, police have not helped prevent sexual assault, domestic violence, or mental health crises. And when they have come to intervene in those situations, they have not helped de-escalate the situation or help to solve the crime. Please start Finally, up. I wish that we as a city would spend more time talking about how we are going to support our unhoused neighbors this winter, as opposed to having the conversation hijacked by the. Thank you. Speaker 150, William McMahon. Hi, I'm 147. I, I got yeah, skipped hey, over Max. earlier. Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. Thank you. My name is Max Friedman. I live in Ward 9, a few blocks away from the former 3rd Precinct. I think it's absolutely asinine that this is even a conversation. Defunding the police and putting the money into social services is frankly common sense. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. What's not common sense is to continually fund a public safety apparatus that has failed time and time again. If we don't start actually addressing the roots of crime, which are poverty, homelessness, and hunger, and continue to only invest in a violent occupying force that doesn't even prevent crime while fully funded, if we keep using the same broken strategies, we will get the same results. Dead citizens and a city righteously burned to the ground. The MPD have proven time and time again that they cannot be dealt with in good faith. They have proven time and time again that they are willing to hold the city hostage. They have proven time and time again that they hate the people of Minneapolis. I recently read an opinion in the rag that is the Star Tribune describing an admittedly terrifying experience where a woman was robbed by some teens in a grocery store parking lot. And I am so sorry about the violence she experienced, but these children were stealing food. Food because they were hungry. Is the best solution arresting these children or feeding them? This is common sense. Do not let yourselves be ruled by fear, city council members. Lead with courage and make history. You've already lost the so-called law and order vote, so have some conviction, have Thank you. <clears throat> Speaker 150 is William McMahon. 151, Cynthia Gomez. One fifty two, Brock Asati. Ashate. Yep. Hello. Uh, my name is Dr. Brooke Ashate. <clears throat> excuse me. And I have been a home and small business owner in Ward 9 for over 16 years, where it has been peaceful and quiet all these years. As an Ethiopian American healthcare professional, I had never felt unsafe in my neighborhood. Since the unjust murder of George Floyd and the emotional outcry to defund the police, things have taken a negative turn. When the weather is warmer, I am hearing multiple gunshots frequently. A neighbor friend had her car stolen from her driveway recently. The car was located after several days. Each community is understaffed with one or two dispatchers working 18-hour days. I have witnessed suspicious unlicensed vehicles driving through my alley, doing some sort of scoping out of houses, including my own. These criminals clearly need help, and we, the tax-paying law-abiding citizens, have the right to be protected by decent cops. The bad cops should not be the ones to rewrite the reputation of the decent ones, just like bin Laden doesn't represent peace-loving Muslims. While police reform is desperately needed, getting rid of cops in our communities gives these criminals the green light to get busier. By cutting the budget so radically, we are impacted negatively. There are balanced ways to resolve this. Yes, there have been unjust events taking place in the hands of the police, but what is the plan for police accountability? Getting rid of them makes no sense. We need more ethical and sensible cops in our communities, not less. A middle of the road solution in a democracy is more pr practical. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello. Hi, welcome. You can go ahead and state your name and, and your testimony. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Hello? Can you state your... Okay, I'm so sorry. Okay. No um, problem. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that Ben Laden you... is actually a representative of Al Qaeda. So um, I live in Powderhorn and work Could in Could you tell us your name? Uh, Cynthia Gomez, sorry, Great. number 151. Thanks. Perfect, thank um, you. A young, okay. A young man I know was recently shot dead near the family dollar on 18th and Nicollet. He was lovely, a recent graduate, an artist living on his own, the pride and joy of many, of his mother. My fellow citizens, I want you to take a drive. Pull into that parking lot of the family dollar. See the day and night trafficking, the numerous obviously armed people, and ask yourself really whether getting out of your car would be worth your while. No one has taken a penny from MPD. We're supposed to believe that the magic word defund accounts for the disappearance of police off our streets, that their disappearance is the fault of us who call for their accountability. Their lack of care and even hostility towards our communities explains the Vanishing Act. It's institutional, however good a man the chief is, it's systematic for over a century. The American Indian Movement began in Minneapolis in 1968 as a direct response to atrocities committed by the Minneapolis Police Department. Why on earth would we simply continue with the status quo? No, um, we are collectively imagining what safety for everybody can look like. Mayor Fry, it is irresponsible to continue down this deadly path. The Minneapolis Police Department will not reform itself. The police have permanently lost their legitimacy you can get city council you can get with history or you can be obstructionist it's really your choice thank you speaker 153 meg reed then we'll have jim handrigan andrea phone and chuck turchik 153 is meg reed One fifty four, Jim Handrigan. One fifty five, Andrea Thone. One fifty five, Andrea Thone. We may be able to go back and catch folks who are missing. I'm going to keep us moving. One fifty six is Chuck Turchik. Hi, uh, I am one num number one fifty five. Sorry, I hear two people talking. Let's take Mr. Turchik and then we'll go back to who we missed. Hi, Chuck Turchik, Ward 6, 74 year city resident. Maybe I'm too cynical, but when was the last time any of you heard something in a public hearing and then changed your mind on an issue? Most of you right now are probably reading some document on your computer or your phone, not really listening. Maybe I'm too cynical, but nine of you on June 7th at an event that probably violated the open meeting law called for a police-free city. I've heard a red lane qualifier since then, but none of you has disavowed that statement. Maybe I'm too cynical, but when you proclaim transparency, while you proclaim transparency, you operate in secret. That June 7th statement and your June 12th public safety resolution were negotiated in secret. You never sought public input. Oh, you met with select groups in the community who you knew agreed with your position. That's not being woke, that's being opportunistic. You have never publicly discussed the specific lessons learned from past tragedies involving the MPD. That's only been done in secret in closed sessions, resulting in massive settlement agreements. Who is on the mayor's three public safety task forces? Secret. What's being discussed? Secret. When Dick Cheney did that with oil companies, you Democrats screamed bloody murder. Even your PCOC appointments process has followed a similar pattern of decreasing transparency and increasing secrecy. The norm now is secrecy, not transparency. Maybe I'm too cynical, or maybe I'm not cynical enough. Two final comments, don't be fooled. There's not one BIPOC voice, there are many, and they differ, and second, the American Thank you. I know Mr. Turchik uh, knows where to find us by email. Uh, let's go back to the speaker we missed. Hi.
You may have muted yourself back. Hello, um, I, my name is Nathan Roberts and I'm a Ward 9 homeowner. Um, okay, I'm go a, ahead. Yeah, my name is Nathan Roberts and I'm a Ward 9 homeowner. I'm a pastor with Isaiah. Uh, I've worked as a Minneapolis public educator and my wife is a small business owner in Uptown. I support the Safety for All budget plan from Cunningham, Fletcher and Bender and I also support uh, the people's budget. For years, I've lived across South High and my house looks out at just our neighborhood and the beautiful diversity and all the amazing young people that we are raising. And I am so proud of all the ways that young people have taken the lead um, this summer. Uh, one of the tragedies is as an educator is seeing uh, the Minneapolis police continue to bully um, young people. This summer I was held at gunpoint by four Minneapolis police officers who falsely accused me and two black teens of smoking weed in front of our house. Unfortunately, I don't feel safe calling the police to respond to crimes in my neighborhood. We have families living on the streets. I have had social workers have to drop off laptops for kids to go to school online in a tent. In a tent. We have teens out of school, people out of work. We are in the middle of a pandemic and a recession. We need increased funding for affordable housing, homeless outreach, youth programming, and nonviolent mental health interventions. Please stay brave and keep the promises you made. Thank you. We are on speaker 157, Carol Becker. Howdy folks, this is Carol Becker from uh, Longfellow Neighborhood. Uh, I drive a 2003 Honda Element with 220,000 miles on it two and a half months ago. Somebody came, a couple people came and tried to cut off the uh, catalytic converter, ran out, chased them away. Months later, they came back again. We ran out again and chased them away. I went out because I knew they were still in my neighborhood. They were about four blocks over. Uh, I called the police three times, three times over an hour and a half as I watched them chase the rest of my neighborhood to find out where they could steal things. Nobody showed up. Uh, the Wednesday, last Wednesday, uh, before the night before Thanksgiving, they came back. We ran out again like idiots because these people could be armed and tried to chase them away. But this time they got my catalytic converter, called the police. What the police told me was there are no inspectors to sit and investigate this. Um, and so for all the great, brilliant ideas that Mr. Fletcher has and Cunningham of all these programs that we're going to start someday and someday they're really going to have an impact. What do we do in the meantime? What do we do in the meantime while you bring all these awesome programs up that don't exist today, that we don't know how to run, we don't have managers, we don't have staff, we don't have anything. Um, and somehow, what do we do in the meantime? Is it just like Please a crack out butterfly? Really, is that the solution that we should just live with crime all the time? So someday when you bring up this stuff, it's not okay. We need something better. Thank you. Speaker 158. Annalise Brandel-Tanis. Speaker 159, Alexis Chapel-Bush. Hello, I'm Annalise Brandel-Tanis. Go ahead. Um, my name is Annalise, I live in Ward 9. I'm an educator with the Park Board in the Minneapolis Public Schools. I support the people's budget and points one and two of the Safety for All plan as the bare minimum we need to move forward right now. As the caller behind um, or previous to me was just talking about um, living with crime, um, honestly, I don't understand why folks um, don't see the push to allocate resources into things that will change the conditions in which we live as solving the problem. Um, I support the people's budget because I am an educator, because I know that if I want my students to succeed, I can't just tell them, well, do the reading, do it more. I have to give them the tools to do their reading. I have to work with them. I have to know what they need. Um, that's what's happening right now. We have to talk about the fact that we're in a pandemic. We have to talk about the fact that um, years and years of violence from the police um, is escalating now. Um, callers have been pointing out that we have not yet substantially defunded the police. Um, what we need to move forward is resources allocated into the things that will change our living conditions. That is the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 160, Candace Montgomery. 
Then we'll have Christian Arcos, Trent Waite, and Meredith Huff. 160 is Candice Montgomery. Hi, my name is Candice Montgomery and I'm a member and co-director of Black Visions and live in Ward 8. I want to say how proud I am of our city and hope the city council members and staff see the huge opportunity and critical need for continuous conversation, education, and principled struggle across our beautiful city. I want to thank council members for making a solid step in the right direction with part one and two of the Safety for All plan. Wow, look how far we've come, y'all. Like many here today, I'm encouraging you to step into your leadership fully and support the people's budget, a robust plan to invest in our needs now and our future. Unlike many of the affluent city residents who have voiced concern on tonight's call, the people's budget begins to offer actual solutions. We need holistic approaches. We need deep investments in our community, not the same unjust systems we've been forced to rely on. We must move away from endless punishment and get to the root of our issues. Our livelihoods demand visionary leaders. I call on all of us to dig in with our neighbors and reflect on the ways our ancestors will look at, back at what we did. I hope we will be together. Please pass the people's budget, invest in, our, in the needs of our communities. Um, I offer this text from Octavia E. Butler to guide council members forward. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Thank you. Thank you. 161 is Christian Arcos, then Trent Waite, Meredith Huff, and Maya Lemon. Christian. Uh, yes, hello. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, did we miss you before? Yes, I was caller 159, Alexis Chappelle Bush. Can I go? Yes, go ahead. My name is Alexa Chappelle Bush. I'm 17 years old. I go to PYC Arts and Tech High School and I live in North Minneapolis. I care about police and community violence because I've experienced both my whole life. Community violence has taken away my peers and my family while the police have always caused havoc in my life and in my community. The police have always been a threat to me because I am a person of color. Instead of solving crime, they make our communities less safe, especially for people of color. For those of you who don't live in North Minneapolis, you need to understand that the police have always bestowed violence and chaos within the color community. The pol Minneapolis police treat us like they are disgusted that we even exist. They have always taken small calls and turned them into something major, especially when it's a white person making the call. I learned the, that police all over the United States spend about 30 to 40 percent of their time answering non-criminal calls. I believe we should defund the police force and focus on what the community needs so that people won't have to call the police as much. We need to invest that money to support our people's mental, physical, emotion, and emotional health, starting with funding money towards affordable mental health care. We don't know George Floyd is going to receive justice. We know Breonna Taylor did not. This is unlawful and disgusting. The world is watching. Are we just going to keep giving MPD more and more money to throw away innocent colored people and put them in jail? Let's take that money from the police budget and fund our communities to support a healthy mind and body. And let's start by getting justice for those who have been murdered. Thank you. You're muted, Madam President. Thank you, Council Member Gordon. That brings us to 161, Christian Arcos. And thank you to our last speaker. 162 is Trent Waite. Then we'll have Meredith Huff, yeah. Maya Lemon, and Connor Stratton. All right, thank you. Um, as long-term resident of Minneapolis, I believe we're ultimately going to need more funding for the police, not less. That doesn't mean we can't invest in the communities, though. I do respectfully disagree with those who say the police don't deter crime. Criminals ultimately balance risk and reward in their actions and prefer to avoid confrontations with the police. More police and police that can respond quickly raise the risk for criminals. Unless we address this increase in crime, I believe one thing that we will see is, more, is a more armed citizenry. As a citizen who is trained in the use of firearms, I have seen a large increase in my fellow citizens of all racial groups and backgrounds, and especially women, wanting to purchase and legally carry weapons for their protection. 
And this includes people who previously expressed an aversion to guns and favored gun control. It is concerning to me, though, having more guns enter the populace as I believe the majority of gun owners are not adequately trained in their use. And I just want to say that this didn't start with the unrest surrounding the murder of George Floyd. Gun and ammo sales started going through the roof at the beginnings of the pandemic. I believe we need an adequately funded police force to address crime and especially violent crime. Although I admit I don't know what an adequately funded police force looks like. But I do support Chief Arredondo, and I believe he has been trying to address abuses within the department. I feel he does need this city's support to provide Please safe, to secure, and thank you, and just policing in Minneapolis. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next speaker is 163 Meredith Huff. One sixty four is Maya Lemon. Oh, hello, this is Meredith Huff. Oh, welcome. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Meredith Huff and I live in Ward six. I'm calling to speak in favor of the people's budget put forth by over 40 community organizations and businesses. There is a lot of concern over rising crime and these statistics point to the fact that people's basic needs are not being met. We can make life better for all of us by ensuring people have the resources they need and that those resources are delivered in a culturally sustaining way. When we do this, we eliminate the conditions that cause crime. The Minneapolis Police Department has failed to keep our community safe, particularly our black and brown neighbors. Since their murder of George Floyd, they have continuously shown their disdain for the people they are sworn to serve. It would be completely irresponsible to keep looking to them for solutions. We need to try something new. Well, I appreciate the proposal by three of our council members to create an alternative emergency response team. Their plan does not divert money towards social services that meet people's needs. If we want to transform public safety into something that works for all of Minneapolis, not just white property owners, then we need to implement the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 164 is Maya Lemon. Uh, hello. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is uh, Ishmael Dore. I, was, Hi, I thought I was. Oh. Um, well, go ahead. You know, I can go after you. We're on, yeah. <laughs> We're on 164. Um, Maya Lemon. I'll go back if we miss someone. Thanks. OK, great. Um, my name is Maya Lemon and I'm a resident of Ward 9. I'm here tonight to speak against the further funding of NPD and to ask the city council and mayor to support the people's budget. Increasing police doesn't make our community safer. Free and affordable housing, mental health resources, substance abuse and overdose prevention, and green and environmentally just infrastructure keeps our community safe. As a social worker, I'm particularly invested in having alternatives other than policing to support mental health crisis. I have deep grief for the many people who have been harmed, traumatized, and killed at the hands of the police during a mental health crisis. Please support the people's budget and invest in our community and not in MPD. Thank you. Thank you. The speaker who we missed, uh, can you state your name and yeah, then go ahead? Uh, I don't know what number 133, but I think you called another name. But hello, my name is Ishmael Dore. I was born in Minneapolis and I currently live in Ward 6. Um, I care deeply for my community and everyone that lives here, but I'm calling today to ask that the Minneapolis City Council reimagine policing and fund solutions that will actually address our community's problems. I urge the City Council to pass the Safety for All budget plan as a first step in the process to rebuilding our community. We know police do not prevent crime. We need to invest in funding and supporting our community so we can prevent, prevent crime instead of just reacting to it. There have been a lot of talk about crimes in our city with, uh, during this phone call, but what about the criminals coming from other cities under the guise of public safety service that spend over 100 hours of their training on firearms and only roughly eight hours on de-escalation? This doesn't make sense. And like I said, these thugs do not prevent crime. They only respond to it. And when they do respond to it, they further hurt the community. Then go back to their own communities and families where they're not worried about their safety and we have to carry the burden of that trauma. As a matter of fact, most of these, th these thugs are not even from here, don't live here, don't have any meaningful community relationships here. Roughly only seven or eight percent of our police force are residents here. Like we can, we can give these jobs to people in the community that actually know people in the community that can use their relationships to de-escalate situations and prevent crime. I don't even think people are aware that we have an office of violence prevention, which is understaffed. We could do that could do amazing things in our community if they had more money. Why not give them more money? 
you know, these poorly trained people that sign up to keep our community safe show up to do their jobs most of the time with more fear for their lives than those of us that are living here. And since it's only a matter of time, okay, since it's only a matter of time, it seems as though okay. Thank you. Speaker 165, Connor Stratton. One sixty six, Henry Scott. One sixty seven, Lloyd Brown. We'll then have Christian Crabtree, Ter Terry Grusbeck, Jamari Jones, and Greg Sullo. So right now we're looking for one sixty five, Connor Stratton. 166, Henry Scott, or 167, Lloyd Brown? Hello? Yes, who is this? From there, we'll have 168, Christian Crabtree. Hello. Hello. Yes, my name is Henry Scott. Okay, I, go I, ahead. Uh, um, uh, my name is, okay, my name is Henry Scott. I'm a member of uh, Satur. I live on the north side of Minneapolis. And come on, pop up. I'm sorry, I wrote down what I wanted to say. Here we go. I'm a member of Satur and I am here tonight as to ask the city to the city council to accept the people budget as as the short end of the stick uh you know what I got this all mixed up. That we are often a target. We are we are getting a shorter sentence if we land before a judge. And last but not least, we are over. We are overlooked when it comes to funding and opportunity and resources. I help and, and fought to get better wages for workers. I fought for. Community contracts for out of for out of reach and education, and we need six investigators to. Thank you. Thank you. That will bring us. So we've missed one sixty five, Connor Stratton. One sixty seven is Lloyd Brown. One sixty eight is Christian Crabtree. Hello, my name is Kristen Crabtree and I live in Ward 12 and I support the people's budget. This proposal calls us to invest in communities to prioritize community well being over the comfort of a few. The crises that we face in Minneapolis are not inevitable. They are the direct result of policy decisions and I challenge you to think past policing as a solution. Our current model of policing is reactive rather than responsive and results in a force tasked with work that falls outside their expertise. Imagine a world where community needs are met through responsive and preventative programming rather than punitive reaction. We have an opportunity to invest in community safety by strategically reallocating resources, funding, and responsibility toward community-based models of safety, support, and prevention. We know that well-resourced communities thrive. Several residents have called into this meeting expressing worries about feeling unsafe, and I ask you to reflect who feels protected by police. I challenge you to imagine what safety truly means. My children don't feel safe around the police, they feel scared. I heard a mom call in and talk about creating safety plans for her kids due to upticks in crime. Families that are already unprotected have always had to create safety plans for our children from the police. The fear I've experienced as a mom when my son started being seen as a threat rather than as a child at age 11 is real. One person's sense of safety should not mean another person's oppression. We must reimagine how we 
and we must keep each other safe. Thank you. 169, Terry Grusbeck. Then we'll have Jamari Jones, Greg Sello, Hillary Johnson, and Michael Johnson. So 169 is Terry Grusbeck. Hello. Hello, welcome. Um, this is Lloyd Brown. Yes, go ahead. I was, I was speaking number 157, and um, I'm a board member of St. Tool Center for Workers United Through the Struggles. And I was, I'm calling in to support the People's Bill because, like, um, in my street, I live in South Minneapolis. I just moved from over north, but um, where I live, um, the police, they, um, it's like, they cause more um, intense, they get intensified situations more than uh, help. And I think that workers, I mean, um, they should have investigators, six investigators for um, worker rights and um, $600,000 budget to make sure that um, when people go and, um, to put in the community to, for the workers to um, for, for the, uh, get the workers to establish like organizations for people that um, have mental uh, issues and stuff when uh, the police don't have to be armed and we just need an um, organization to oversee the police and their staffing when um, it's not a violent, well, it's not a violent call, but I support the people's bill. Thank you, Speaker One Sixty Nine Terry Grusbeck. One Seventy Jamari Jones. One Seventy One Greg Sello. Hello, this is Jamari. Can I, can I go real quick? Yes, please go ahead. My name is Jamari Jones. I am 20 years of age and I attend school at PYC Arts and Tech. I was born and raised in North Minneapolis. We have a three class, we have a class three days a week in which we go over the issues in the police department and within the community. I also work for KRSM radio and I have a report I'm doing on some of the issues we are facing. I spoke with council person Jeremiah Ellison and we briefly discussed some of the questions I had. He was very cooperative on his end. I asked about an opportunity to speak to the council and the mayor about reform and defunding. I would be in favor of putting the funds toward a community benefits type agreement where the police and the, and the community would engage and enter a legally binding agreement about police conduct. More education is needed about the police, what they were designed to do and what they actually do. And the people's rights when the, peop when the police pull up on them. Young people shouldn't feel like the only place their voice can be heard is a police station. We need to put less money toward police and more money towards engaging the community and what public safety really would be in a world without police racism. I believe a community benefits agreement for pol policing that is legally binding would be a good faith gesture coming from the police telling us that they truly want to improve. This could set an example for other cities as well. Thank you. Please, thank you. Um, and you can always email more information about this idea. Uh, number 171 is Greg Sello. Yep, I'm here. Um, Go ahead. I'm a local, I'm a local homeowner in Ward 2. It is of major significance that so many people have called it today in support of the people's budget and real systemic change because research has shown that the people who speak at public hearings are more conservative than their broader communities. They are more likely to be male, white, and affluent. It should not be surprising that the people who benefit the most from the current system are the ones most likely to raise their voices with a belief that the system will listen to them. But if the voices at public hearings tend to be more conservative than their general public, that means that those calling to defund the police are not dirty, we're the tip of the iceberg. But many of us who want a city see the city defund the police and refund communities understandably don't have faith in this process. When you see a system of government put the interests of corporations and the wealthy ahead of your own, 
year after year, you have every reason to believe that your voice doesn't matter. This is the problem with trying to conduct democracy within a system built on inequality and injustice. The question must become, how do we empower those who have been left out of these conversations for too long? The answer is clearly not more police, because you cannot undo a system of white supremacy and racial capitalism with the very tools that are used to create and maintain that system. We need the courage and the imagination to build new models and new systems. And we need a city budget that works for the pe most marginalized people in our communities. That is why I urge the city council to support the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. 172, Hillary Johnson. Hi. Hi, my name is Hillary Johnson. Uh, I live in Ward 9. I support the people's budget because a better life for everyone is within our power. Safety to me looks like justice for George Floyd. Safety looks like people able to be warm and well fed. Safety to me looks like you can't get kicked out of your apartment just because a worldwide pandemic made it unsafe for you to go to work. Safety to me means harm reduction. Fully funded police have not protected us from crime this year or any other. As far as the safety for all amendment, um, parts one and two are good first steps at a minimum. I just want us to acknowledge that our city will not be safe until everyone is cared for. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 173, Michael Johnson. One seventy four is Bridget Stewart. Then we'll have Julia De Luca, Robin Wansley Warlaba, Karen Peterson, and Bobby Gass. So one seventy four is Bridget Stewart. One seventy five is Julia De Luca. Can 165 talk? I, I'm calling in late. Is this Connor Stratton? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's me. Yeah, go ahead, Connor, and then I think I hear Bridget. We'll come back. So go ahead, Connor, please. OK, thanks so much. Um, I Yeah, I'm Connor. Um, I live in Midtown Phillips. I'm just calling to support the people's budget. Um, just quickly, I, I just think that it's clear that we live in um, a system of racial capitalism and the police's function beyond what any individual may do uh, serves to support property uh, interests and capital interests and does not keep people safe and in fact harms people. And what we need to do is invest in things that actually keep people safe. Um, and that is the, people, the people's budget. Um, and so we should defund the police and we should refund the people and support what important measures can keep actual people actually safe. Thanks. Thank you. So we had one, speaker 174, Bridget Stewart. 175, Julia DeLuca. Hi, this is Julia DeLuca. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Julia DeLuca. I'm a Ward 3 resident and I'm with Isaiah's Youth Coalition. I support parts one and two of the safety for all budget as first steps, and the, I urge this council to pass the people's budget. We all want to prevent crime in our city, but the answer is not funding more police. Police do not prevent crime and violence. They respond to it and make it worse. The answer to preventing crime and violence is funding the lives of the people. I found it outrageous that you plan to spend so much money on policing rather than housing amidst this pandemic where many people have lost their jobs and housing. Throughout this year, we the people of Minneapolis have come together to protest and contribute to mutual aid during the pandemic and uprisings after George Floyd's murder, while you, the government, choose to invest more money in policing rather than housing solutions. While people are sleeping in the cold, you continue to give more money to MPD who has failed to do its job in protecting this city and has instead harmed Black, Brown, and Indigenous lives. 
City Council, you must do what you promised to do this summer and reallocate proposed police funds towards policies that care for people. Invest in the immediate shelter for our unhoused neighbors and more affordable housing at 30% AMI. Invest in public education, health care, especially mental health care, child care, direct economic relief, and worker protections during this pandemic and beyond. When we care for people, we will not need the current policing system. When we care for people, we will have true community safety. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 176 is Robin Wansley Orlaba. Can't you hear me? Hello, I'm here. Yes, go ahead. All right. I'm Robin Warlaba and I live in Ward 2. Seven months ago, thousands of our neighbors flooded the streets for weeks because MPD officers publicly executed George Floyd. His death forced our city to finally reckon with the reality that safety has largely been a privilege extended to corporate businesses and our white affluent and middle class residents. And it's a privilege that largely comes at the expense of poor and working class black brown and indigenous communities. Additionally, safety for our most privileged has not required more costs. Instead, it's involved our city leaders ensuring those communities with housing, fully funded schools, mental health resources, and quality jobs. The very things we defund in black and brown communities. So today our city can set a new mandate for what community safety looks like by passing the people's budget and the first and second amendments of the safety for all proposal. It's time to fund the things that help our communities thrive and not those that aid in our collective demise. Thank you. Thank you. 177, Karen Peterson. Then we'll have Bobby Gass, Archie Bongiovanni, Jenny Ackerson, and Kristen Ball. So 177 is Karen Peterson. Hello, go ahead. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Can you state your name? Yes, thank you. So we are on speaker 178, Bobby Gass. Hi, my name is Bobby Gass. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I live in Ward 9 and I'm a 10 year resident of the Powderhorn neighborhood. I support the people's budget and parts one and two of the safety for all bill, which is the bare minimum that I expect from my council members. I have worked on the front lines of this pandemic as a public health outreach worker, and I have seen firsthand the devastating impact that COVID and the murder of George Floyd continue to have on our communities. I work every day with residents, your constituents, who are without shelter, food, money, inadequate health care, and there's no relief in sight. This is a policy failure. The people I serve are just trying to survive, yet they continue to lose loved ones to an opioid epidemic that is exacerbated by COVID and violent policing practices. Overdose deaths reached a record high in Minnesota last year, and I can tell you from my experience on the front lines that it's only increasing. This is a policy failure. Our city does not have the basic public health infrastructure to provide for our community's well-being. Housing, food, mental health, harm reduction, and economic relief 
These are the determinants of community health and safety. We don't need them sometime in the future. We need them now. Please, I implore you, have the courage to pass the people's budget in parts one and two of the Safety for All bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 179 is Archie Bongiovanni. Speaker 180 is Jenny Ackerson. Hi, my name is Jenny Ackerson. I'm a resident of Ward 3, and I ask for the City of Minneapolis to give a budget that reflects equity amongst all its residents. All residents of Minneapolis includes our unhoused residents. We need investment in programs that prevent houselessness, including renters protection, protecting naturally occurring affordable housing, and a substantial investment into creating affordable housing citywide. An equitable budget also means funding for programs that protect workers from wage theft, provides childcare options so people can work, and programs that recognize the needs of sex workers as well. The idea that you can take pennies from winter maintenance budgets on our streets and sidewalks is not going to solve the budget. That just, uh, disadvantaged residents that are transit dependent or less mobile. Spending on police is not equitable. A vocal privileged class that benefits from excessive police funding does not outweigh the majority of Minneapolis residents that will benefit from a reinvestment in prevention and support services. Do not let the masked fear of crime from privileged class assert that they are losing their city because there's going to be cuts to the police force. The experiment with overfunding police services is done. We need an equitable budget alternative like the proposed people's budget from Reclaim the Block that seriously invests in the people of Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. 179, Archie Bongiovanni. 181 is Kristen Ball. One eighty two Al Geeson. That will be followed by Rebecca Johnson, Jan Nye, and Bernadette K. One eighty two is Al Geeson. Hi, it's Al Geeson. Uh, we've lived in Ward eleven for thirty five years. Hi, Jeremy. We ask you not to remove funds from the MPD. Daily we hear of increased crime in our neighborhood and across the city. We've never been concerned about safety and crime, but these days we take extra precautions. Carjackings have been happening all around us. I have no quarrel with reforming aspects of how the police do their job. However, there must be lesser priority items than public safety where that money can be found. MPD isn't the only place to find funds. It's irresponsible to increase the risk of personal safety of all residents by reducing the MPD budget. You, the council, created this problem with a rash and emotional decision to, to defund. Take responsibility, fix the problem you created. Do not let idealism get in the way of practicality. Thank you. Please leave the MPD with full funding. Thank you. Speaker 183, Rebecca Johnson. Mm. One eighty four Jan Nye. This is Jan Nye. Welcome, please go ahead. Jan Nye, Ward Six. I'll be speaking not about the horrific acts by police that have brought international focus on our city, but about some of the root causes of these tragedies. The failure of police to uphold and follow the laws of our city and state has created an unsafe environment. Four years ago, Elisa Gomez, who lived across the street from me, was murdered by Bradley Alexander, her husband of less than a day. A call to the police about a domestic dispute was handled with a drive-by by officers who failed to follow standard procedure of face-to-face -face with the parties involved. Six hours later, Elisa was dead of ligature strangulation determined by the coroner to be a suspicious death where a possible injury by another could not be ruled out. A quick search revealed that Elisa's husband had tried to strangle his ex-wife and had served time for deadly assault. Lieutenant Zimmerman was in charge of the investigation of a mere four hours. Next sale of the MPD is Lieutenant Mike Sorrell. Too expensive to have as a street cop because of lawsuits, he was put in charge of teaching use of force. Can't make this stuff up. 
He taught, he taught that kicks to the head were permissible. Only three years ago, one of his protégés went to prison for kicking a suspect in the head as he lay face down, ringed by five officers. Sorrow later headed the Sex Crimes Investigation Division, where it was discovered that over 1,700 rape kits had not been processed. Sorrow has claimed that not all rape kits need to be processed. Please start to Is wrap up. prevention of crime one of the most important functions of police? Unfortunately, there are too many stories of racism, sexism, illegal handling and destruction of evidence, theft and other outrages by the MPD. So I give one more. Thank you. The next speaker is 185 Bernadette K. One eighty six is Justin Kanikua. Right. Oh, I'm no longer muted. Hello, we can hear you. One eighty seven is M. E. Schaefer. So we have 185 Bernadette K, 186 Justin Kanakua, 187 M. E. Schaefer. One eighty eight is Phil Pearson. Hello. Hello, yes, who is this? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Who, who is speaking? I'm I'm Paola Evangelista. I'm from earlier. Um, I got missed. Um, can I speak? Paola, I don't think we have you earlier. Um, and I just want to make sure we have so many people that folks are able to speak. I'm going to keep calling on the folks that we have in this section of the speaker list. So that would be Phil okay. Pearson would be next. 188 is Phil Pearson. 189 is Kenneth Vreeland. 19 Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Who is this? Okay, my Ken Vreeland. My name's Ken Vreeland. I live in Ward 9. Um, my property's been burglarized twice, so I'm a double victim. Uh, what went on downtown from here, I can't shop. I have to leave my community. When you look at where the next closest place is, I can't shop in my area. We don't feel safe in our own home. I'm the chair of the Minneapolis Area Senior Caucus. The seniors don't feel safe. We oppose cutting MPD because community policing is necessary more now than ever. Back when this city was called Murderapolis, the way it was turned around was by community policing and more police. Yet you have people saying police don't do their job, police don't count, police do this, police do that, police do a lot. And without them, who's going to be able to protect us? And you say, oh, we can protect ourselves. Yeah, I have applied for a concealed carry permit because that's where I feel I need to have to be safe. And how crazy is that? I've never in my life felt that I need to conceal carry, but that's the way it's getting. If you do this and cut and follow this people's budget, um, you know, my taxes are up. My homeowner's insurance is up because of the burglary. It's happening to, to business. Up. You'll kill your downtown. You're gonna. Thank you. Speaker 190, Lisa Clemens. Then we'll have Can you hear me? Oh, yes, welcome. Go ahead. Uh, before I get started, uh, uh, President Bender, can Jeremiah Ellison tell that young man that called about the community benefits agreement that the Department of Justice would like to 
have more youth on that mediation team because that is what they're doing, a community benefits agreement. So if he wants to reach out to Reverend Bethel or uh, uh, Chief Arredondo, he would be a welcome voice in that. That's great, thank you. And I just kind of I want to make sure the tech team Sorry, is going to start the is... start the time uh, when Ms. Clemens starts her testimony. So please go ahead. Okay, it, should I start now? Yes, please say, go ahead. This is Jamari. This is Jamari Jones. I was wondering, like, you said to contact who? Oh, Chief Arredondo or Jeremiah Ellison should be able to connect you to him or Reverend Ian Bethel. They are looking for more youth voices to be part of that Department of Justice Mediation Team Community Benefits Agreement. You would be perfect for that. Okay, thank you. Carry on, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cause anything. You're welcome, no problem. Should I go now? Yes, thank you, go ahead. Okay, I wrote it down. I work with people in all of your wards, especially Ward 4 and 5. I'll mention George Floyd and the other 78 or more people who have been murdered in Minneapolis. My prayers to them. The families we help are not saying they don't want more police, especially those dodging bullets in their community. In their community, We can't have a city afraid to come outside, and that's not because of MPD. The long lines you get, the long lines for carry permits should not be ignored. Everyone on these calls is right. Two years, years ago, I asked you to take 1% from all departments under the city, city's budget uh, umbrella, and that would have generated $18 million to do safety work in the community, and you refused. I'm asking you again to transfer that 1% from all departments, because this is everybody's responsibility, to Sasha Cotton under the Office of Violence Prevention to, and stop dividing us further, because it's not necessary to do that. Those funds are there. This is punishment to MPD and punishment to the community. The department needs to be fully funded and the resources need to be uh, out there for our communities to have. I'm telling you as boots on the ground, we need both Please of them. So I'm asking you, I'm asking you to transfer 1% from every department. Thank you. The next speaker in queue is 191 Paul Rosenberg. Then we'll have Christine Kelly, Heather Wolfsburg, and Jennifer Zielinski. 191 is Paul Rosenberg. One ninety two, Christine Kelly. One ninety three, Heather Wolfsburg. One ninety four, Jennifer Zielinski. One ninety five, Donna. Edelstein. 196, Mark McClellan. 197, Carl Pearson. 198, Emily Ressinger. Yeah, hi, my name is Emily Ressinger, and I'm here to talk about funding for neighborhood associations. I'm currently the vice president of the Standish Erickson Neighborhood Association in Ward 12, and I've been on the board for eight years. Council approved the guidelines for the neighborhood's 2020 funding model in November. I applaud city and council for centering racial equity in this plan. However, I'm asking you today to allocate an additional $3 million to neighborhood associations. Based on the funding shown in the neighborhood's 2020 guidelines, my organization will get right around 50000 in the first year of the program, which will decrease to about 32000 by the third year. These amounts are not enough to pay our staff a living wage and do the programming, outreach, and engagement work necessary to serve our neighbors. It is likely by the third year of Neighborhood 2020, our organization will have to shut its doors, along with another a number of other neighborhood associations. As City Council wrestles with ways to honor the commitment made on June 7th to drastically change the way Minneapolis approaches crime and safety, I urge you to imagine the role neighborhood associations can take in this future Minneapolis. Neighborhood associations have existing resident networks as well as organizing skills, so find ways to work with us. 
We want to be your partners in creating an alternative public safety system, which could include roles in restorative justice and de-escalation programs. But we can't do that if we are forced to close because of lack of funds. An additional $3 million is the minimum amount needed to keep neighborhood associations open. Please consider amending funding in the budget for Neighborhoods 2020 accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just check through. We had 191 Paul Rosenberg, 192 Christine Kelly, 193 Heather Wolfsburg, 194 Jennifer Zielinski, 195 Donna Edelstein, 196 Mark McClellan, 197 Carl Pearson. I'll just pause. You'll need to hit star six to unmute and see if any of those folks are on the line. Hi, can you hear me? This is Jennifer Zielinski. Yes, welcome. Hi, I just urge you to vote on the mayor's budget. I do believe we need police reform, but I don't think this is the time to do it right now. We do need police in our community. However, I would love to see it where Chief Ardondo having the resources he needs to really reform our police department in a way that does serve our community. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is 199, Kevin Petrie. Then we'll move to speaker 200, Don Sam Samuels. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, welcome, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Don Samuels, former council member. I'm in favor of the mayor's budget. Let me see, I'm a 71 year old black male who raised a black son and three black daughters in black neighborhoods. Sandra and I live in the Jordan neighborhood because we know it makes a difference for us to be here. We are in the fight for justice. That's why we support the mayor's budget and we support the goals of the people's budget, which can be achieved in collaboration with the county where there is lots more money. When George Floyd was murdered, we were aghast, we were upset. Uh, when when uh, Philando Castile was murdered, we felt terrorized. We know that there's a need for change and we cannot lose this moment when the whole world is watching and the pressure is on the police union and the police department to change. And we have a black chief for the first time. The stars have aligned. And instead, we're going to abandon this opportunity for real change to try an experiment that we don't know if it'll work. And we always know that new policies have unintended consequences. And I can tell you that these consequences will be dire because we are hearing gunshots every night. People are scared. People are moving, selling their homes. African-Americans can't afford to defund everything that doesn't work. Please talk we can't to defund the police. We can't defund the school district. We can't defund the foster care system. We can't defund the state troopers. We can't defund the, the landlord system. We'd, no, we'd have nothing. Thank you. And we can follow up with Mr. Samuels as well if there's testimony to submit by email. Speaker 201 is Danielle Fox. Then we'll have. Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Go ahead. I urge the city council and my representative, Andrew Johnson, to pass the people's budget and to support items one and two in the safety for all plan. I like to think I know this city close up. I've worked here in community service jobs over the last 10 years in MFIP case management, housing case management, even assisting residents at the Hennepin County ACF. So much about service delivery is through a lens of vulnerability, and I don't think that this is always the best way to do it because we don't see people's value. I learned something about this in my career of community service, and I wanted to share this revelation with you today. Um, it is not somebody's vulnerability that makes them worthy of basic needs like appropriate health care, stable, affordable housing, and safety from violence. We deserve these things because we are all valuable members of our community. And I changed my perspective to see people's value, not their vulnerability, and I implore you to do the same as you make these investment choices for the city. I am in the process of arranging a meeting with you, Andrew, to have a deeper conversation about a street outreach project that I am involved in with SWAP Minneapolis. We deliver harm reduction supplies to people on the streets and we need money to keep our delivery strong. 
So in closing, I just want to ask the people on my council to start seeing value in people. We are here not because we are broken, but because we have struggled to thrive in a broken system. We need to fund the systems that have been, that we have designed that we know work for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The next speaker is Lee Williams. Speaker 202. Then we'll have Kathy Sima, Joe Tamburino, Reed Adams, and Aaron Hart. Speaker 202 is Lee Williams. Two oh three, Kathy Sima. Two oh four is Joe Tamburino. Hi, this is Joe Tamburino. Thanks for having me on. Um, I got to say, hats off to the people's budget. They've been able to organize, use their talking points, and basically hijack this meeting. I disagree with them, but I, I'm very impressed with their organizational skills. I just have two comments. One is the city council should be completely transparent and disclose who are the experts that you are listening to. It's obviously not Chief Arredondo, so please tell us who are you listening to. And lastly, why don't you have a vote, a plebiscite? Schedule a vote next year sometime. Let all the eligible voters in the city of Minneapolis vote as to whether or not we should fully fund the police. I support the mayor's budget, and I think most voters would. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 205, Reed Adams. Then we'll have Aaron Hart, Rick Klausner, Max Miller, and David Mann. 205 is Reed Adams. Two oh six, Aaron Hart. Two oh seven, Rick Klausner. Hi. Welcome. Uh, for the record, my name is Rick Klausner and I live in Ward Eleven. Um, I support a fully funded, fully staffed police force. I do not support any budget that shifts funding away from MPD. This city is becoming a crime infested mess. And the reason is because our city council has acted completely irresponsibly with calls to defund the police. It is this rhetoric and the current shortage of understaffed and overworked police that has emboldened the criminals and directly contributed to the rise in crime. Criminals are targeting our most vulnerable citizens, including women and seniors. I worry for the safety of my family and for all the citizens citizens of Minneapolis that anybody could be the next victim. It's the city's number one job to protect its citizens and currently is failing miserably. We are also seriously endangering all of our small businesses and many are closing or threatening to do so because of the rise in violent crime and the irresponsibility of the city council. These small businesses are the lifeblood of our community and if we don't make the investments in safety now we will lose this precious part of our community. The city council needs to stop the anti law enforcement rhetoric and do not give in to the small majority of activists in the city who want to defund the police. Please work together with Chief Arredondo to, to come up with a plan to keep the city safe. Thank Please you. Start to wrap up. Oh, great. Thank you. Number 208, Max Miller. Two oh nine is David Mann. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, this is Max. Sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, hello, my name is Max Miller and I live in Ward 2 in the Longfellow neighborhood. I stand with my neighbors in favor of the people's budget. The mayor's budget is divorced from the reality of violence and harm that the Minneapolis Police Department has caused to citizens of this community, particularly to people of color. After the murder of George Floyd by the MPD, the city, including many members of city council, have committed themselves to envisioning a real mode of public safety that divests from the dangerous myth that policing ensures their well-being. It is imperative that the budget reflects that. Instead of funding the racist and militant force of the police against the people of Minneapolis, we need to give money to the many resources that exist have proven to support us. During this pandemic, I have worked alongside neighbors to address the lack of access to housing, massive unemployment, and devastation to access to essential care in a way that the city has failed to do. Many, if not most, of these mutual aid efforts have been done with only the generosity offered by passing a hat. 
this is a time to act boldly to support the necessary efforts to change the city away from one that has a national reputation for using police to terrorize communities of color and murder black citizens into one that supports justice and real safety for all. The first two points of the safety for all plan are only a small step in the right direction. Adopt the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 209 is David Mann, then Lawrence Fox, Kathleen O'Brien, Lisa Keith, and Carl Ulfers. 209 is David Mann. Two ten is Lawrence Fox. Hello, Larry Fox. Welcome. Please go ahead. Hi, Larry Fox. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. My name is Larry Fox. I live in Kenwood and I work downtown. I support efforts to promote racial justice. I also support fully funding the police. We can do both. This issue is personal to me. Two nights ago, my home was broken into in the middle of the night while my family was sleeping. My wife and I woke up when the intruders literally came into our second floor bedroom and turned on the light. We were terrified. Recently, a neighbor of mine who lives around the corner was robbed at gunpoint at 8 a.m. To the city council members who are advocating cutting the police budget, you are putting our lives at risk. Peer reviewed studies from Princeton, Penn, University of Chicago and other schools demonstrate that increasing police presence reduces crime. I want to acknowledge the fear that, of the police that my black and brown neighbors have just living their lives. Everyone agrees we need to reform the police and invest in addressing systemic racism but it'll take money to get the job done. That's why we need to get behind Chief Arredondo's efforts to reform and fully staff the department. During this time of economic crisis, we should be doubling down on police funding and not cutting it. Thank you. Speaker 211, Kathleen O'Brien. Kathleen O'Brien. Go ahead. Hello, this is Kathleen O'Brien. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. I live in the Longfellow community and I served on the city council and as city coordinator. All people in our city have a right to a just and a safe city. You, our city council, are our city government. And I'm terribly disappointed in the choices that you have brought to us. Your public safety for all program is setting up a false choice between police adequate funding for the police and supporting our chief and essential social programs um, and the full funding of 311 and the co-responder co-program program with Hennepin County. I totally agree with Don Samuels that you're offering choices uh, programs to people that you're not going to be able to fund, and you should be working with Hennepin County more that has more funding. I support the demands of our Northside neighbors who are suing the city to receive the police protection and service that is their right. Now is not the time to reduce the MPD. Now is not the time to cut, cut police overtime, which cynically you know that the chief will need overtime in 21 before the new police classes are on duty. Support Chief Arredondo, give the officers and resources that he Thank you. Speaker 212 is Lisa Keith. Speaker 213, Carl Ulfers. Yes, we can hear you. Can you state your name? Great. Yep. Hi, this is uh, Carl Ulfers. I'm from uh, Ward 11. Thank you. Go ahead. Following the, uh, yeah, so following the murder of George Floyd and the unrest that followed, our city leaders could have chosen to bring us together. And instead, they've created environments like tonight, which has created a false divide and made us choose between police reform um, or safety. 
the reality is we can do both. Um, last Friday at 745, directly in front of my house, uh, two carjackers fired four bullets at point black range into a housekeeper's car uh, who's just simply waiting to do her job. The reality here is the city's budget is $1.5 billion, and we're deepening the division within our community over $8 million in funding. This is simply unacceptable. We have a deeply flawed policing model, and that, and that murder of George Floyd was tragic and could have been avoided had we focused on this earlier. The other reality is we've lost 100 police officers, and violent crime across every neighborhood is up, and we have a system that, due to this loss of officers, is collapsing. So we need to focus on creating a stronger community while at the same time continuing our funding for the police so we can get back to our previous levels of safety within the community um, and we can create a longer long-term community within Minneapolis. So I ask that we fund please our police up. and I ask better of our politicians to bring us together and look at the resources they have and how we can be a lot more creative and focused on the city, not on their own political agendas. Thanks. Thank you, speaker. 214 is Grace Davies. Then we'll have Tahiti Robinson, William Check, and Chris Parsons. 214 is Grace Davies. Hello, my name is Grace Davies. I've lived in Ward 12 for the last decade. I'm a white woman, an attorney, and a homeowner. I'm testifying tonight to encourage the entire council, and especially my representative, Andrew Johnson, to vote in favor of the people's budget. Specifically, I call upon council members who pledged last summer to reimagining public safety in Minneapolis to keep their commitment. Reimagining public safety means funding programs that support the health of Minneapolis residents, including funding for mental health, substance use, and environmental justice programs. It also means we must commit to major investments in housing, child care, direct economic relief, and worker protections. It is also essential that we fund programs aimed at prevention rather than punishment. Simply put, more funding for the police will not save us or make us safer. There's been a lot of discussion in Ward 12 and other predominantly white wards about the recent increase in crime and the need for more police to fight it. This may feel like an obvious solution to many white community members living in affluent neighborhoods because we have not been the primary victims of police violence and terrorism. More police will not solve the problems facing our communities in Minneapolis. More police will only perpetuate the racial inequity that is steeped into every facet of our local and state government. More police will only perpetuate police violence against our most marginalized community members. And it is incumbent upon us to seize the opportunity of this moment and build a new system of public safety in Minneapolis. That makes Thank you. We've now reached halfway point, which is speaker 215, Tahiti Robinson. Tahiti Robinson, no human being should be tracked or treated like a wild animal at any time. The Minneapolis Police Department is more concerned with protecting private property than they are with protecting the homeless and people of color. My friend is homeless and she's been told by police officers that she can't park at vacant lots overnight even though she is just trying to have a safe place to sleep at night. Why is it that in a city with more vacant housing than I can count, we are prioritizing harassing people like my friend instead of finding them a place to live? I urge the city council to vote on a budget that prioritizes getting our homeless housing uh, affordable instead of funding their harassment. Help us make our city and our state more beautiful and friendly by making it more livable for everybody, for all people all over the world, no matter what they look like or how much money they make. Thank you. Speaker 216 is William Check. Then we have Chris Parsons, Jill Smith, Dan Jurczak, Jur Jur and George Saad. 216 is William Check. Hi, my name is William Check. I'll be quick. I, uh, uh, oh, I don't have to hear nobody else. Oh, well. Did you hear that white lady? I am a white lady. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> we've, got, we've got the lines muted now. Uh, Mr. Check, you can go ahead.
You may need to push star six again to unmute. This is William. We can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Um, thank you. Um, again, very quickly, it's late. Everyone wants you um, to deliver effective 911 mental crisis response. And I'm just here because um, current plans for the team simply don't focus on getting the precious resource to the most critical mental crisis calls. Instead, staff is selling a hybrid homeless outreach team approach and staff is optimized for the numerous non-crisis calls and homeless contacts that fill the broad EDP category. The most difficult mental health crisis calls should be the focus. These are the calls we want to absolutely take away from the police. And vetting a paramedic just introduces the specter of ketamine again. So yes, separate outreach and navigator teams, that's needed. But please, you know, recognize these are separate needs. Please focus now on the much needed 911 mental health crisis response. You know, focus the expertise and the application to the critical need of psychiatric emergencies. And do that by replacing the paramedics with peer support specialists to create teams of two mental health professionals. The peer support specialist brings more expertise, more lived experience, and more cultural competence. Please drop the foolish do it all hybrid outreach team approach. That hybrid Thank you. approach. Please try to wait. wrap up. Almost guarantees the team will be less available and less effective and tougher. Thank you. 217 is Chris Parsons. Then we have Jill Smith, Dan Jerkchik, and George Saad. 217 is Chris Parsons. Two eighteen, Jill Smith. Two nineteen, Dan Jurek. Two twenty is George Saad. Folks will have to push star six to unmute. 221 is Lance Miller. I know it's getting late, so. Um. 222 is Sonia Toomey. Hey, this is. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, this is, okay. Yeah, I live in Ward 11. And what I'm is your name? To express my support. Sonia Toomey. Great, thank you. I'm calling, yep, I'm calling to express my support for Mayor Fry's budget. I've lived in Minneapolis for the best part of 20 years now. Um, before moving here, I actually lived alone in a pretty sketchy London. And I felt safer in London then than I do in Minneapolis now. Crime rates in the city are at their highest level since the 1970s. And just last week, a young woman was carjacked and shot at three times point blank range about 100 yards from my house. This was in broad daylight at eight o'clock in the morning. And just a few hours ago this evening, again, virtually broad daylight, there was a stabbing at the local holiday gas station. When I go to and from my house, I do so defensively. I scan the street or the alleyway for any cars I don't recognize. And I pause before I drive down the alley in case someone is there who could box me in by my garage. And we're actually starting to think that this might not be the place where we can continue to raise our children. Now, I agree that there's a need for reform within the police department, and we certainly need funding for health and social pro programs. But these are longer term solutions to very complex problems. And in the meantime, we need to deal with the crisis that we're facing right now. And to do that, we need a fully funded police force with adequate resources to do the job that we ask of it. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 223 is Alicia Reuter. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. This is Alicia Reuter. I am a resident of Ward 11. I've lived in Minneapolis my entire life. My family has lived here for generations. Crime is out of control since the tragic murder of George Floyd. Just Google Minneapolis and check out the top trending articles. 
The violence is not a perception. It is a reality felt by all of us. Enough is enough. The Safety for All Amendment, which includes police cuts to both targeted staffing levels and much needed overtime, is untenable, it's political, and it would set an alarming precedent. Most importantly, it does not represent what most Minneapolis residents want. We need police reform, and we need a fully funded and staffed police force. We need both, not just one or the other. Our police and our communities have been alienated by the rhetoric of many of you, while criminals have been emboldened. Listen to all of your constituents. Fully fund the mayor's budget proposal. Work with the whole community on real reform and tangible goals relating to a comprehensive public safety effort. Do not shift police programs and money. Do not cut police staffing levels or overtime. Above all else, do your job and protect the safety of this city. Thank you. Thank you. 224, Richard Router. Reuter. Thank you. My name is, yes, you got it right this time. My name is Rick Reuter. I'm, I'm a resident of the 11th Ward. My council representative is Jeremy Schroeder, who we actually met with as a neighborhood tonight. Um, I was born and raised here. I moved back to raise my family. Uh, it's because of my love for the city and, uh, and I truly care. Um, I'm deeply saddened by actually some of the speakers tonight that seem to have anger and even contempt for their fellow, fellow Minneapolis neighbors. It's, it's honestly heartbreaking and I, I'd, love, I'd love to see the healing begin, uh, but I don't think we're there yet. The tragic murder of George Floyd and systemic issues demand police and social reform. I also agree that economic and current health, you know, the current health pandemic are having a real dramatic impact and need to be addressed. As some of you have read in the Star and Tribune and others have talked about just before me, we have had an attempted carjacking with shots fired at our, at our friend. It could have been my wife, it could have been my child, it could have been my neighbor. There was not proper police coverage in our neighborhoods to avoid and do and respond effectively, although they did respond. No one wants to use this protection, but when it's there, I can tell you firsthand, you are so grateful when it's there. I implore the council to answer this dramatic increase in crime and violence. We need common sense. The choice should not be one or the other. We need both reform and safety. This is not a North or South problem. This is a Minneapolis problem and it's an opportunity. Please support Mayor Jacob Fry, Chief Arredondo, his plan and Thank you. 225 is Elizabeth Sarkey, then Lisa Moon, Mike Hallenbach, and Kevin Aldwak. 225 is Elizabeth Sarkey. Two twenty six, Lisa Moon. Two twenty seven, Mike Hallenbach. Beck. Two twenty eight, Kevin Aldwak. Two twenty nine, Mary Belfry. That will be followed by Amy Finnegan, Lars Megstad, and Amy Bloomshine. So we're on 229, Mary Belfry. 230, Amy Finnegan. 230, Folks will need to push star six to unmute. Hi, my name's Amy Finnegan. Um, I'm a mother of four little kids. I'm a sociologist. I live in Ward 12 in Longfellow. And I'm calling, I support the people's budget, which offers us a reimagined vision for safety, an understanding that what makes us safe is social cohesion and a community where people's basic needs are met. I feel we have an amazing opportunity here. I feel hopeful that our city can do the right thing, can build on our momentum towards justice from the summer and be intentional and thoughtful to ensure that we do not pass a status quo budget at the most at the end of the most extraordinary of years that is marked by a once in a century pandemic and the murder of George Floyd, our modern Emmett Till by the Minneapolis Police Department. As an educator, what I have learned and what I teach is that violence leads to more violence. Our society has structural inequalities resulting from a system of racial capitalism. Some people are advantaged and others are oppressed. Violence number one. 
As a result, some people enact crimes to get what they need or express indignation after centuries of oppression, violence number two. And then authorities, the police, come down with further relentless, provocative, repressive use of militarized violence, violence number three. The only way to break this spiral of violence is to make our society more equitable, to provide people with the mental health services, the economic relief, the housing, and the restorative justice models that they need. And that's why I support the people's budget, and I ask our elected officials to lead with your courage and choose the healing path. Thank you. 231 is Lars Nextad. Thank you, Madam President. My name is Lars Nexted. I live in Ward 12, and I'm the policy director for Isaiah. Right. We're hearing a lot of fear and con confusion about the issue of public safety tonight. Those supporting the mayor's budget or speaking about fears of crime seem to be suffering amnesia about the terrible murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police. At the heart of the matter is a simple question. Who gets to define public safety? Of course, we shouldn't be afraid of walking in our neighborhood, but we shouldn't also be afraid that our own armed officers will brutalize or kill our black and brown neighbors. There are no easy answers, but we need to start by agreeing that we all deserve public safety, not just the wealthiest or most well-connected voices. Doubling down on the status quo, a police department with a deeply entrenched culture grounded in toxic fear and racism is not the way to ensure safety for all. Minneapolis Charter, Article 7.3 states, quote, the mayor has complete power over the establishment, maintenance, and command of the police department. Unfortunately, the mayor has not managed to gain control of the MPD. The mayor missed the opportunity to reduce armed response to mental health crisis calls through his budget proposal. Since he only requested two additional Hennepin County COPE responders, that's all the county offered in their concurrent budget process. Leadership requires courage, humility, and perseverance. We need concrete solutions, not political posturing. Please support the Safety for All proposal from Council Members Bender, Cunningham, and Fletcher. It is a concrete and positive step in the right direction. Thank you. Next, we have 232, Amy Blumenschein. Esteemed and patient Council President and members, thank you for hearing my testimony. I am Amy Blumenschein, and I've helped lead over 30 national night out events in my Powderhorn neighborhood. But sadly, over the years, policing wasn't working for all of us. And that's before the pandemic and the death of George Floyd. We need to align our city budget with our values, investing in community health instead of futile attempts at dominating by increased force. Permit me to shift the focus to the bigger federal picture of how our local treasure is leached from our human flourishing. Last year, more than $1,100 million was taken from the federal taxpayers of the city of Minneapolis to spend on military war making. And that militarization impacts us in many ways. It's not surprising that our people are sick physically and mentally. Additionally, as Governor Waltz noted today, there are public safety consequences of being in a pandemic. Some people are sick. Some people are opportunistic. Those kids carjacking must be sick. Lots of cops are absent for duty now because they're sick. My colleague, military veteran Al Bostelman, will testify next week how the more police kill, the more they suicide. We corrupt cops when we insist that they do what they can't do. Brandishing lethal force doesn't work for the common good. As a Lutheran deacon, I... Thank you. We have Speaker 227, Mike Hallenbeck. Uh, hello, Mike Hallenbeck this here, mirror. long time listener, first time caller. Uh, I'm a homeowner, okay. business owner, and proud resident of Ward 4 on the north side of Minneapolis. I do not have a dog, I can't get but through. I do think I it's time you to reimagine public safety in our city. Um, I'm here to express support for the Safety for All budget plan proposal, which I call a positive step forward in establishing true public safety, as opposed to our current system, which as many callers have made clear tonight, does not keep us all safe. Um, I'm also open to the people's budget, but I'm not as familiar with it uh, because it's kind of new to me. Uh, but I can tell you the safety for all plan reduces MPD's workload by 15%. So putting 15% of MPD's resources towards new systems that take up that work is perfectly sensible. 
the plan also saves the city 50 to 70 million dollars over the next six years and that leaves more room for real investment into our community i appreciate the opportunity to speak thank you very much thank you hi this yes. is mary belfry hi mary go ahead hi Thanks. um i'm in ward 11 and um you know, a couple of people have said, you know, oh, you know what, you know, you can't feel unsafe because, you know, you want to go out and walk your dog and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, I, I can't imagine living in these areas where they hear gunshots all the time. That's not OK. But this crime that is going across the city, and even if it's crime that we have never seen to the level we have, that is not OK either. And so right now, given the pandemic and everything else and the horrible murder of George Floyd, things don't need to be changed. In other words, money does not need to be taken away there. We need reform and we need social services. I can't imagine a social worker going to a domestic violence call and you don't know what you're walking into. And that person could be murdered, another person could. They're not trained. They can go in tandem. There are ideas of how to do this. And Lisa Clemens, who said 1% from every other budget, simple, do it. Thank you, please try to wrap up. Thank you, bye. Thank you. We'll go back and um, just check in with the folks we've missed. 225, Elizabeth Sarkey. 226, Lisa Moon. 228, Kevin Aldwake. Hello, Madam. Hi, welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Kevin Aldwalk, uh, Ward 4 resident and longtime business owner. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. I am in support of the proposed budget amendment and safety for all. In my 20 years as a business uh, uh, owner and operator here in North Minneapolis, having more police officers never resulted in more safety for me, my business, or my community. Listening to several speakers tonight further proves that our current public safety and policing model isn't working. Statistics shows that 50% of uh, 911 uh, calls here in Minneapolis goes towards mental health and social issues. We all know that our current force isn't equipped to handle these calls. Diverting, diverting funds towards uh, well-equipped uh, mental health professionals would further help our communities. City Council members, this is your opportunity to rectify several policies and procedures that historically harmed and intimidated my community here in North Minneapolis by finding desperately needed mental health and social services. This proposal will, will, will ultimately build trust between community members, our local government and police. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 233, Garrett Greeman. Then we'll have Dylan Welsh, Emery Brush, and Crystal Bowen. 233 is Garrett Greeman. Two thirty-four, Dylan Welsh. Welch. Can you hear me? Yes, who is speaking? Uh, it's Dylan Welch. Oh yes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm I live in Longfellow and I'm a white upper middle class woman and I've only had po polite interactions with police and because of that, I've avoided thinking too deeply about the systemic violence perpetrated against marginalized people and communities. And I'm ashamed to say that it took yet another murder, the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent uprising, to shake me hard enough to wake me up. Now that I've seen the reality that police are militarized militarized source of fear, violence, and murder. I can't un unsee it. I support the people's budget. As a community organizer and activist, Sally Amani said, the safest communities don't have the most police, they have the most resources. The people's budget illustrates how this kind of resourcing can happen in our city. 
Please make the bold steps to transition us out of systemically unjust systems. Uplift the solutions and strategies that brilliant people and organizations have already poured themselves into. Please be the visionary leaders we need. Support the people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. 235 Emery Brush. Two thirty six, Crystal Bowen. Then we'll have Cynthia Sarver, Tony Clark, Wes Skogand, and Maxwell Colliard. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, who is speaking? Hello? Uh, this is Emery Brush. Sorry, it took a second. No, thank you. Welcome. Uh, hi, my name is Emery Brush. I'm a resident of Ward 8. I'm calling to voice my opposition to the mayor's proposed budget. I'm an educator and most students I work with do not like or are scared of the police because they or someone close to them have been harassed or brutally arrested by the MPD. I've seen it personally several times. Minneapolis has not been safe for black and brown communities for a long time, in a large part due to the MPD. The MPD does not need more money. The department has shown a willingness to expend large sums of their budget needlessly arresting protesters on the freeway for hours as a show of force. And I'm sure they all enjoyed the overtime money. The MPD is fully willing to come out in force in order to quash protesters, but then choose to withhold services they are perfectly capable of at the present time to extort more money out of the city. Don't forget about the huge sums of money you have mentioned in past meetings that the city is going to have to pay out due to civil rights cases against the MPD. They do not need more money. The budget is already bloated. It is clear that the MPD is the clearest area where it can be cut and reallocated to services that will actually help citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 236 is Crystal Bowen. Two thirty seven, Cynthia Sarver. Two thirty eight, Tony Clark. Two thirty nine, West Gogand. Yes, this is West Gogand. I live in the Longshore neighborhood of the twelfth ward. Can I go ahead? Yeah, welcome. Thank you. It's it's really no secret that crime in Minneapolis is surging. It's not just an uptick as some uptick as some council members have said. Council members like Andrew Johnson and Jeremy Schroeder. Gunfire is rampant. 80 people have been murdered. Over 500 people have been shot and thousands of rounds have been fired at crowds, homes, apartments, buses, cars, and more. And I suspect most of those people who were shot or wounded or aimed at were people of color. Carjackings are up 537%. Even moms with kids have been yanked by their hair from their vehicles and beaten on the ground by thieves. Reported victimization is going off the charts, but the truth is, that's actually less than half of the story because at least 50% of the crimes are not reported to the police according to the Federal Bureau of Criminal Justice Statistics. In other words, the grim news is that crime in Minneapolis is far worse than reported. I'm a lifetime resident of this town and always believed that Minneapolis was the safest big city in America. I don't feel that way anymore. The people, I, I know the chance that the people who argue that we don't need police should be happy that we're, there are fewer and fewer of them on the job right now. Please we general. are down to probably six. Thank you. So we're on speaker 240, which is Maxwell Colliard. Two forty one is Kathy Victor. Hello. Yes, who's speaking? Hello. Uh, this is Maxwell Collier from War Nine. Uh, well, I just wanted to start this off with a quote. Uh, the wave of abolitionism is fast followed by the left. And uh, we look upon the whole thing as a piece of fanatical folly that will do more harm than good. See, now, I'm confused because I thought we were talking about abolishing the police, and yet it seems like we already have. And the quotes that I've just read are from 1861, and they are about the abolition of slavery. And yet these seem eerily similar to the conversation that we are having right now, because People are talking about uh, we need to stop the bleed. We and we are asking 
for a longer night. We are paying $500,000 more towards our police. And people are against defunding. But how about being against defunding the city of Minneapolis? Because $179 million go towards the police. 92% of them do not even live in the city, which means about $150 million in salaries for those police leave the city and go towards property taxes in the suburbs and go towards white populations that do not live here. And we are defunding our schools and we are defunding our social services by funding the police. We, Please try to wrap up. We're talking about $8 million in safety for all. And, the, and even the $50 million in the people's budget is not enough. We could have $150 million that go to. Thank you. And folks can always email their testimony um, if, if the time has cut short. 241, Kathy Victor. Then we'll have Alejandra Headley, Teresa Sutton, and Joanna Jansen. 241 is Kathy Victor. Yeah, good evening. It's it's actually Kathy Higgins Victor. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, as I've listened to um, everybody um, to this point, um, for those of you who feel safe, um, I'm very happy for you and that you feel that way. Um, I personally do not feel that way. A violent carjacking and attempted murder happened to an employee of mine at my home last Friday morning in broad daylight. And I can tell you that it was a very traumatic experience for me and for my employee. Um, I think we need a, a comprehensive approach to fighting these issues and not a short shrift response to appease a select audience. I am absolutely supportive of fully funding the Minneapolis Police budget, as well as finding other sources and budgets to cut to fund the people's budget. I don't think it's an either or. I think we have to do both for the viability of our city. I have lived in Ward 10 and Ward 11 for 35 years and I've raised my family here and I have never seen that crime escalate to the level that it is today. And if we don't address this in a to wrap up. manner, we are not going to have a healthy city. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker four, excuse me, speaker 242, Alejandra Headley. Two forty three, Teresa Sutton. Ah, uh, hello. Yes, who is this? Uh, this is Alejandra Headley, caller yes. 242. Great, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, awesome. Um, my name is Alejandra. I am a former um, ambulance worker and emergency uh, medical technician. And I am calling um, in in support of the people's rights uh, document um, because it, it clearly, it just makes sense to me to put resources into anything but the, the white nationalist police that have been brutally murdering um, black and brown bodies for hundreds of years. And it's not going to get any better without any type of change. So I am demanding that the Minneapolis community um, focus on, on why we feel unsafe um, in regards to the police and why the police, it, why can't we think of other ways to protect ourselves? Police try to like wrap up. Community and community involvement and putting funds to those different. Thank you. 243 is Teresa Sutton. Hi, I'm Teresa.
Hello. Yes, hello. I'm number 237, Cynthia Sarver, but I must have missed my turn. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Cynthia. Hi, my name is Cynthia Sarber. I live in Ward 11. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. A little over five years ago, my husband and I moved back to the Midwest from New York State by way of Los Angeles with our then nine-year-old son. Like many people across the country who have in recent years chosen the city as a place to put down roots, we viewed Minneapolis as a someplace where we could expose our child to all the advantages of coming of age in a livable city known for its investment in parks and schools, its reputation for innovation in the arts, and its leadership around issues of racial, social, and environmental justice. Needless to say, we were appalled to learn just a couple months after moving here that just beneath the thin veneer of progressivism lay a history of segregation, racism, police brutality, and one of the worst opportunity gaps across racial lines in this nation. In 2015, the unarmed Jamar Clark was brutally murdered at the hands of police, and a little over one year later, Philando Castile. The community's response this summer to the, the police murder of George Floyd and all of those who had died unnecessarily at the hands of police before him gave me hope that maybe we weren't quite as bad as we seemed. And when the city council stood in solidarity with those of us who pledged that such a thing would never happen again, not if we had anything to do with it, it was one of our proudest moments as Minneapolitans. We know that we're better than that. Enough is enough. Let's continue to make Minneapolis a city where we can be proud that we can be proud of living in, a place where leading in and adopt. Thank you. So the clerk's timer is starting faster than mine. So I'll just, I'll try to sync myself up a bit better to give the warnings that I was doing earlier. So 243 is Teresa Sutton. Two forty four, Joanna Jansen. Two forty five, Christopher Lipink Shands. Hi there. Uh, my name is Chris Lipping Shands. I'm a resident of Minneapolis's 10th Ward. I'm calling today in support of the people's budget. I want to start off by addressing some of the things that are some of the points made by many of the callers who are on the opposition of uh, myself. The idea that they're so scared to go outside and that they think an increase in police will somehow help this. First of all, uh, police do not prevent crime. They show up after a crime has already happened. And all the crimes that they're talking about currently are crimes that are happening under a fully funded police force. Secondly, um, the mindset that police are there keeping you safe is an incredibly privileged and tone deaf point of view. Members of the black community do not have this privilege. The police are there to put them in a place of fear. Public safety needs to be all encompassing and it needs to exist to protect the entire community, not just those who are the most affluent members of it. All those people are doing is fear mongering and I pray that the members of the city council have the slightest amount of intelligence to be able to see through that. Preventing crime at its roots, funding people, feeding people and housing our community. Do not act like more of the same will solve the problems that it has already caused. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 246, Andrea Epperly. Then we'll have Janet Schmidt, Timothy Schaefer, Leo Zabek, and Amy Rutherford. 246 is Andrea Epperly. Two forty seven, Janet Schmidt. Hi, my name is Archie. My number was earlier and I had missed it. Which number were you? Um, it was two something something. I don't see it anymore. Oh, I see you. Archie you Bond to, no, no, okay, yeah. go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Archie. I live in the Seward neighborhood. Um, I want to come out and express my support for the people's budget, um, and I really urge City Council to follow suit. For the past 10 years of living, working, and creating community in Minneapolis, I have been radicalized to believe that police are not the answer. Attempting to reform police will be ineffective. Um, I have seen cops act violently to the Black and Brown members of our communities, terrorize people experiencing homelessness, treat women in a way that is crass and sexist, and I have seen them mock people with disabilities. 
Uh, just want to point out, it is estimated that over half of the people killed by police have a disability. These are preventable deaths. Money can and should be diverted from the police and put into important institutions that can help the most vulnerable towards housing, mental health professionals, uh, social services, and harm reduction instead of the continued criminalization of those that don't have access to resources. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 246, Andrea Upperly. 247, Janet Schmidt. Two forty eight, Timothy Schaefer. Two forty nine, Leo Zabak. The next group will be two fifty, Amy Rutherford, followed by Cheryl Anderson, Ariana Feldman, and Andrew Jackson. So two fifty is Amy Rutherford. I, I'm calling I missed my turn. Yes, what is your name? Tony Clark. Tony? Yeah, Tony Clark. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Tony. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Tony Clark. I'm here to support the people budget. For Minneapolis and the worldwide, we all witnessed a new day, new age lynching in Minneapolis Police Department. The police put in the own George Floyd neck the day that they took away all our trust for full and safe in our community. We all stay here together to defund the police. We are providing the money for them to use unnecessary funding for military weapons, expensive new cars, and K-9 units, and the drug task force. The money that is going to the area should be put towards mental health and all housing. We do not need the police to respond to mental health calls. I can't call the police to give me a warm place, and I can't call the police if I need mental health in a crisis. The thing that I need in my life or to feel safe and can't call the police if I really need it. So if you really care about the people you represent, that I'm sorry, if you really care about the police, then you will adapt the people budget. Thank you. Thank you. Two, thank you. 250 is Amy Rutherford. 251, Cheryl Anderson. 252, Ariana Feldman. 250. I'll just go back through those. I don't want to take too much time doing this, but I also don't want us to get all off here. So we have Teresa Sutton, Joanna Jansen, Andrea Upperly, Janet Schmidt, Timothy Schaefer, Leo Zabak, Amy Rutherford, and Cheryl Anderson. Two fifty-two, Ariana Feldman. Two fifty-three, Andrew Jackson. Two fifty-four, Sonia Mydels. That will be followed by Carly Bergman, Kirsten Campos. Connor Klausing and Jeremiah Grady. So 253 is Andrew Jackson. 254, Sonia Meidels. 255, Carly Bergman. Can you hear me? This is Andrew Jackson. Yes, welcome, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, uh, yes, I live in South Minneapolis near George Floyd Square. I'm here tonight to demand the city budget reflects what us as a taxpayers want it to look like. A budget that nearly gives half of all available general funding to the, to the police is unacceptable. Why would we continue to fund police when the police do not create safety? We need real solutions. We need real affordable housing, more shelters for the homeless, jobs 
and more job placement, more mental health services. This is what our city needs to create real safety. We need a community outreach programs and community contracts. As a, as a member of Satul, I'm asking for the city to invest 600,000 in the community contracts and six investi or investigators for labor standard laws. More cops do not stop crimes or create safety. They come on or they come after. It's already too late <clears throat> in the crimes that have already happened. So our city has always been falling. We need to be more invested into building it and stopping it before it happens. Thank you. Thank you. 254 is Sonia Meidels. 255, Carly Bergman. 256, Kirsten Campos. Hello. Hello, welcome. Hi, my name is Carly Bergman. And I'm a resident of Ward 6. Uh, this summer, while our city was an uprising following the murder of George Floyd, was my first experience with what might be called a disaster scenario. Disaster movies had taught me that when disaster strikes, people will take advantage of chaos to harm each other, take what they need to survive, and abandon their neighbors to fend for themselves. But what I learned firsthand is that this is not true. I saw people feeding each other and neighborhood food banks popping up overnight like mushrooms. I saw people work tirelessly to shelter their unhoused neighbors. I was on the bridge when the tanker truck drove through our crowd of protesters and I panicked, I froze, but strangers held my hand and carried my bike and led me to safety while MPD tear gassed us as we fled the bridge. The mayor's budget and many of the views held by folks who spoke in support of it seem to be shaped by a disaster movie fear of people's true nature. We need to stop making budgets out of fear of the people and start making budgets in support of their well-being. I urge the city council to pass the people's budget or at least part one and two of the safety for all proposal. We need to stop believing people are fundamentally bad and start giving them what they need to have a good life. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 256, Kirsten Campos. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, hi, my name is Kirsten Campos and I live in South Minneapolis, Ward 12, and I thank you for taking this very late night testimony. I understand, understand the fear of my fellow neighbors with the increase in crime, but believing that more police will make everything safer is a 1950s dream laid upon a 2020 landscape. The police have not yet been defunded, yet the crime rate continues to increase. So the logic to pump more money into a family system will not make us safer. The police should not be a one-size-fits-all solution to our community's problems. The MPD has clearly demonstrated that they do not serve and protect all equally. They serve without accountability, and I do not trust them to create a safe Minneapolis for all residents using their current training and tactics. It's time to divest in the police and shift the budget to evidence-based programs like violence prevention, community-based outreach, mental health, and drug addiction counseling, expanding 311 capabilities, ensuring there is affordable and accessible housing. We need to get to the root of these problems. Do not let fear or status quo keep you from honoring your commitment to transformative change for our city. Our citizens deserve better and a safer Minneapolis for all. I urge you to pass the People's Budget Plan as a first step in creating a truly safe Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. 257 is Connor Klausing. Then we'll have Jeremiah Grady, Brianna Lee, and Michael Troutman. 257 is Connor Klausing. Hi, this is Connor Clausing, Ward 6. Um, I'm speaking in behalf of the people's budget. I just want to address what I think is a big fallacy that people are making that there is a crime wave happening across the country. It's regardless of whether or not there's people talking about defunding the police. Minneapolis is not unique. So all this talk about Minneapolis being the source of, or defund the police being the source of the, um, this happening in Minneapolis is just not true. Um, it's terrible that this is happening to our neighbors, um, that there's that there's things like carjackings happening, but it is not connected in any way to um, what's the discussion around defunding the police. Um, the police, as people have said before, the police show up after crime happens. They do not prevent it. Um, we want to feel like we have some kind of control, I think, which is why providing the police and funding them feels like a good solution, but 
In fact, what we know from research and from actually looking at numbers is that providing people ways out of poverty, um, providing food, shelter, um, these are the things that actually make people safe. Um, it's not a mystery. It's not very hard to figure out that when people are taken care of, um, that everybody does better. Um, please, please fund a budget that actually supports citizens, that doesn't use a car carceral solutions and punish and um, kill people rather than actually feeding, housing, and making them safe. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 258 is Jeremiah Grady. Two fifty nine is Brianna Lee. Two sixty, Michael Troutman. Two sixty one, Brian Heron. Then we'll have Jacob Burden, Susanna Guzman, Ariana Ocampos. And, and Sandra Sanchez. So 261 is Brian Heron. 261. And folks will need to push star six to unmute your line. 262 is Jake Burden. 263 is Susanna Guzman. 264 is Adriana Ocampos. 265 is Sandra Sanchez. Two sixty six is Aaron Cheveni Cheveni. 267 is Joshua Christensen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please state your name and go ahead. My name is Josh Christensen. I reside in Ward 10. I'm calling to support the people's budget, which will move funding from MPD to fund violence prevention instead of punishment. We need to ensure that our residents are having their needs met so that they can thrive. We need, to, we need to stop criminalizing homelessness and substance use. We should be funding harm reduction initiatives, permanent affordable housing, and preventing evictions. Regarding the safety for all proposal, I am fully in support of that, and I do appreciate the efforts of council members Bender, Cunningham, and Fletcher in their proposal. I think at the very least, that is what should be passed tonight. I would prefer the people's budget, however. We need to honor the memory of George Floyd and other black men and people of color who have been killed and abused by our police force by offering public safety investments that provide safety for all residents. I'm looking forward to additional public engagement in the future regarding a charter change to restructure our public safety in Minneapolis. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll just go through the last names of the folks we've missed so far. Grady, Lee, Troutman, Heron, Verdon, Guzman, Ocampos, Sanchez, and Cherveni. Move on then, starting with 268, Martha Springs. That will be followed by David Miller, Demarcus Brooks, and Hani Ali. 268 is Martha Springs. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is Martha Spriggs. I live in the 13th Ward and I support the People's Budget and I ask for serious consideration of that budget. I have lived in Minneapolis for over 50 years and I spend time regularly in North Minneapolis, Central Minneapolis and South Minneapolis. I always feel safe, not because of police presence, but because of the people who live in Minneapolis. Twice I've had to call 911 to report a car theft. Both times police came, wrote a report and did nothing to locate my stolen car. In one case, I got a parking ticket for my stolen car a few weeks after it was stolen. It was found about a mile from my house. I'm the one who found it. 
Our current system does not work and is not cost effective. Police do not keep us safe, they kill people. It's time for the city to do something about a poorly run racist police department with union leadership that has a mafia-like attitude. I'm not willing to fund that. More money to MPD does not decrease crime or increase safety. It's time to transition away from MPD and toward neighborhood peacekeeping forces, mental health, and housing support. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 269 is David Miller. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is David Miller. I'm with Isaiah's Youth Coalition and I live in Ward 1, represented by Kevin Reich. Many callers tonight seem to be conflating police presence with public safety. Many have said that police prevent crime. They absolutely do not. In February, back in February, I had just gotten off of work and I was waiting for the three bus next to US Bank Stadium. While I was waiting, a person came up to me, punched me and shoved me to the ground while he was trying to take my phone and wallet. While I was being assaulted by that man, a Minneapolis police car drove past me on 4th Street just feet away. They watched it happen. They did not stop. They did not help. They kept driving while I was being assaulted. The police did not pre prevent that crime and they didn't even stop it. They enable crime and they do not care about us as residents. I know my story is one of many. The only way to prevent crime is to eliminate poverty. The, I do not know many people who feel safe around police, and honestly, most people I, talk, I have talked to and know feel less safe when police are around, myself included. Protect your constituents by defunding the police. Switch to a community-led public safety that actually cares for our residents and doesn't watch them get, get assaulted. Move funding to housing, mental and physical health care, and education. And I'm, I'm especially talking to you, uh, Representative Kevin Reich. You're my, you are my city council member, and I'm fully expecting you to do that. Thank you. Uh, President Bender, you are on mute. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, 270 is Demarcus Brooks. 271 is Hani Ali. Hello? Yes, hello. Hello? Yes, we me? can hear you. Hello, um, good evening, my name is Hani Ali. I'm a resident of Minneapolis and a constituent of Alondra Cano in Ward 9. I'm here to express support of the people's budget. True justice will not come from systems that were created to disenfranchise and kill black people. Justice for George Floyd and many other victims and survivors of police violence means a complete transformation of how we resource our communities and invest in our, co in our collective well-being. I hope our city council can see these testimonies in support of additional funding for the Minneapolis P Police Department for what they truly are. A desperate attempt by racist and classist Minneapolis residents to continue living comfortably while a violent white supremacist institution continues to brutalize black people. The cries of discomfort and fear coming from these folks is nothing compared to the decades of violence and oppression faced by black and brown people in our communities. I know city council members can. It was just months ago that my city council member, Alondra Cano, along with Andrea Jenkins and Andrew Johnson, did just that. I urge you all to keep with your values and morals like you did that one summer day in Powderhorn Park. I demand that, that our city put our health first, prioritize people over profit, fund prevention, not punishment, and help communities thrive, not just survive. I condemn the first two parts of the safety for all. I commend, sorry, I commend the first two parts of the safety for all plan, which would provide the right response to calls for help and effectively prevent intervening in cycles of violence. However, thank you. And honey, please email the rest if you'd like us to hear it. 272 is Lex Horan. Then we'll have Sarah Palicki. Heidi Tripp and Elliot Altbaum. 272. Hey, yes, go ahead. Great. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lex Horan. I live in Ward 9 in the East Phillips neighborhood. Um, and I'm also here tonight to support the people's budget. And parts one and two of the safety for all proposal is the bare minimum that I expect from the city council. 
Um, we've been talking a lot tonight about violence. I think it's unacceptable for anyone in our city to experience violence, whether that's violence that comes from the police or from other community members. That's not the city that any of us want to live in. Um, yeah, and we're hearing these stories of interpersonal violence tonight that should never happen to anybody. But I think in response to that violence, what I want us to ask is why is it happening and what is actually going to work to stop it? Um, MPD has had more than 150 years to do that. And right now they have more money than they've ever had before. But here we are with these really serious concerns about violence in our city. If policing was going to solve these problems, it would have happened already. Um, I want to name that most of the violence that people experience comes from people they know. There are really scary attacks that can happen from strangers, but they happen a lot less often than domestic violence or sexual violence or interpersonal violence between people who know each other. Um, when people are killed by strangers in the U.S., a third of those people are killed by police. And this interpersonal violence or domestic violence, police have a terrible track record of handling issues. It takes courage to move our money out of the police department, but I believe in us. Thank you. Thank you. 273 is Sarah Palicki. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Palicki and I'm with the Isaiah Coalition and I live as a grad student in the Marcy Holmes District. I believe that public safety should function well for everyone in the community. And the way the system currently functions, folks who have been most oppressed historically by racism and colonialism are most vulnerable to police violence. That is unacceptable. Ongoing police violence in Minneapolis has rightfully led to a loss of public trust. I'm white and so I have the least to fear from the police. Still, when the MPD entered my apartment building to arrest a black neighbor during my first year of living here, before George Floyd was murdered, I already knew that police presence didn't make me, my building, or my neighborhood safer. Instead of feeling reassured by police present, presence or confident in their ability to carry out justice, I felt impelled to stand in the hallway to make sure my neighbor was safe and that the several, several heavily armed police officers didn't hurt him, even though he wasn't resisting arrest. We as neighbors are already trying to keep each other safe, and too often we're trying to keep each other safe from the police. I have friends who have avoided reporting abuse because they are as afraid of the police response as they are of their abuser. That's Please not a model of public safety that is worthy of ongoing support, and I urge the city council to pass a budget that prioritizes a vision of safety beyond policing. Thank you. Thank you. 274, Heidi Tripp. Madam Chair, thank you for your graciousness and City Council, who I'm sure are all awake still. My name is Hetty Tripp. My children and I have homes in Minneapolis. As a proud Asian American elder, I support the life affirming budget like the Minneapolis People's Budget. This is a collaborative effort by Black, Indigenous, people of color communities from all over Minneapolis and addresses also the many police myths that we've been hearing, like more police, less crime. That's a myth. The People's Budget also outlines divestment from violent policing responses like surveillance and violence against protesters, militarization, murder. It outlines divestment from programs better served by other professionals. And instead, we have to invest in Black communities in Minneapolis as a necessary step to repairing the harm that police have perpetuated since their inception. MPD has a track record of systemic racism and violence. They receive billions of dollars, free reign of the city, yet, as you've heard over and over again, there's people who still feel unsafe. We can't afford to put money into what does not work. We can't afford to repeat the same approach and expect different results. Please try to wrap we up. Can make, we can make Minneapolis a safe and a model city if we invest. Thank you. 275 is Elliot Albaum. That will be followed by Patrick Steger, Daisy Jones, Jonathan Stiegel, and Marjan Sirdar. So 275 is Elliot Albaum. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, again, my name is Elliot Altbaum. I'm with the Isaiah Young Adult Coalition and a resident of Ward 10. Uh, I think most of us are here uh, tonight because we love our city and the people who call this place home. 
Uh, whether we're white, black, or brown, we want to live our lives with dignity, and it's clear our current system of public safety isn't working. At the end of the day, all public safety is built on public trust. And Jacob Fry's police department that killed George Floyd broke that public trust. NPD's aggressive response to a worldwide call for accountability broke our public trust. And Jacob Fry's police department has been in a slowdown all summer and fall in retaliation against the people of our city for our simple demand for accountability in a horrific murder and abuse of power. So I was really encouraged to see the proposal from council members Cunningham, Fletcher, and Bender shift the responsibility of public safety to those without a pension for harassing and killing residents of our city. Instead, we can fund mental health responders and office of violence prevention and to make sure everyone has a home to call their own. So I'm kind of curious, why wouldn't the mayor support and want to shift public safety duties from the police that are clearly unwilling and unable to perform those duties to other parts of the city? And I really urge the mayor and the city council to support these Mr. proposed Trevor. changes and look forward to the council coming together to pass them. We have a long way to go, and this is a great first step. Thank you. 276 is Patrick Steger. Two seventy-seven, Daisy Jones. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. My name is Daisy, and I'm with the Isaiah Youth Coalition, um, and I live in Ward Ten. I want to be a part of a community that creates well-being and safety for everyone, but our police department clearly is failing too many people. While some rich and white people may feel that the police keeps them safe, there are better ways to create community safety that many others on this call have also outlined. I work as a housing advocate alongside people experiencing homelessness. Instead of the police, I urge the city council to pass a budget that prioritizes housing for our neighbors rather than paying the police to push people around the city and invest in affordable housing and other initiatives around mental health services, comprehensive health care, and economic relief. Initiatives that will ensure the well being and care of each community member. The safety for all budget is a start, but we have a long way to go. I support the people's budget that many have also advocated for on this call. Minneapolis City Council invests in safety and solutions beyond policing. Thank you. Thank you. 278, Jonathan Stegall. Two seventy nine, Margin Serdar. Two eighty, Laura Van Leven. Two eighty one, hey, Jonathan. Here, I think I just got unmuted. Okay, no problem. Go ahead, Jonathan. All right, hi. I'm Jonathan. I live in Ward Eight. Uh, I care about safety and harm in our city, including the harm that was done to George Floyd and to the people who rose up after his murder. And that's why I support the people's budget. The history of MPD and the scholars and the organizers who teach us that we don't have to live like this have shown us that the daily work of policing is not to prevent harm. It is at most to respond to it after it happens. We instead could build institutions that take a holistic approach to people's safety, especially as we hope to move beyond this pandemic. We can care for people's health in new ways, invest in safe housing and worker protections, prevent harm and respond to it with transformation instead of more harm, and we could build a better future. We don't have to keep investing this much money in the daily violence of policing, which will continue to bring more crisis moments like the murder of George Floyd and the violent escalation and then the silly work retaliation that the police have done since then. We can take into account harms that exist and what they're caused by and respond to that instead. Our city should at least pass parts one and two of the safety for all proposal. It begins to move toward safety and care for all of us, especially black and other communities that policing has failed. And I appreciate that this proposal begins to move 911 response out of MPD to others who are capable of handling it, and that it begins uh, a deep investment in the prevention of and intervention in violence by community led strategies. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 279, margin. Sardar. 280, Laura Van Leven. 281, Devin Hogan. 282, Patrick Hanley. Yes, hello, this is Patrick Hanley. Say, I uh, 
you know, the crime in Minneapolis is out of control, and I fully support uh, a fully staffed police department. And at the same time, I also would say that uh, part of the uh, Bender plan can be funded from a lot of various other parts of the budget. Um, I mean, you know, I, I think it's a combination of two that we can do, but I don't not at the not at the expense of the police department. Uh, to fund the Bender Pan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see, we have to skip a few people. So we're on 283. Lawrence Schoenecker. That will be followed by Alexis Collins, David Hattie, and Taylor Dayo. So we're on 283. Lawrence Schoenecker. Hi, I missed my turn. Can I speak? Who is this speaking? This is Jake Burden. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to bring something to the surface. One, I'm, I'm calling in support of the people's budget. I live in Ward 9. I haven't heard mention of the deep criminality and corruption present inside of MPD. Not only did they murder George Floyd in broad daylight on a busy intersection, what about the 1,700 untested rape kits that the MPD just disregarded, the forced ketamine injections, the many instances of evidence tampering, robbery, assault, et cetera, that our families have had to deal with from MPD? When are they going to face consequences for their action? The people's budget identifies $56 million in cuts that we can make now without needing permission from the Charter Commission or finding replacement services in the city budget. There's never been a better time to make substantial cuts, and that's what I hear support for on this call. And just really quick, I live in South Minneapolis. I'm not afraid of my neighbors. I see strong, resilient people around me. I register a fear in my neighborhood, and it's the fear of housing insecurity. Are we going to be able to pay rent next month, or are neighbors who have already been locked out of housing, where are they going to sleep? We need to move tens of millions of dollars away from police and into public housing. Thank you. Speaker 283, Lawrence. 284, Alexis Collins. 286, David Hattie. Hello, I was uh, 219. Is it okay if I go? Yes, please state your name and go ahead. Uh, Dan Urich, I'm a resident of Ward 11. Um, I, I really want to say one thing that's happening, I don't believe has been mentioned much, is the fact that um, the numerous businesses that are leaving our city because of the crime uh, that is occurring. Uh, the, the downtown council, council did a, a study earlier this year in June, and there were 27 large businesses planning on leaving the, the Minneapolis area because of because of the, the crime that's out of control. And also people are leaving the city, um, moving out because of the crime. And if we lose this tax base of all these businesses and people, we're not gonna be able to afford anything. Um, by all means, we need to reform the, the police department, but we have some near term problems as it relates to crime that needs to be solved now. So focus, I think we should focus on that first and then uh, go into the reform aspect of things. It can be done. It's been done in Los Angeles. It's been done in San Francisco, uh, where there's better training uh, around de-escalation, hiring the right people, getting the wrong people out of the police force. There are proven uh, tactics to make a wrong police department right. There's a number of studies that, that prove it can be done. We just haven't had the right people in charge being able to do that. Thank you. So we're back at speaker 286, David Hattie. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. My name is David Hattie and I live in Ward 5. Many callers tonight have made the point that the police are currently fully funded, but have they been properly and sufficiently funded? In 2019, 6,776 Priority 1 911 calls had no officers immediately available to respond. How many calls will go unanswered in 2020? 
Chief Arredondo requested 400 more officers for patrols, but was denied. Now you want to further handcuff his work. Defund advocates cite San Francisco and Camden, New Jersey, as successes in, re in resource reallocation and reform, but do not mention those cities' officer-to-citizen ratios. To match San Francisco's 2,108 officers for 881,000 residents, MPD would expand to 1,028 officers. For Camden's 401 officers and 77,000 residents, MPD would triple to 2,234 officers. During a historic uptick in violence, why is this budget presented as a binary choice? Why can't you both support the chief's efforts and strategy and reform while also expanding mental health, housing, and other services for our vulnerable residents? Please support the mayor's budget. Thank you. Thank you. 287 is Taylor Deyo. Then we have Laura McKinley, Frederick Smith, Allison Townley, and Frank Blount. Hi, this is Taylor Diello. Hi, Taylor. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Taylor Diello, and I live in Ward 10. I'm a member of the Minnesota Nurses Association, and I support the People's Budget. As an ER nurse, I've seen firsthand the trauma that community members experience when police respond to calls that are outside their scope of practice, like mental health crises, sexual assault, and homelessness. I've cared for patients who have suffered injuries due to police violence and failure to de-escalate mental health crises and have had to perform life-saving measures after the police coerce EMS into over-sedating patients. Generally, these patients are black and brown and because of their race are already targets of MPD's violence. I have watched stoic police officers spend hours in the ER performing unfeeling clerical work in the name of taking a sexual assault report and have watched police officers effectively dump unhoused residents at the hospital because wealthy business owners were uncomfortable with them seeking shelter in their lobbies during frigid winters. Police presence in situations like these have not prevented any crime or kept anybody safe. Instead, these experiences have served to harass, harm, and traumatize people and their families during critical flashpoints in their lives. Many of you stood in Powderhorn Park and promised to defund MPD and reimagine policing and safety in Minneapolis. Parts one and two of the Safety for All plan are a small fraction of the larger changes we need as outlined in the people's budget. Community safety exists when everybody is guaranteed affordable health care, safe and dignified shelter, food, treatment for addiction problems, and education. Please make good on your promise and begin, excuse me, and begin the work of divesting from the police and investing in the safety and well-being of Minneapolis. Pass the Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. 288 is Laura McKinley. Two eighty nine, Frederick Smith. Two ninety, Allison Townley. Excuse me, this is Fred Smith. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Fred Smith, Ward Seven, East Isle, and I am with Isaiah. Because I am concerned about adequate funding for effective police accountability. Our public ideal has never been, in my opinion, more clearly stated than in our nation's founding declaration. We are all created equal and endowed by our Creator with unalienable rights. Surely, what our Creator has given us, the police should not be able to take away. Yet, all too often, Rather than protecting the public's rights and safety, the police have been tasked with enforcing the private rights of property owners. Private rights that allow disinvestment in entire neighborhoods, private rights that are twisted to allow extraction of equity from thousands of homeowners, pr private interests that demand police defense of businesses paying poverty wages instead of police protection of actions by workers to secure better pay. Securing the public safety and enduring peace requires adequate structure and funding of police accountability to ensure the police are protecting and serving the welfare and safety of all of us rather than the private interests of a few of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Allison Townley, 290. 
291 is Frank Blount. Two ninety two is L'Oreal. Frank Blunt. Hi Frank, go ahead. My name is Frank. I'm a senior at North. I feel like we should not defund police because they 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 harm us in the, in the community, but I feel like they also helped us to get through like crimes. I such like we, we they should not get as much money as they they are getting because they killed like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so much other people in the community. And people is having riots and other stuff, trying to get justice, and and they keep trying to hurt the black community. And then uh, they should they should they should say because it's like they protect us in certain ways than black um black um like black crimes. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Okay, so we're on speaker 290, Allison Townley. Two ninety one was Frank. Two ninety two, L'Oreal McKelvey. Two ninety three, Kai Wicker. Two ninety four, Chris Weatherly. Hi, my name is Chris Weatherly, and I live in Ward Eight. Um, my personal experience uh, since I live uh, pretty close to the Fifth Precinct, and my personal experience since the summer and since George Floyd was killed was being a part of mutual aid efforts that community have been funding pretty much out of pocket using their Venmo accounts and coordinating on Facebook. Um, absence of the kind of budget that we need from the city. So I don't support the mayor's budget. I think that we need the people's budget. Um, parts one and two on the safety for all amendment are the bare minimum. Um, the hard thing for me has been that I've had to say no a lot. Um, it's easy to want to be there for people, and we would if we could, but money is the issue, and the police enjoy a bloated budget, and some of that can easily be redirected to public works. Thank you. Thank you. 295 is Susie Goldstein. 96 is Carly Newhouse. Is 295. Is Carly Newhouse? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Carly and I live in Ward 8 and I support the People's Budget. Parts 1 and 2 of the Safety for All Budget is a start, but what's concerning is the increased resources for police that would undermine the safety that could be possible through other parts of the council's proposal. If we want to take meaningful steps toward community safety for all and not just prioritizing those who benefit from the status quo, that means divesting from the police and investing in community. Many of the fear-based narratives that we've heard from people here are out of touch with the violence that Black and Indigenous communities have experienced for generations and are concerned with individualistic ideas of comfort over collective safety. Crime should be addressed at its root causes, understanding that crime arises out of basic needs not being met. And we should find tried and true preventative programs, not punishment and carceral based solutions. The People's Budget also proposes funding affordable housing. Houselessness has been an urgent crisis in Minneapolis, and this seems to go unaddressed in the Safety for All budget. This is a crucial opportunity to put people over profit. Support the People's Budget. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Peter Gerard Beck. Which is 297. 298 is Judy Myers. 
299 is Maggie Peterson. Three hundred is Hi, Teresa. This is Maggie Peterson. Hi, Maggie. Go ahead. Hi, I'm speaking on behalf of the Twin Cities Mutual Aid Project, a collective of volunteers who support mutual aid sites providing food and household essentials. Mutual aid is imperative to maintaining health and safety by filling gaps in social services that the city has been either unable or actively unwilling to address and should be funded by the city, especially after the murder of George Floyd. The city can do this in two ways. Number one, they can remove financial hurdles by funding space for mutual aid sites and supplement the labor of volunteers. Based on data we have collected from mutual aid sites, $6.4 million is needed just for space, utilities, and labor from volunteers. And number two, the city, um, in order to support mutual aid efforts, um, next year's budget should include a community budget, which will allow residents to collectively identify how the funds should be spent. Rather than fund the policing of community members, why not facilitate community members creating networks themselves and support existing efforts? Putting more money into MPD, who has no issues assaulting, harassing, and killing your constituents, is not going to keep us safe. As such, the Twin Cities Mutual Aid Project wholeheartedly supports the people's budget to allocate more funds to actual issues affecting your constituents, like the global pandemic, lack of housing, and lack of resources that our mutual aid sites have been providing. Remember when you and your council members promised to defund MPD? Because we do. Thank you. Thank you. This brings us to speaker 300, Teresa Wertheim. Hey, President Bender, can I hop in here? Who's speaking? Demarcus Brooks, 270. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to say thank you for that. I was trying to get in there, but uh, Mayor yeah. Fry, uh, he needs to go ahead and join mayors for guaranteed income to get people through the pandemic. Like people keep saying, it's poverty that's causing all this crime. Uh, we can do mayors for guaranteed income, uh, get some of the gang reduction going on, and uh, get some kind of like gun trade in programs so to get some of the guns off the street that these kids ain't supposed to be having we got kids out here killing kids you know so we need help we need y'all to stand up and again that's mayor for guaranteed income it's already started like the mayor in st paul's a part of it we can do it too thank y'all for your time have a good night thank you speaker 300 is Teresa wertheim Three hundred one is Tunnels El Bay. Followed by Craig Smith, Tyler Balbuena, Cody Johnson, and Ismael Dore. So three hundred is Teresa Wertheim. Three hundred one. Tunnels El Bay. 302, Craig Smith. This is Craig Smith. I want to thank the council for this opportunity to testify. I'm a longtime ACLU member and resident of Ward 5, where police shot Jamar Clark. My wife and I have organized block clubs, national night out, attended the police cert training, and graduated from the sheriff's Citizen Law Enforcement Academy, or CLIA. No doubt about it, police work is very dangerous and difficult. I also campaigned for Jeremiah Ellison and was delighted when the council voted to defund the police in the wake of George Floyd's killing. I recognize the need for change, but think the term defund is confusing and emotionally charged. I say we must reimagine the police as a highly trained and well-paid professional workforce, weeding out those not qualified to serve, not just in weapons training, but with de-escalation tools, empathy, and a national misconduct database. Let's craft a narrow mission for the police, leaving mental health issues to those better equipped, and eliminate 
qualified immunity so police cannot kill with impunity. We must fund social services, housing, education, opportunities for youth and minority to address the underlying causes of crime. Private prisons should be banned. Thank you. I cannot. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Speaker 303 is Tyler Albuena. Three oh four, Cody Johnson. Three oh five, Ismael Dor. Three oh six, Ladonna Minek. 307, Lynn Nicholson. 308, Zoe Benston. 309, Asia Tischer. 310, Sarah Brennis. 311, Aaron Dubois. We'll just go back and read the last names. Balbuena. Aaron Dubois, Ward yes. 4 and proud Northsider, and I'm supportive of the people's budget. We need to invest in new violence prevention strategies to keep our city safe. More police is not the answer and is the reason we are in this situation. Police are not trained to handle every scenario we throw them in. We need to invest in training people who specialize in mental health, drug recovery, and social work. Police do not prevent crime. They're called in after a crime is committed. We need to invest in new ways to prevent that crime. If a social worker was there the day of George Floyd's death, we would not be in this situation, and we would not have millions of dollars in cities damage, and we would not be having to pay millions in police settlements the next time the MPD murders another unarmed civilian. But some are eager to throw more money into this repeating cycle. I have been a public servant all my life, in my current job and through my service in the United States Marine Corps. And I want it to be known that I do not trust the MPD and I will not be calling the police out of fear that they will harm my neighbors. Those of you who are calling for more police are not the voice of the people. And I ask you all to consider nonviolent strategies that will actually prevent violence. This will save police lives as well as our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Balbuena, Johnson, Dor, Meineke, Nicholson, Benston, Tischer, and Brennis. Speaker 312 is Carol Dungan. 313 is Stephen Birch. 314, Jennifer Lohr. 315, Caitlin Duff. 316, Merlin Torres Harper. This is Caitlin Duff. Hi, Caitlin, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I live in Ward 4, and first I'd like to start by thanking my council member, Philippe Cunningham, for his steadfast commitment to nonviolent strategies to prevent crime. Um, but I'm here today to tell you that I support the people's budget, or at the very least, the safety for all budget. While I understand the concerns of many of the constituents here and appreciate the hard work of our police department, I do not believe that the increased funding of the, the police department is the correct response to the rise in violence. We've known for years that police disproportionately target black and brown folks, um, different areas that work with the homeless population, strongly advise people not to connect the police um, if we're concerned about individuals because police have caused so much harm so many times. Um, the police are overtasked and asked to do so many things. They simply cannot be expected to be experts in mental health and community resources. It is a kindness to the police force and our community to direct funding towards social programs, social workers, and psychologists. This summer, we saw the plea for a huge change 
and how our police force has been allowed to operate since its inception during the age of slavery. Be on the right side of history. The whole nation is watching Minneapolis. Thank you. So we're on 316, which is Merlin Torres Harper. 317, Beth Frampton. 318, Matt Swenson. 319, Samuel Graff. 320, Susie Lovestrand. 321, Mohammed Ibrahi. 322, Rory O'Brien. 322, This is Rory, I just got unmuted. Um, good evening. I'm the chapter leader of Minneapolis Students for Sensible Drug Policy. I could share my personal stories as a survivor of how MPD has never helped me or as a uh, queer person of color about physical violence from MP MPD. The abuse I've witnessed against constituents experiencing homelessness, but it's re-traumatizing and we've been telling you stories for years. Tonight, in support of the people's budget and the minimum of passing part one and two of the safety for all proposal, I'm choosing to discuss concerns about um, Minnesota that concerns in Minnesota that indigenous folks are seven times more likely and black folks are twice as likely to die from overdose. The Minnesota Department of Health states that health inequities experienced by communities of color as a result of social determinants of health and systemic racism result in overdose death disparities for communities of color. The people's budget includes actual solutions and action on social determinants of health like funding for culturally specific programs, safe housing, sense of personal safety, including safety from police violence and much more. Police and criminalizing BIPOC and those who use drugs are not evidence-based policies for, for preventing death. People do not, and will not trust the, the police to call for support, even with overdoses or other mental health. So I'm asking what number of black, indigenous, and people of color dying disproportionately from police violence, overdose, COVID, lack of housing would create change. One more life be held at the same value as life. Thank you. We're on speaker 323, Jehun Shim. Hello, council. Thank you very much for having us this evening and welcome to the next day. Because of George Floyd's heinous murder this summer, we've had people turn out to city council and charter commission meetings in an unprecedented amount. And now is a time for y'all to take the people's budget and to take the first two points in safety for all and run with them into an imaginative future. We've seen the really good work that you can do when you collaborate with each other. We've seen the things that you're passionate about, and we know that there are things in the people's budget for each of you to pick up and run with. We're looking forward to having those changes come this year and years in the future so that the police pay and pension doesn't continue to go fund the suburbs, but the money instead gets invested in our community and gets to stay in Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 324 is Vanessa Del Campo Chacon. Three twenty-five, Denise Herrera Bello. Hi, uh, Mohammed Abdi. Yes, are you? Which speaker are you? Um, I have the testimony of Mohammed Abdi. You would have called him. I called Mohammed Ibrahim. Yeah, speaker three twenty-one. Oh, okay. I might have misunderstood. Thank you. No, yeah, thank you. So, 324 was Vanessa, 325 Denise, 326 Amanda Dobbs. My name 
Yes, we can hear you. Hello, who is speaking? Hello? 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 Yes, we can hear you. Can you say your name? Uh, no, but I'll go ahead. My name is Amanda Dobbs, and I've lived on the north side and worked for for 15 years. I appreciate your time tonight. I could go on and on pleading narratives endlessly. I could provide statistics and history, but the God honest truth is that the current model of public safety does not serve everyone equally. The MPD has had plenty of money and chances to reform before now. We've given them more than enough time to make policing humane and fair. So far, that has gotten us, not gotten us anywhere. City Council, please take this opportunity and vote yes on the safety plan for all. Thank you. Thank you. 327, Gerald Perry. Good evening, Council. Thank you for your service. My name is Jarrell Perry. Community outreach is the most important thing we can do, showing the love of God in every moment and being thankful and grateful that we have the opportunity to make the world a better place. We don't have to, but we get to. Issues we are dealing with today are not simply about race, gender, political party, social class. It's also about the love of God for humanity. Mayor Jacob Fry should join a mayor's for guaranteed income to get us through this pandemic while partnering with Arredondo and Council, voting to pass the publicly endorsed the Safety for All plan. At the same time, equip all officers with body cams viewable 24-7 by the public and authorize Fry Arredondo petition for additional officers for violence until Safety for All plan, or as Cunningham called it, the plan to make a plan, the plan for the future, is fully functional and implemented. It's awesome, but how does this plan stop officers from killing unarmed black Americans within Minneapolis? Coined as the city's response to worldwide protests after the murder of George Floyd, please tell us, how could this plan have prevented his death? One thing my family wants added is abolish deadly force. Black Americans believe, understand, and agree an officer should give penalties for crime. We do not believe that penalties should be a beating nor death. As communities across Minneapolis, we do not hate the police. We may not like their actions or words, but we love the police. We know that they come to our rescue every time we call to protect and serve. We love and appreciate them for that. However, there are always a few bad apples which seem to have tainted the whole orchard. The good thing about this situation is that we have the love of God and humanity. It does not have to stay this way. Abolish deadly force and vote yes for the Safety for All plan. Special thanks to Miss Lisa Clemens with the mother's love. We push for peace and guns down loved up for having boots on the ground without overtime and sometimes even without a thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Speaker three. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello, who's hello. speaking? Uh, this is uh, Merlin, uh, 316. Great, go ahead, thank you. Okay, Um. hello, I'm Merlin. I'm a senior at BYC High School. North High School. For those who don't live in North Minneapolis, you need to understand that we are a community who do often do good. Not everything is bad over North. Okay. I've seen moments when I thought the police should have approached the situation in a different way instead of using aggression aggression, and forcing people to do what they say. No if as a bunch or you're resisting. I want people to know that police are abusing the badge, do illegal things, killing without reason and getting away with it. It affects me to hear about loss of family because of Minneapolis police. I believe Minneapolis police department should get less of our tax money. We put more money into the police already and it's not working. More cops means more cop related assaults. So that won't help the situation. Instead, we can move the, mon the money into things that are more preventive. The city should put more money into housing so we can help get people off the streets and make their living more comfortable. We need to pay social workers and mental health workers to answer 911 phone calls. We need gang prevention, education centers, shelters with, shelters with career programs, and money management classes. Help the community. Don't throw us away. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming to testify. We're on speaker 328, Hannah Merrill. Hello? Yes, who's speaking? Uh, this is Aaron Sherveny, uh, number 266. I'm a little late. Uh, I okay, live in okay. Ward 11. Uh, so, sorry, this is Aaron Sherveny. I live in Ward 11. Um, just wanted to say that we clearly have many issues that need to be addressed in this city. Uh, I've got a lot riding in this community with my kids in the public schools, my wife working there also, and I myself working in a large Minneapolis-based corporation, and all of us very active in the community. I unquestionably agree that we need to reform what policing looks like, but I've rarely seen meaningful change occur anywhere by starving of the resources. 
Leadership is the ability to drive change, and change takes time, leadership, and resources to accomplish. Taking away any resources while expecting meaningful change just doesn't make any sense. While you collaborate with experts to understand what change looks like for policing, I encourage you to keep funding in place to ensure public safety is maintained and improved from what we're seeing today. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 328 is Hannah Merrill. 329, Joanna DeLoon. Hello, this is Joanna DeLoon. Thank you, go ahead. Hi, I've lived in Minneapolis and Ward 8 for over 10 years, and I plan to stay the rest of my life. I love this city, and once I felt proud of living here, and I would like to feel that way again, we need the people's budget. You guys are hearing from a lot of well-off white racists who are wailing that they want more cops, so let's review the events from earlier this year. The cops murdered a man in the street, and by the way, we were an hour and 10 minutes into this hearing before anyone said George Floyd's name. People filled the streets in protest, and the cops shot at them with tear gas and rubber bullets for hours until chaos broke out. The police caused that. There were a lot of additional atrocities that your cops committed during that time in defense of their right to murder with impunity, but let me mention just one. Your cops put out my friend's eye. She's a journalist, and she was taking photos, and they deliberately shot a marching round at her and put out her eye. So I don't want a damn penny of our tax money to go to the people who did all that, much less a quarter of our budget. We need to figure out something different. A whole lot of you stood up in a park and promised to do that. And now some of you are going back on that promise, and it's disgusting. Please do not give in to this racist fear-mongering. People saying you're scared to go to the grocery store. Do you have any idea how ridiculous you sound? The only thing that scares me is if the council doesn't do anything about this problem, then the cops will murder someone again, and the fallout is likely going to be worse. We need you to be better than this, so please step up. The people will be behind you if you do, but if you don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm 100% sure that none of us are going to like it very much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Speaker 330 is Sue Campbell. We now have 100 people left. Thank you all for sticking with us and staying up late. We care a lot about what you have to say. 330 is Sue Hello. Campbell. Yes, Hello, welcome. Can you hear me? Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Sue Campbell and I am a Ward 10 resident. I've rented and owned in Minneapolis for 35 years now. And I just want to say that every day I monitor several police scanner accounts for a crime page and I'm really shocked and appalled by all the violent crime that's been happening. Residents are really scared and angry because we have little police protection at this point. We need a fully funded staff police department to turn this city around. Citizens are arming themselves as they have no choice to protect themselves. Is this what your council wants? Remember, Minnesota does not have the, cap the castle doctrine. Homeowners having to defend themselves in a home invasion because the police are stretched too thin, that's a reality. How many innocent people have to die so the council can carry out this ill Ms. Campbell, we can't hear you. We lost Ms. Campbell. Um, we'll move on. Feel Can free I to help email. Who is speaking? This is Hannah Merrill. I'm 328. Yeah. Go ahead, Hannah. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Hannah Merrill. I'm a resident of Ward 4. I'm also with Isaiah. Uh, we as a city need to support and fund proactive public safety, and we need to commit to a better response system, one that serves the people, all of them. This isn't radical. It's possible and it is necessary. Police don't prevent crime or crisis. Rather, they show up afterwards and often make things worse, especially for Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. We need to begin shifting functions currently performed by MPD to those better equipped to handle them. I want all Minneapolis residents to be able to get the help they need when they call the city and know that the right people with the right tools and the right training are responding. I want to be able to call 911 after a car crash without potentially putting the lives and well-being of my black and brown neighbors in danger. And I want mental health crises to be met with skilled compassion and not escalation and violence. I've heard a lot of fear tonight, uh, but we have to move beyond the idea that safety is rooted in policing because it's not. Housing is safety. Access to culturally competent services is safety. Healthcare is safety. Food security, education, harm reduction, and jobs are safety. We need to look beyond the narrow definitions we've held onto as a society to see what could be. In Minneapolis, where all of us have what we need to thrive. 
Um, budget shows priorities. Will you prioritize the health and safety of our neighbors or will you prioritize upholding a status quo, that the system that provides the illusion of safety for some, but also the constant threat and reality of violence for the rest? I know what Minneapolis says. Thank you. Thank you. 331 is Michelle Horde. Three thirty two is Jay Eddinger. Three thirty three is Chris Op. Three thirty four is Sylvie Standback. 335 is Teresa Maddows. Hi, this is Sylvie. Hi, Sylvie, go ahead. Hi, my name is Sylvie and I'm calling with the Osea Coalition. I live in Prospect Park and lived in Como previously. I'm testifying because calling 911 should be an action that brings safety, not a possibility of further threat. I was witness to a number of verbal fights that led to later physical violence in the alley behind my last apartment building under my bedroom window. If I had known that calling 911 would send first responders trained specifically in de-escalation, intimate partner violence, or mental health, I wouldn't have had to weigh whether calling was a sentence to a neighbor for death. But I didn't call 911 because when 911 is called, people die, especially when they're wielding improvised weapons or are intoxicated and behaving unpredictably, or when they're suffering from a mental illness, or when they're just not white. With things as they are now, I don't want to call 911 because I fear that if the police come to my call, they might decide to use capital punishment. I want a safer community too. I want the community to be safer for everyone, even the people who harm myself or my property because they're in a position of desperation. None of those crimes should result in an execution on the street like we've seen in so many videos and hashtags. I know that the proposed budget by Cunningham, Fletcher, and Bender would be a step in the direction of making sure that the police aren't the only solution we have at our disposal when we encounter the systems of a society that criminalizes its ills rather than caring for its vulnerable. After all, when your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. I would rather see my tax dollars go towards building a more balanced toolkit. Thank you. Thank you. So 335 is Teresa Maddows. 336 is Anna Erbes. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello, this is Anna Herbs, number 336, Ward 11 resident. Welcome, go ahead. Thank you. I urge each council member to vote in favor of the mayor's budget. Numbers matter. The loss of lives due to increased crime in Minneapolis during 2020 matters. Reading the headlines today in the Star Tribune, carjacking skyrocket in Minneapolis is alarming. Carjackings are reported to be more than three times higher than last year, up 537%. There are 125 carjackings in Minneapolis in the past two months, 375 this year, including 17 last week. These numbers matter. Words matter. The rhetoric of city leaders has meaning and consequences. The use of incendiary words such as to defund the police elicits confusion and concern. It is not a plan with a predetermined goal, measurable objectives or outcomes. Reform within the police department is for changes to be made in the manner police officers perform their duties. I again urge you to vote in favor of the mayor's budget this vote does not negate the need for reform of the police department or that it will not occur in the future. Your vote to support can achieve both safety and reform simultaneously, not one or the other. This cannot be a divisive or a political dispute. City leaders must collaborate. We have a desire need, a dire need for a bipartisan collaborative plan for police. Thank you. <clears throat> 337. Three, this is Teresa Mattis. I'm 335. Hi, Teresa. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, My name, as I said, is Teresa Mattis. I'm a resident of Ward 12, and I support the people's budget. 
I support parts one and two of the safety for all pr proposal, and I believe those are the bare minimums that I expect from this council. I've lived in the Twin Cities for nearly two decades. I own a home here. I'm raising my child here, and for her sake, and the sake of my neighbors and my family and all the people beyond, I ask for you to move resources away from the violent and irresponsible police department and into the people and institutions that actually make us safe. The police don't make us safe. They've had decades, lifetimes of attempts at reform and none of that has worked. I want our money to go towards the people and institutions that actually prevent violence and serve those with mental health crises, disabilities, poverty, and marginalized positions. I don't care about the number of carjackings. I care about people being murdered by police and people being served in the ways that support them best. Please pass the people's budget and at the very least, parts one and two of the Safety for All plan. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, Hi. oh, I heard, yes, is, go ahead. This is Chris Ab, 333. Hi, Chris, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, Chris Opp, Ward 11. Uh, the killing of George Floyd erupted a huge fault line in the city, as we all know. Safety is one of the city's values. And let me quickly paraphrase that value that we have in the city uh, government list of values. It basically says that people have a strong sense of security and can live peacefully in safe neighborhoods. I think we can all agree that we're not living up to this value right now. And it's no matter where you are in the city. This should not be a binary, binary argument. We urgently need to address the rising crime across the city. Meanwhile, starting the beginning the reform process of MPD. Take the funds from elsewhere in the budget and do not reduce MPD, the MPD's budget as we start this transition process. We can do multiple approaches at the same time. And finally, we need to come together as a community, talk more, and work through these issues together. Minneapolis can be the just society that we all believe that it can be. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 337 is Ann Manning. Uh, this is Ann Manning. My song is Ahmad Muhammad Gule. The, the police should my son. Yes, sir, what is your name? The person who was just speaking. I know we had two people starting to speak. Um, this is Ann Manning. Do you want me to go ahead and see if he comes back? Sure, that's perfect. Go ahead, Ann, and we'll take people we okay. missed next. OK, <laughs> thank you. And thank you to all the council members for hanging in there so late tonight. My name is Ann Manning. I live in Cedar Isles Dean Ward 7, and I am with uh, Isaiah. Budgets are moral documents. As the old adage says, if you want to know what you value, look at your calendar and your checkbook. That's true for cities as well. I want us to build a budget based on who we want to be, not what we're afraid of. Yes, the crime rate is currently unacceptable, yet these issues are a result of COVID and decades of inequality in our community. We need funding to address racial injustice, climate change and pollution, education, housing, and healthcare disparities. I believe we must start now. Therefore, I urge the City Council to pass a budget that prioritizes safety beyond policing and that funds the Office of Violence Prevention, Affordable Housing, and Restorative Justice. Thank you. Thank you. I heard someone speaking earlier. Did Was there someone on the line that we missed before? And folks will have to push star six to unmute. OK, I'll keep going, but I'll keep an eye out for folks who we've missed or an ear. Uh, 338 is Brennan Schneider. Three thirty nine is Jerry Kaplan. Three 
340 is John Tickle. Three forty one, Annie Shao. Three forty two, Annie Mac. Hi, Lisa. This is Terry Grews, back number one sixty nine. Just wondering if I could jump in. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I'd, I'd like to address that three hundred five hundred and thirty seven percent increase year over year in carjacking. I think it's a very important number. It's indicative of Minneapolis losing its stability and its public confidence. And with that will go considerable amount of tax revenue that could put Minneapolis into a vortex of economic entropy. Um, that should be a concern because these carjackings have nothing to do with this pandemic. These carjackings are all about economics. They don't have anything to do with homelessness. They don't have anything to do uh, with uh, drug the uh, treatment programs or the lack thereof. They don't have anything to do with housing. They don't have anything to do with restorative justice. Uh, any violence prevention uh, programs would only uh, affect secondary revenge motive, motivated violence. But economics is driving the violence that you're seeing in Minneapolis. Because thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we had 341, which was Annie Shao. 342 was Annie Mac. 343, Olivia Nichols. 20 years has not made Minneapolis safe for Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color that tend to move money into the community in order to make it safe. Fully fund the Minneapolis Sanctuary Movement, the Sanctuary Supply Depot, ZACA, and Minneapolis Unhoused Union. Support all of our neighbors, not just those at the Capitol that police were founded and continue to protect over human life. Mutual aid is being funded through our Venmo and PayPal accounts. While it's clear the city has more than enough money to fully fund what is necessary, not only for survival, but for thriving. I urge you to choose harm reduction over, quote, police or violence response, unquote, which has nothing to support us and everything to harm and disfranchise us. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah. Speaker 344 is Joan Dow. Three forty five is Monica Rauschwater. Hi, this is Joanne, and I am a or was a student and currently an employee uh, in Minneapolis. I want the city council to know that continuing to fund MTD as it stands is not making anyone safer. It doesn't help our ho homeless uh, population and situation. It doesn't help any of our communities of color, and the constant violence doesn't solve anything, even if other than it's a facade for safety. So I implore the city council to reallocate the funds to actually make a difference in the city that you so call claim to be great. Thank you. Speaker 345 is Monica Rauschwater. 346 is Jason Hawkins. 
347 is Pavel Zer of Three forty eight is Ewan Scotto. Three forty nine is Patrick Ray. My name is Patrick Ray. I'm a resident of Ward five. I made this note on July thirty first. I just got a call from a friend that I love. We met playing basketball and debating Christianity versus Islam at the YMCA seven years ago. He came to Minnesota as a refugee from Somalia when he was a kid. Today, he called me asking if I'd help him move. He is moving after being beaten up by random attackers. His wife is pregnant, and he says things are just too dangerous in the city now. In order for a community to be hospitable to refugees, that community must have basic safety. Laws must be enforced. Private property must be defended. How many businesses owned by immigrants have been destroyed this summer? How many refugees with PTSD have been terrorized by the sound of gunshots this summer? Everyone should care about the rights of all people to have their bodies and property protected. Protecting such basic human rights is not a, quote, straight white Protestant male issue or a, quote, Karen issue. The uptick of violence in Minneapolis is a human rights issue. I know some of the council members just now who um, changed their mind got called cowards. I just want to say that's absolutely not true. When you change your mind, that does not make you a coward. That means that you were listening and that you were leading with humility. And we need so much more of that on the council. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you. All right, so. I know we've missed some folks. Um, but we're on 350, John Anderson. Yes, I'm a business owner of uh, Ward 5, and uh, we recently sent in a video of an actual shooting outside one of our businesses, and um, we're totally appalled by this. We've also had um, uh, tenants call and say that they can't even get into their uh, uh, they can't leave their building safely at night and have to have escorts out to their car. This is so unacceptable for this city council to support anything but full funding for this police force. People should be appalled by this. And you wait and see and watch. There are going to be businesses leaving that city like you have never seen before if you do not get a full funded police force. It'll be the small businesses first, and then it's gonna be the large, big companies. Sit back and watch. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker 351, Abdi Rahman Ahmed. Three fifty two is Tony Proel. Hi, my name is Abir Mark, and I support the people's budget. The Minneapolis Police Department receives billions of dollars a year and abuse their badge. They are very well known for their corruption and dishonesty. Every year, hundreds of people die because of the police so as if they are in danger. As an African-American male, I don't know who to fear more, a house intruder or a police officer who might shoot me inside my car in front of my family. It's time we defund the police and start funding other programs. Millions of people in my community would benefit from this funding because it would change their lives and give them hope. Together, we can stand up for one another and defund the police. Thank you. Speaker 352, Tony Pearl. 353 is Maria Sanchez. 354 is Hi. Stephanie. Hi, speaking. Hi, my name is Maria Sanchez. I'm a resident of Ward 3. I'm calling in support of the people's budget. I appreciate the safety for all budgets proposal to fund a program for mental health crisis calls, sending mental health professionals to these calls first and not armed law enforcement from a police department with a history of racial bias is a common sense initiative that could save lives. We need to treat violence like the public health crisis that it is. The root of most criminality is poverty and addiction. Cops respond to violence. They don't, re they don't prevent it. 
The safety for all budget plan is a first step toward recognizing this, but I do mean a first step. Despite the misinformed dramatics of many people on this call, the proposal is actually quite close to the status quo. It preserves the mayor's proposed budget staffing level or proposed uh, officer staffing level and recruit classes. This is a far cry from the progressive rhetoric presented by this council this summer. Some of you have misplaced your backbones. Ultimately, the people's budget represents what this city should be striving for. MPD had an opportunity to commit to reform this summer after George Floyd's murder. Instead, they rallied behind Bob Kroll, a demonstrable racist, and launched widespread attacks against peaceful protesters. I myself was tear gassed while simply standing on a street holding a sign. I saw officers beat up and mace peaceful protesters, drive their cars through crowds of people with no warning, and indiscriminately fire rubber bullets and tear gas into crowds. I have concerns that this department is beyond reform. I live in a neighborhood that has experienced increased crime since this summer. I do not think that having more Please police officers on the streets will alleviate those issues. I'm deeply concerned that a heavier police response will result in yet another unarmed citizen being murdered in these streets in a state-sponsored execution, and we have a moral imperative to assure that that never happens here again. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 354, Stephanie Cadmus. Three fifty five, Bill Aberg. Three fifty six, Bob Jandra. Hello, this is Abigail Sarah, Ward twelve. I'm a former social worker and public defender and I'm a current member of the uh, PCOC Police Conduct Oversight Commission. Abigail, you're quite quiet. I'm sorry. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, I'm a former social, social worker and public defender, current member of the PCOC. My husband is currently a Minneapolis firefighter driving engine 12 tonight. <laughs> I'm calling um, in regard to the budget and to ask city council to fund the fire department. We need them to be fully funded at 102 firefighters every day so that they can keep all stations open and respond to every neighborhood in the city with appropriate response times. Um, in the case of fire, they do medical emergencies as well as fire, and uh, minutes can make the difference between life and death. I'm also uh, asking that you fund police oversight to ensure effective and safe policing in the city and to enhance transparency and accountability. Um, I believe this would mean funding the civil rights or an analogous program to provide police oversight. This will lead to better practices and reduce legal liability. They'll save money over time. Uh, in regard to the early intervention system, this is a very potentially effective tool in safe policing, but it can be ignored or even manipulated to continue discriminatory policing. So we do need uh, strong oversight to ensure uh, the proper use of EIS. And I do support that being um, supervised by the Civil Rights Department rather than the MPD. We do need mental health co-responders and similar programs. I fully support funding these pilots in 2021 so that this service can be provided 24-7 in the future. Please try to wrap up. Uh, in, reg uh, in regard to the city attorney, I do support providing the diversion program free of charge. Thank you so much for your work. and. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. So we have speaker 356, Bob John Drow. 357, Sam Dorshort. Dorshort. 359, Peter Miller. 360. This is Peter. Oh, hi, Peter. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Miller. I'm a resident of the Corker neighborhood, Ward 9, and I've lived here for about 11 years. Uh, I'd like to share my support of the Safety for All budget plan. Uh, I think these redistributions in this budget plan are pretty reasonable responses to our city's current needs and limitations. Uh, I think they also answer some of the demands made by thousands of residents who protested in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. And uh, it meets the demands of folks who spoke in public hearings in, with both the City Council and the Charter Commission, uh, demanding investment in new models of public safety. 
Um, I'd also argue that uh, Safety for All aims to meet the needs of residents who are experiencing violent crime and want more concentrated attention from MPD. Uh, I think the Safety for All plan paves the way for new models of public safety by expanding the mental health crisis response team and investing more in existing violence prevention programs. And by moving time consuming tedious city functions like damage reports and parking complaints to 311, the police department can concentrate more attentively on violent crime. Like many other residents, uh, I think much more needs to be done to reimagine public safety in our city. Uh, but after listening to close to 300 people speak tonight before me, uh, I think there's a lot of common ground in the safety for all budget plan. And I think it's a good step forward. Uh, thanks for your time and for your work. Thank you. Okay. Speaker 360 is Tony Arts. Three sixty one, John Shanahan. Three sixty two is Dr. Lois Foreman. Three sixty three is Mark Bachman. 364 is Chika Okafor. 365 is Re Rebecca Volkel. 366 is Spencer Ross. 367, Melanie Steiner. 368, Lisa De Felice. 369, Carrie Linetti. 370, Nancy Anson. 371, Donna Amoroso. 371, Folks will have to push star six to unmute. 372 is Grant Bolter. 373, Ryan Watts. 374 is Priya Dalal Willen. 374, Ryan Watts, can you hear me? Hi, Ryan, go ahead, yep. Thank you. Uh, this is Ryan Watts. I'm a 40 plus year resident of Minneapolis across various wards. I currently reside in Ward 13 and I work in Ward 7. I believe our police force does need reform for more transparency, accountability, and equality, but the funding is not the answer. This should not be about politics and trying to push utopian ideas that sound good in slogans. Crime rates are unacceptably high and there doesn't seem to be any end in sight and action needs to be taken. We need to provide proper funding for social services and to reform, recruit, and properly train our police force to help keep Minneapolis a place that people want to live in, work in, and open businesses in. A lot of people tonight have, have really focused mainly 100% on the expense side of a budget, but there's really two sides. Not many have talked about the revenue side, and the reality is with the current crime rate, we are going to start losing businesses and residences, which means we're going to have less revenue to talk about how to spend. And um, with the current crime investment path we're on, losing that funding is going to uh, continue to perpetuate the, the problems. 
let's make our city a place people want to continue to live in. We're going to pay taxes in to help provide proper funding for our police, but also to fund the appropriate upstream programs and social services to help prevent crime before it happens. Let's support the mayor's budget and provide the needed resources to keep our city a place that people up. want to live in, visit, and work in. Thank you. Great, thank you. 374 is Priya Dalal Whalen. 375 is Circe Lillehei. 376, Laura Rubin. 377, Peter Rooks. 378, Robin Wansley. 379, Glenn Chavez. 380, Jeanin Patterson. Hi, uh, this is the name. Hi, okay, well, you for the okay. Yeah, I live in the fifth ward. Uh, since the death of George Floyd, crime has escalated 100% murders, carjacking, drug overdoses, and house invasion. Yes, we, we do need advocates for mental health. There was a caller who stated that if we took 1% uh, from each department, we could fund, take the funds for mental, have funds for mental health, homelessness, etc. cetera. Uh, why can't we take and put maybe some advocates inside of the precincts. We only have five precincts. So we could put advocates in there for mental health. If a call comes through and we seems like we need a mental health advocate, they could go out with the officer. They could make a determination if this person's mental health or if they are on LSD, PCP, they could kind of uh, see what kind of situation that, they're, that we're in. Uh, just for instance, too, a few months ago, um, it was a dead body that was found in the alley by my house. And since then, my neighbors are really afraid to come out. I live on the block with a, uh, quite a few elderly people. Um, there's one elderly couple. I told them, I said, if something happens, give me a call first. My son and I could come down there because with the police retiring or resign, we're 150 officers down. So I know we can get to them faster than the officers can. Twice. Please try to wrap up. Okay. Uh, twice. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Next is 381, Aaron Florence Weinberg. 382 is Paola Evangelista. 383, Lisa Data. Hello. Hi, welcome. This is Lisa Data from Ward 2. I support the mayor's budget and fully to fully fund the MPP to get crime under control. I also support the 1% proposed by Lisa Clemens for alternative crime prevention. I am parent to a disabled child with complex health issues. Every day I live in fear. Every time I go to Children's Hospital, I also see fear on the faces of the families of children who will never leave the hospital. They also have to deal with hearing gunshots in the parking lot. Like myself, they also have to now make a plan of how to get a child out of, who can't walk out of a carjacking situation. I welcome any situation on that. I can't get my 100-pound son to know how I can get my 100-plus pound son safely out of a car into his wheelchair at gunpoint. Fear is not a dirty word, and it shouldn't be. We should all be recognized for you know having a feeling about this situation. I'm begging the city council that until you have a viable solution to crime, that you keep the police in, intact and use your influence to hire more officers of color. And I ask you also to hold the Minnesota judicial system accountable. This summer, it released someone on murder one on bail who went out into the Little Earth community and murdered again. We need to look beyond the police to get crime under control. Thank you. Thank you. 384 is Harry Mathiason. 
385 is Elizabeth Wrigley Field. Hi, this is Harry Mathiason. Hi, go ahead. Hi, thanks for staying up this late with all of us. I live in Ward 10, Whittier, and I work at a high school in Phillips. I feel safest when I know my neighbors and when I know that they are safe and able to look out for me. When I see the police in my neighborhood, I feel unsafe as a white person who does not experience the blunt of police violence. MPD officers have killed people. We need to break the cycles of violence by redirecting funding from the MPD, a perpetrator of violence, into life-affirming institutions like housing, healthcare, and transformative justice. We need to use these resources that already exist to meet our community members' basic needs. We need to resource black communities. This is how we address violence. This is public safety. I agree that parts one and two of the safety for all proposal is the bare minimum that we expect from the council. And as many have stated, I support the people's budget. And if you haven't already, please at least familiarize yourselves with the document. It's, there's clearly an abundance of support. Thanks so much. Thank you. 385 is Elizabeth Wrigley Field. 386 is Ann Wallach Bauhoff. 387 is Steve Kenny. Hi, this is Steve Kenny. I have lived in Minneapolis since 1963. I've got many brothers and sisters that also live in the city. I currently live in the third or 11th ward, actually. I strongly support the mayor's budget. It's clear from so many callers that there's a deep frustration with the Minneapolis Police Department, but that does not mean that a strong, well-functioning police department isn't possible. We've got a window where the whole world is watching, so fix it. It is clear to me that we have a huge issue with systemic racism that is very real, and it's time to stop kicking the can down the road as we have been for 400 years. Funding and fixing our police department is not synonymous with kicking the can down the road. Flashing the number of cops on our streets because they are not performing well is just not a good idea. It's like remodeling the basement while the roof is on fire. Fix the roof, then you have a house to remodel. I agree with Don Samuels, Sharon Sales Belton, and Steve Kramer, public service servants that have given their career to supporting our city. It appears we have a very good police chief. Support him. Hold him accountable. Don't abandon him. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the very serious approach you are taking to this problem. Thank you. Speaker 388, William Harris. I support the people's budget. This is Ogun Onire. I said once again, I support the people's budget 2021. I'm a native of Minnesota. I grew up primarily in North Minneapolis, and I know how dirty the Minneapolis Police Department is. I've seen it all throughout my life, especially in the 80s. It killed Tysel Nelson. It killed my brother, Abuka Sanders, who was mentally ill. And the impact of George Floyd's death just made me feel like, once again, I'm experiencing the same hopelessness over and over again at the hands of those appointed uh, uh, to do a job that's supposed to be beneficial for my community. So. I just say defund y'all. Y'all don't need the money. You're not doing right by the people, so what do you need the money for? Put the people in power of the money and see what the people can do. Because I feel like there's some type of dissonance. <laughs> there's some type of dissonance. And right along with that is all this superiority that is being flexed on the people, that's not good for the people's morale, and quite honestly has the people confused. So I say defund the Minneapolis Police Department push the people's budget because we need to see a new world, a world where our wellness and the way that we can create the change is taken seriously, first and foremost. I'd like to say thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker 389, Gracie George. Three ninety, Kate Moore. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, I wanna say thank you all so much for your patience 
all the listeners and all the council members in sticking with us in this. I am very tired. I am sure all of you are tired too. It is because I feel so strongly about this that I am up here at 1, almost 1.15 in the morning, which is like four hours past my bedtime. So please let, I want you to know that the majority of these people are calling in to support the people's budget because we want to illustrate to you how strongly we feel about this. I live in Ward 8. I am a white queer homeowner and I strongly support the people's budget and ask that the council adopt this plan. I'm hearing a lot of fear about crime from people and I do not want to dismiss that. Crime is happening. It is happening everywhere because we are in the middle of a pandemic. A speaker like 200 speakers ago <laughs> gave the analogy that uh, giving extra buckets to someone in a sinking boat versus addressing the source of the problem. And I feel like that's a really apt metaphor. The root problems will not be solved by more policing, but by more resources and support. Please try My to wrap up. personal experience with the police, thank you. Uh, I support the people's budget. I challenge you all to commit with your actions that you care about social justice. Thank you. 391, NZ Tanner. Three ninety two, Mohammed Abdi. Okay, my name is Mohammed Gulet Abdi. My well, song is Mohammed Gulet. The, the police shoot my son six times. The Mia police police are very dangerous and racist. We need to to stop give the money. My friend Mohammed lost his son back in 2009. There's a bunch of people running away from the police. He, he's seen the crowd. He started running also. Um, the police shot him six times in the back. Mohammed, you know, I, I, as you guys can see, Mohammed doesn't know English that well, but Mohammed told me that every night he dreams of his son and then he tries to like imagine his son being here. But then there's also a lot of bad thoughts about how his son got shot, shot six times by the people who are supposed to be defending us from all the criminals and all the bad people. And that's why he has a rough time believing in the police. And every time he gets pulled over now, he starts to panic and everything and he just he, he gets a lot of flashbacks the sound has cut off for the speaker thank you so much for sharing that testimony speaker 393 is a luchi omega Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hey, um, yeah, uh, sorry. Can you start my time like right now instead of five seconds before? Cool. Um, so shout out to y'all. It's been fucking seven hours um, and hopefully y'all are still on. I only see Lisa. So um, I hope the rest of you 12 are still there. But um, I wanted to just give some time for Mohammed. Like that was a very impactful story for me. And just wanted to like just give a second for that. Um, I've been racking my brain on what to tell y'all. Um, I've spoken to all of you separately, collectively. <laughs> I've been in your offices for a long time. Um, and I think that for me, what, what is hard is that everyone who is advocating for more police is doing it from a very individual mindset of like, I feel fear, all of these things, when in reality that the systems of oppression that face Black people, people of color, poor people, Indigenous people, all of these of oppressed minorities feel it on a daily basis. And what we're saying is that we want y'all to envision a world in which all of us are liberated. And I just want you to know that I am working for and I believe in a world in which all of us are liberated and I know that's not gonna come from the police. One other thing that I wanted to say is that Audrey Lord says there is no single 
single issue campaign or single issue because we are not single issue people. This is not even just about the Minneapolis Police Department. What this is about is reallocating services and funding solutions that will take us from oppression, right? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And so what I'm saying is that I want y'all to think outside Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You know where to find us to send any final thoughts that we missed. 394 is Jana Friedrich. Three ninety five, Deanna Hayden. Three ninety six, Wendy Han. 397, Federico Jimenez. 398, Guillermina Figuera. 399, Farax Sheik Noor. 400, Cynthia Bergeron. 401, Matthew Emerson. 402, Elizabeth Lindsay. 403, Jeff Nosebush. 404, Marjorie Kiriopoulos. 405 is Tess Dornfield. 406, Ashley Hart. 406. Hi, this is Tess. Hi, hi, Tess. Hi, Tess Dornfeld, Ward 3. I worked hard on my tight 90 seconds, but I'm happy to say all of my points in support of the people's budget have been made many times better than I could, including by a few teenagers. So what I'll say instead is that the council should make decisions based on the input from the community members who have been impacted by police violence for decades, including those who have worked hard to develop the people's budget and share it with those of us who care about the inequities that are plaguing our neighbors. And the council should make decisions using evidence-based and research-backed approaches to create real public safety, like those in part one and two of the Safety for All proposal, um, but if any of the council is tempted to make their decisions thinking about next November, I want you to think about all of us who have stuck it out for more than seven hours and how to be able to speak for 90 seconds in support of the people's budget and think about the motivation that takes. We're not getting anything out of this. We're doing it because it's so important and think about what that motivation will mean in an election and support the people's budget. Both and doesn't work reforming MPD is not an option. Culture eats policy for breakfast. Thank you. 406 is Ashley Hart. 407, Rick Meinhofer. 408, Chris Hewitt. 409, Tessa Cunningham. 410, Donna Nest. 411, Bill Rodriguez. 412, Sandra Samuels. 413, Victor Martinez. 
414, Brandon Burbach. Four fifteen, Daniel Farias. Four oh nine, Tessa Cunningham. Good morning. Hi, who is speaking? Good morning. Uh, this is Bill Rodriguez. I think you called me a few seconds ago, and I couldn't unmute myself. Yes, welcome. Is it okay to start now? Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'd like to address my comments specifically to Ms. Cano, Ms. Jenkins, and Mr. Johnson. You three are the best hope that we have to return common sense to City Hall. We've got a crisis on our hands, and in times of crisis, leaders step up and do the right thing, even when it's not popular with peers or with a minority of passionate, well-organized voices who think that that 12% of the police budget is going to cure the ills of the world. Let's get back to reality. Public safety is your number one job. It starts with a well-staffed police force, that building block that is so foundational. You can stack more blocks, but they will topple if there's not a strong police force to stand them up. And right now that foundation is shaky. Rebuilding it is the priority. You can start by shielding those $5 million in overtime pay. It's always got to cover hundreds of shifts that will otherwise go unstaffed next summer. Imagine that fewer patrols just when crime is peaking. Now, regarding alternatives, originally you promised to reimagine public safety with an unveiling next summer, and we're all for that. But at this 11th hour, some of your peers have changed the rules. They want to get going now with concepts that still need more vetting and buy-in. They promised a new house next summer. There's no blueprint, no floor plan, but they're ready to move in furniture. If their concepts are worth piloting, find the money elsewhere. Don't keep chipping at a foundation that's teetering. We're counting on you three to. Thank you. So we were at 416, Ruby Levine. 417, Becca Thompson. 418, Karen Forbes. 19, Cindy Lou Ferris. Hello. Yes, hello. This is Karen Forbes. Hi, Karen, go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see. After having lived in the same neighborhood, Ward 9, for over 30 years, the past six months have been the scariest. First, there were bullets that came into my living room, nearly missing me. My fear goes beyond this specific event to a greater fear of what my neighbors have been experiencing. These fears do keep me up at night. This increase in crime has exposed, oh, sorry, a level of powerlessness and vulnerability that is disturbing. With the increase of home invasions and break-ins, I wonder what would happen to me, knowing that the police force has been cut drastically, which I attribute solely to the city council, would there be an officer who could help me, or would I end up being another crime victim? There are also, there's also been a huge increase in carjackings. When my partner is a bit late coming home, I wonder, has he been carjacked? Never have I lived in so much fear. It is unacceptable. Next year, 2021, is a new year and could be a new start. I, as you are considering the budget for 2021, please open your eyes and hear what all of us are saying. This crime is real and it's, it's happening. People are dying or badly injured physically and emotionally. Listen to Chief Arredondo with his 30 years of experience and no more cuts to the police. Thank you so much for your time and staying up with us. Thank you. Speaker 419, Cindy Lou Ferris. 420, Agor Ray. 421, Heather Magnuson. 422, Karen Winkler. This is Heather Magnuson. Hi, Heather. Go ahead. 
Thank you. I've lived in Ward 11 for the past 17 years, and I'm asking you to support the mayor's budget. We have an amazing leader in Arredondo, and we need to listen to his experience about how to get us out of this crisis we're facing based on the explosion in crime in the city. I am dumbfounded at the number of people on this call who think they know how to do his job better than him. How many of you have done a ride along with an officer, even for an hour or two? And what is this argument about more boots on the ground doesn't prevent crime? Do any of you drive down the highway? Have you ever seen a trooper sitting on the side of the road? What do you do? Do you hammer on the gas pedal and increase your speed? Of course you don't. You take a moment to think about what you're doing and you look at your speedometer. Even if you aren't speeding, you think about what you're doing. The same works with officers in our neighborhoods. This divisive rhetoric that erroneously claims you cannot support people of color, support police reform, and expect safety in your own neighborhood is ludicrous and it's dividing our neighborhoods. Just stop. Those of you who boast that you don't feel unsafe at all should probably count your blessings that you haven't been a recent crime victim like my family has been and several of the other folks on this call. That doesn't make us uncaring or ignorant. It makes us citizens who care about our communities and our families. Are you even listening to any of your fellow Minneapolis citizens on both the south side and the north side who are begging for officer presence not to be reduced? Very few of us who are supporting the mayor's budget are even opposed to the idea of creative alternatives to policing, such as embedding social workers in the police department. You don't Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Hi, yes, hello. Sorry, I was on 413. Great, go ahead. Yes, um, my name is uh, Victor Martinez. I live in Ward uh, uh, 5, and I wanted to I want to say first that uh, the system that we have for calling in uh, to voice our concerns um, is not friendly for the immigrant community. I have spoken with uh, June Jimenez. He is the new chair of the new Latino Lake Business Association, and his group opposes any more cuts to the police department. As Latinos and immigrants, we know what it is to um, have a militarized police force that Speaking terrorizes its community members. We still believe that in America, we could have a safe and healthy relationship with our police. The issue is not on either or, or on also and, but also on also an issue. No more budget cuts to our police force. There is plenty of money out there to fund the people's plan. I, for one, want to see the root cause of gener uh, generational poverty be addressed through our youth programming and a youth center that provides wraparound services and a safe place for the youth. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So let's see, we're on speaker 423, Anna Schmitz. 424, Elizabeth Gray. 425, Lorraine Weitz. 426, Melissa Ellerling. 427, Doug Tanner. 428, Renee Bonnie Jett. 429, Stephen Bullard. 430, Daniel Magnuson. This is Stephen Bullard. Hi, Steve. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah, this is Steve Bullard. Uh, I've lived in the city now for 10 years, 12 years. Um, so we are now experiencing an unprecedented crime spike. Um, people have been killed. People have been hurt. Uh, the number of police have been going down. And this crime spike has been caused by this city council's poor decisions and your words and your demonizing of the police due to a few bad actors. And now your solution is to cut funding to the police. I mean, it's just absolutely absurd. I, it, it's hard for me to believe this is where we're at. Um, I made this my home by, by choice and it's the first time even listening to a lot of people in this call. It's like, I don't even know if it's the place I want to live. So we need to fully fund the police. 
and support the mayor's budget. Uh, I just, I don't get it. It's just common sense of just letting the city uh, go to hell. Thank you. 4.30. I'm calling. Was Danny. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you. So my name is Daniel Magnuson, Ward 11, and I support the mayor's budget. It was reported in today's CNN article, uh, former President Obama cautions activists against using defund the police slogan. Um, he went on to say, and if you want to get something done in a democracy, in a country as big and diverse as ours, then you've got to be able to meet people where they are, he said, and play a game of addition and not subtraction. We need to be adding to MPD's budget, not subtracting from it. We need to find other revenue sources, a tax in increase, an assessment, $50 per family in a city of 400,000 adds up to $20 million. We could realize a vision everyone could live with. I plan to speak about other things and I reworked my remarks. I must say that the special interest groups came out in full force with scripts in hand tonight. I just ask that you read the comments in the Star Tribune tomorrow about this meeting. Clearly the Tribune readers were not fooled by this tactic, but I give those wanting to defund MPD credit. They were well organized. But given all this, I still very much agree with many of the initiatives and reforms that they are advocating for. MPD has done a ton of work to clean, they have a ton of work to do to clean up their act and rebuild trust with our communities. But taking away resources from MPD right now would be devastating to our city. Don't do it. We need MPD. Thanks for your testimony. That was our last speaker. No, so I, I, I'm. This is Lorraine White, 425. Hello. Sorry, I was I was muted there. Uh, yes, go ahead, uh, Lorraine. Thank you. Okay, this is Lorraine White. I am in Ward 11. Um, I cannot believe the amount of crime that I'm experiencing in my neighborhood. My home was broken into in the middle of the night, and. Uh, a week after George Floyd died, my neighbors was as well. Uh, there have been three carjackings on my block. Uh, we are in a crisis and we need to take immediate action to reduce this crime and violence for all of our city's residents. I believe we need both police reform and fully funded police. Reducing police staffing to 60% of what is recommended capacity when we are experiencing unprecedented spikes in crime, what well, does not make sense. It will further embolden the criminals out there that are dismantling our city. Please support the mayor's budget and Chief Arandando. Thank you. Thank you. We've reached the end of our speaker list. Thank you everyone who came to speak tonight and for sticking with us and staying on the line. I hear another person. Hello? Yes. Have, is, Hi, my name is Lynn Nicholson. Yeah, go I'd ahead. Register. Okay, so um, my name is Lynn Nicholson. I'm from Whittier neighborhood. I'm 62 years old and a disabled uh, member uh, of the community. I'm also in support of ACLU. I care about my community and ensuring everyone's needs are met. My home was located, uh, I bought my home 30 years ago when it was dilapidated and I took care of it by myself. I fixed it up. I even had central air. Anyways, at some point in about 2013, I found myself helping the homeless. By this, I mean provided shelter and food for the people that came from the streets and so they wouldn't freeze to death in the winter. We would cook big pots of food and make art and music together. We also would have weekly meetings to discuss any issues we had. Uh, it was a supportive community. Everyone, um, <clears throat> uh, so sometimes I would have problems and I would call the police for their support. If they told me to stop calling them, it was not their problem. 
about a year later, there was a day when my home was barged into and invaded by some huge men with huge guns, and they body slammed me onto the floor. One of the officers put his knee in my back, resulting in 10 and I had had back surgeries. It was the atrocities continued in my home, even though the prosecuting attorney even got down on bending me and begged me to forgive her. Thank you for your testimony. So we have reached the end of our speaker list. We're at 1.40 a.m. on the eve of our budget markup tomorrow. So I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, we do have another hearing a week from tonight, starting at 6.05 at the same time. At the end of that hearing, we will be marking up and adopting the final budget, so we will have to leave time for the council members to do that, those actions of the budget adoption at the end of that meeting. Hello, um, hello, 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 hello. Y yes, hello. All right, so we have closed the public hearing. If folks did not get a chance to speak. Hello, hello. Yes, hello, we can hear you. OK, so we're, we've closed the public hearing. We do want to just share the next steps on our budget, and I'm going to turn that over to Councilmember Palmasano, who chairs our budget committee to share those next steps before we adjourn. Thank you, Madam President. The budget committee is scheduled two markup sessions this year. Those are set for tomorrow, December 3rd, to start starting at 1.30, and then again on Friday, December 4th, also at 1.30. At that time, council members have the opportunity to receive responses or follow-up information to questions that were raised during our departmental hearings, as well as the chance to bring forward any proposed amendments. We will only have the Friday session if we're unable to complete all of our work tomorrow on Thursday. If we do complete that, then we will cancel Friday's markup session. In the event that Friday session gets canceled, the city will provide notice of that fact. Those markup sessions are open to the public and they will be broadcast live from the city's TV channels and website, as well as our YouTube channel via the internet. As you noted, Madam President, the public record on the proposed 2021 budget remains open and we invite the public to submit comments to us to include them in the public record. They can be submitted by an email to councilcomment at minneapolismn.gov or mailed to the clerk's office at City Hall, room 304 at 350 South 5th Street, Minneapolis 55415. As in prior years, I anticipate bringing a package of technical amendments to our first markup session tomorrow. This will be the first set of amendments to the base budget proposed by Mayor Fry. We will then take up for consideration any further amendments that council members may have. The final budget package, which includes the base recommended budget proposed by Mayor Fry, together with any package of amendments from council members during this week's markup sessions, will then be submitted to the full city council for a final public hearing scheduled for next Wednesday, December 9th, beginning at 6.05 p.m. Following the conclusion of that public hearing, the full council is expected to take final action on the proposed 2021 budget. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, and thanks for all your work. Uh, as always on the on the budget as our chair. Um, I just wanna, uh, don't wanna belabor this as we um, reach almost two in the morning. I know, I know my kids will be waking me up in about four hours. <laughs> Probably others are in that same boat too. Um, I just really want to offer a heartfelt thanks to everyone who came and took the time to speak. We were here listening. My colleagues are all here. You can't see them in this virtual environment. This is our first ever budget hearing in a pandemic in a virtual environment. We're facing enormous challenges, and I think a lot of folks from across the city got a chance to hear from each other. Um, an enormous thanks goes to our staff who are supporting this meeting, our clerks, our IT staff, our communications staff, finance, budget, 
and I think many other staff are up here now listening. They'll be back at work tomorrow as usual. Just one of the many ways that staff are just going above and beyond. Um, and uh, my colleagues, again, just thank you for being here and for uh, everything you all do. Uh, so with that, um, we've concluded all of our business on the agenda. We have nothing further before us, so I will declare this meeting adjourned. I will see you all tomorrow. Thanks and good night.